At this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order for the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission. Today is July 19th, 2022, and I'll take a roll call for the commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Pete Duby from District Here. 4. Commissioner uh, Gay Lynn Bird, District 7. Here. Commissioner Ralph Brokaw, District 2. Here. Commissioner Richard Ladwig, District 6. Here. Commissioner Mark Jolovich, District 1. Here. Commissioner Ashley Lundvall, District 5. Here. And myself, I'm Ken Roberts from District 3. Uh, all districts are being represented today, and we do have a quorum. Uh, if I could, the first item on the thing, if we could get everybody to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, for those that are watching via Zoom, if you do not send in an advance comment sheet prior to the start of the meeting, but would still like to comment on an agenda item, please do one of the following. If you are on Zoom via your computer, you can send a chat to the host with your name and the agenda item you wish to comment on. If you are listening on the phone, you can send an email to wgfbideo at yo.gov, making sure to include your name, phone number, um, you're calling in from, and the agenda item and what you want to comment on. Uh, after each agenda item, we will be taking any kind of a public uh, comment. Uh, we will first, first hear from those who have submitted the advanced comment sheet. If you do not send in an advanced comment sheet prior to the start of the meeting, but would like to make a comment on this agenda item, uh, you can do one of the following. If you are on Zoom via your computer, you can send a chat to the host with your name and the agenda item you wish to comment on. If you are listening on the phone, you can send an email to wgfbideo at wyoming.gov making sure to include your name, phone number you're calling from and the agenda item you wish to comment on. Uh, when your name is called, you will be prompted by the host to, to the role, promoted to the role of host, uh, to the role of panelist. Once you have entered the meeting as a panelist, you will be able to unmute your microphone, turn on your video if you wish, if you wish to speak to the commission. Um, At this time, uh, I will waive the readings of the minutes for the June 1st. Uh, everybody's been provided with those via uh, email. Are there any corrections to the minutes from the June 1st, June 2nd hearing or uh, commission meeting? Uh, or will it stand as approved? No, with no corrections, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the June 1st, June 2nd meeting. So moved. Uh, it's moved by Commissioner Bird, seconded by Commissioner uh, Lundvall. Uh, do we have any discussion? We're hearing no discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It has carried the, the minutes are uh, read in. Um, the next, the, the first item that we'll hear, we'll hear from Director Nesvik. You missed uh, April. Oh, I thought it was June. Huh? I thought we had the June meeting. Both. Both? Yes, sir. April. Oh, okay. So we need to approve the minutes of April also. Everybody was provided with those. Any, was there any alternation or anything? They were altered or anybody have any comment on those? Uh, do I have a motion to approve it? So moved. Okay, Second. moved by Commissioner Ladwig, seconded by Commissioner Bird. Or, mm -hmm. uh, any discussion? No discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It carries the minutes are approved. Thanks. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the commission. I've got, it's been uh, a while since we had a meeting, so I've got a fairly 
lengthy director's report here today, and I'll try to move through this um, concisely. So first of all, kind of a logistical issue. We um, have the opportunity, it looks like the best date you know, to do the, the ribbon cutting for the Cody office opening is uh, November 16th. Um, right now, the approved, the commission approved meeting dates for November are the 15th and 16th. And so what I propose um, for the commission here this morning is, is that we simply move that those commission dates by one day earlier. So we would start on the 14th, which is a Monday at one o'clock, meet all day the 15th, and then be in for those that, that want to attend the ribbon cutting, be in Cody the following morning at 10 o'clock. Um, we believe that we can certainly uh, fit the agenda into a day and a half meeting in November. And so I'd ask first if there's any questions and if not, if, if you would vote to approve that now. So we uh, move it, start the 14th and 15th instead of 15th, 16th? Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any, would uh, anybody want to motion that? So moved. Uh, it's motioned by Commissioner Doobie. Second. By Commissioner Jolovich. Uh, any discussion? So it'd be the 14th and 15th, the 15th and 16th. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It motion carries. We'll, the uh, Game and Fish Commission will start the 14th of November instead of the 15th. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, continuing on, you know, right now, as many of you have seen in your travels around the state, we're right in the middle of field season for many of our employees. We've got um, a lot of habitat work going on. Obviously, there's lots of, uh, in, the, in the heat lately, there's been lots of watercraft activities, so lots of watercraft enforcement, and also, as you saw yesterday, watercraft inspections to prevent AIS from coming into the state. Our large carnivore section has certainly been busy, and you'll hear from them later in the meeting. There's been, um, obviously, lots of work with our fish hatcheries and planting fish for anglers to catch um, and all the other field activities that go on all summer long reservoir research work on our, our wildlife habitat management areas um, a lot of non-game field work inventorying species that um, we don't always talk about here at the commission meeting but uh, anyway it's a good time of the year we're right in the middle of it and uh, there's lots of red shirts out and about around the state um, since our april meeting we've we graduated the leadership development two class in may um, we had, well, I think a total of about 20, I don't remember the exact number, 20 graduates and, uh, celebrated that graduation in, in Cheyenne, uh, middle part of May. Some of us attended the 150th celebration of Yellowstone National Park. They had a symposium in Cody that there were many events, but the symposium in Cody is one that, that some of us attended and, um, had the opportunity to serve on panels discussing wildlife management issues around cross-jurisdictional, um, the complexities of cross-jurisdictional management with the parks and the forests, um, BLM, private lands. It was a good, um, I don't know, three or four day event in, in Cody, did it at the historical center. Um, we had the opportunity in early May, um, Commissioners Jelovich, Brokaw, and Roberts, and I had the opportunity to attend the groundbreaking ceremony for the Dry Piney Project. That was a, a great event. We did it right out on the side of the highway. We had several members of the public there. And uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty impressive. They were already, they'd begun work. And um, what they indicated while we were there is, is that they believe that work will be complete by like a year from October at the latest. So nine overpasses um, in that amount of time. It's pretty big. I, I drove through there the other day and they're definitely doing some serious dirt moving. So. Um, impressive that they can get that work done that quick. Um, we have had, and I'm not going to talk details because because uh, Chris McBarnes, president of the Wildlife Fund, is going to talk this in detail. But we have had our first Mari Brown Kids Fishing Day. It was an exceptional event. We had commissioners there and a lot of kids. I'll let Chris fall, uh, fill in the details there as well as the first Inspire a Kid Camp up at the Little Jenny Ranch up in Bondurant. I had the opportunity to attend both of those. There have been several all region meetings happening around the state. This is the time of the year when most of the regions get, you know, all the personnel um, together in a room for a day um, to get updated on the and discuss some of the most important issues for the department. We have members of our senior leadership team attend those as well as other staff to um, 
disseminate information and, and hear from the field. We just had the summer um, waffle meeting in Oklahoma City. Um, it was the first in-person meeting for that organization for quite some time. I think it's been um, two or three years. And, uh, but it was, it was well attended. It was a good meeting. There was a lot of um, catching up to do. It's amazing at how much things change just in a couple of years. There's a lot of new faces, lots of new commissioners. Um, the commissioners were, we, we had, it's not probably the same attendance as the winter meeting, but we did have several, several commissioners there. Um, Wyoming Wildlife Task Force, we've had a May meeting, a June meeting, and a July meeting now since our last, um, I guess we, the retreat was our last meeting, but since our last full commission meeting, we've had three task force meetings. Um, Commissioner Doobie will fill in where I leave out. Um, just a quick update on that. So there'll be two recommendations that I'll present here um, just a little bit later in the agenda. Um, but they've continued um, to work on a lot of the same issues. We're, we're into some of the most contentious issues now, and we've received a lot of public comment. We have um, in the legislature now in the, in the Travel, Recreation, Wildlife, Cultural Resources Committee of the legislature, they are considering two of the recommendations from the task force. One, to transition for um, moose and sheep from a preference point system that we have now to a bonus point system. We've, we've talked about that one before. It's had one hearing in front of the TRW committee and will be heard again on August uh, 31st in Thermopolis, either the 30th or 31st. The other recommendation that is currently in TRW is to split whitetail and mule deer licenses so that they would, you know, currently we manage those species together under one license. We just use different types in order to um, direct how hunters use those licenses and direct the harvest for whitetail deer and mule deer. Um, one of the recommendations from the task force was to have two separate licenses like we do with other species. Um, and that is being considered by the TRW committee. Now, both of those are changes that are required in statute. We're continuing to, to work through and finalize some recommendations on um, landowner licenses. Those recommendations will likely all come to the commission the issue of license allocation for deer, elk, and antelope, resident, non-resident, um, continues to be discussed. You know, currently for the most part, it's 80-20, a lot of discussion about 90-10. And then also this, this concept of providing predictability to um, outfitters through an outfitter draw. Um, and and that, that has been discussed at length by the task force and I think will continue to be discussed at this next meeting received um, significant public comment on both of those issues. Also waiting periods as a, as, a, um, as a way to address concerns amongst, and I'm talking about now for residents, um, concerns where, you know, people who like to hunt harder to draw areas, you know, one person draws it two or three times before another person um, draws it one time. And you know, preference points are certainly one of the solutions that have been presented, but, but there's also this idea that um, I think there's some interest in with, with having waiting periods so that if you draw in a commission designated hard to draw area, um, that then you have to wait for a period of time, three to five years before you can apply again, um, similar to what we did years ago with, uh, with moose and sheep. And then, um, and then, like I said, preference points. That's another thing that's, that the, the uh, task force has continued to talk about. And um, I think those are probably the biggest ones we've got going right now. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that the input uh, comments has been outstanding. I mean, it's not hundreds, it's thousands, mm -hmm. thousands of comments. And uh, I think it's been wonderful, the participation from the public and encourage them to continue to do so. I just urge them to understand that these proposals are just that, they're proposals at this time. When we put that out for comment, it isn't to comment on what we've done, it's comments on the proposal. Uh, sometimes there's some confusion that, that we've already done that, uh, but we have not, so. That's a good point. Some of the criticism I've heard is people that are, that are concerned that we're even having the discussion. And that was really the point of the task force is to discuss the tougher issues and to this point, you know, the recommendations that have gone forward have been, have had public support in a lot of 
um, support from the, the membership of the task force. There's been very few no votes. So um, yeah, just good. one other thing, uh, Director. Um, we've also discussing status quo. Um, because sometimes we discuss these issues and we come up with all these different ideas and, and sometimes it comes right back to um, ease of use or ease of the system or whatever that maybe it's better the way it is. So I just want people out there to know that that's also being considered and we're also asking those questions on all these different proposals if status quo is, is appropriate as well. Yeah, and I think it's important for the commission to know too that when one of the, one of the rules that we established as a task force in the very beginning was that the task force would stick to wildlife policy decisions and not dive into the weeds of, of biology and the things that the department and the commission are charged with biologically, wildlife management wise. And you know, they've been pretty darn respectful of that for the most part. And when they've started, it's hard not to creep there at times. And when they have, um, you know, we've redirected and they've been very respectful of that. I think they've done a, a good job with that and it's not easy for them to do. So um, it's a good group of folks. They've invested a ton of time into this thing and uh, it's all their, most of it's their own time. So that's what I got. Any questions for me on any of that, any of that stuff from the report? That's my final item. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, oh. Director, President. Director, could you, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I thought we were still talking. How is the roadkill program working out? Have we had any interest or any reports on that? Or So my suspicion is, is that it's going quite well because it hasn't come to my attention that it's not. <laughs> but I would ask Chief King if he could provide a quick update on where we're at. I don't, I just don't know. Uh, President Roberts, Director Nesbick, members of the commission. Um, it, like Director Nesbick said, I think it's gone very well. The app appears to be very easy for folks to, to use. I don't have any current numbers here with me, but at a break, I'll, I'll get some current numbers for you. But the last time we looked, uh, there had been quite a few folks that had, that had used the app to pick up carcasses, uh, including, as I recall, there were maybe six or seven moose and and uh, dozens of pronghorn and deer. So I think in general, it's, it's working very well. Our, one of the concerns that we had when that was uh, brought up was the field workload that our, that our folks may in, incur. And that doesn't appear to be an issue. That app seems to be addressing our workload concerns pretty well. So I think all in all, it's going well. And Sarah's going to come to my rescue and uh, provide some updates. So we have, um, it looks like as of June 22, there's been a total of 100 animals harvested um, or picked up through that app, uh, 25 for antelope, 70 for deer, three for elk, eight for moose, one wild bison. So thanks, Sarah. Wow. Thank you. Thanks. Did you say eight? What's that? Kind of bison. I think I'd rather hit a bison than a moose because moose will come out of the top. I don't know. Oh, okay. Good morning, President Roberts, Director Nesvik, and members of the commission. I'm Melissa Rayner, the General Accounting Manager for the Game and Fish. Today we're here to present um, the final budget for fiscal year 2023. As you know, in March, we approved, or you approved, <clears throat> the preliminary budget that allows the Game and Fish, good gracious, excuse me, <clears throat> 
to enter to begin our process for fiscal year 23 that allows us to start entering into contracts and grant agreements that allows the field season that's going on currently to kick off without a hitch and so today we're here to just discuss the changes that have occurred since march ask for that review of those items and then the final approval so we can move forward with the next fiscal year so i'll start first with the standard budget items And I do know that this was provided to all of you in advance. There will be one item that slightly changed and I will point that out. As you can see the beginning of in March when you approved our budget, it was approved at just over $85 million. And today there's several increases that net to about 5 million. The first and biggest one being salary increases. As you know, in the legislative session this year, the legislation approved or the legislature approved raises for state employees. And so this reflects the game and fish portion of that. This is the one figure that changed slightly from what was provided to you a few weeks ago. And it's about $42,000 difference, which is a change for additional help for the Telephone Information Center. So that is in this number as well to handle their call volume that they experience. <coughs> um, a couple of these items, as we go down the list, you'll also see that they were items requested in our fiscal year 22 budget where we saw shortfalls, we are experiencing those same inflationary results for 23. So the next one being the Game and Fish vehicle fleet of $1 million. We are currently working on all of those bids. We still have the snowmobiles, ATVs, most of the vehicles have been bid. And this reflects the actual of all vehicle budget overages, as well as what we anticipate for those remaining ATVs and snowmobiles. The next one being our damage claim funding. There was 1.1 million approved in March, and this is, we'll move it up to a $2 million budget for fiscal year 23. And that was similar to what we came back to in April, I believe, for an increase to 22 to cover those damage claims. So this is an anticipation of that increase, not only in increased claims, but also a change in the formulas that have been approved. Um, the next one will come as no surprise, obviously fuel. We did an evaluation for the last three months of what the increase in fuel was that we anticipated. We believe that this will hopefully come close. Depending on what actually happens, we may need to come back later in the year for additional funding, but we are hoping that this will be sufficient based on at least the last three months of historical expenses. Um, one other thing just to note between vehicle fleet budget impacts and the fuel costs, what we anticipate that there's also a delay in delivery of vehicles. We're looking anywhere from a year to a year and a half before vehicles will even be delivered. So there may be some potential for additional maintenance costs on vehicles that we will hopefully be able to absorb within our budget. But that's another item kind of related to the whole vehicle fiasco that we're seeing right now that we may have to consider down the road. But currently, we're just asking for the increase in the actual purchase of the vehicle fleet and then the fuel costs. Um, the next few postage is another one that with the change in what we mail, and we did have this originally as a $100,000 ask, but we reduced that um, as a result of the regulation kind of issue that you'll see further down the list where we were unable to get those printed with the paper issues. So that is just a $50,000 increase to cover the additional shipments and the increase in postage that we've experienced. Property taxes, um, once we receive the assessments for this year, those um, encompass the larger ones that we've seen. The majority of that is in Jackson. There's a few um, others around the state that we saw a substantial increase, but that is kind of what we've seen from the assessments to date. The next few Cody Regional Office Network costs, that's the final kind of phases of getting the Cody Regional Office up to speed with all of the network connectivity that they'll need um, for all of the employees' offices and meeting rooms, et cetera. Um, wildlife, Wyoming Wildlife Magazine, that is mostly related to the printing costs that we're seeing an increase in. And that's kind of obviously the regulation kind of issue, but at this point, they're still able to get those printed and have access to that paper. The next one is the Teton housing stipend increase, not to be confused with any other Teton housing, but the employees in Teton Housing currently receive a stipend that is going up effective July 1st, and that affects about 11 employees 
So that is the increase to cover that. Website hosting is an additional cost expense that came through the development of the website and the platform in which they will be hosting the website on. So that's the increased cost that has come throughout the life of that project. The last couple, Jackson Supervisor housing lease, it's a slight increase. That is the house that is leased in Jackson by the department for the regional wildlife supervisor there. And then conservation art show awards. This was just an oversight of something that got toggled between a couple of budgets and it got lost in budget development and transition of vacant positions. So we included that back in there. The last two are decreases. Regulation printing, as I think everyone is aware with all of the printing issues, the department is not printing the volume of regulations that they have. This is not the full reduction. We did leave about a little over $40,000 in the budget because there will be some printing that occurs um, at a reduced level, but allow that for hunters who need that um, service. And then last in March, we asked for $75,000 for acquisition of the Buffalo Warden Station. That was in addition to the 350,000, I believe it was approved in 22, that they were unable to acquire a house in Buffalo for that amount. However, things came to fruition. They were able to secure a house and we were able to get that funded out of the fiscal year 22 budget. So this, this ask that we had previously requested is no longer needed. So with that, that brings us to just the standard budget of just over $90 million, 90.4. And I'll pause there for any questions. Mr. President, I have a question. Melissa, with that, from the, from the budget committee, the vehicle fleet issue, we, we knew we were gonna have an increase because of delayed delivery. And now we're delivering 22 vehicles. No, now we're delivering 21 vehicles and we're just behind a year and a half in, in actual physical delivery of vehicles. So will this budget item rear its head again in 23 when we're trying to deliver 22 vehicles still? President Roberts, Commissioner Brokaw, the way that the cycle works is we approve the budget. Usually we go out and bid in the fall. What we did this year is we moved them up because a lot of the dealers were our manufacturers had opened up their bids earlier in the year and they were closing really close to us not even being able to get our bids in. So we moved it up so we have better idea. So we are just finishing up bids for the 22, what was approved in the 22. And those are just now getting like purchase orders issued and actually getting ordered. Simultaneously, we're also doing 23s to try to get into that window where they can okay. actually be ordered. And so, they're kind of kind of coming together at the same time, but we are seeing anywhere from 240 to 500 days for most of those vehicles. Okay. So anyone that's anticipating a vehicle that was approved either in the 22 budget or the 23 budget should be expecting those delays. And we should, we should have those costs pretty well locked in then. I believe so, yes. And hopefully when we bring the fiscal year 24 request, we'll have a better gauge if the market price of vehicles is still kind of crazy that will be built in and we sh that should just be in our initial request. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Yeah. All right. At this time, we can either move on and go over the few one-time items or we can ask for approval of the standard. We can do it all at the end if there's a preference. Any questions? You want us to approve this first? What's that? You want us to approve this first before we move on to the other one or you wanna do it Yeah, all we can one? approve this. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the what do we call this? The final special? standard budget request. The what? Final standard budget request. Final standard budget request. <laughs> so moved. Moved by Second. Commissioner Doobie. <clears throat> Mark's awake. What? Oh, I heard Mark. He's awake. Oh. <laughs> uh, seconded by Commissioner Jolovich. Okay. He gives me nod. <laughs> those, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It carries. We'll go next. Great, thank you. All right. The next list, you'll see quite a few. And I just, for a review purpose, I showed the initial list of everything that was approved in March for one-time budget projects, broken down by the first grouping being ones that are multi-year approved um, projects that I think everyone is familiar with. 
and then just the list of items that were approved in March by each division, just for a quick review. And I know you've all seen this, so there's definitely room if we have any questions about what was previously approved, but it was more just for information. And then I'll just toggle to the last one. You can see just three minor requests, I and mean, they're not minor, but there's only three. The first one being the Jackson Fish Shop, and that's the construction of a new shop in Jackson, obviously. In any of these that anyone's asking for more information, we can certainly bring any of those respective individuals that have more details up if there's any questions to talk about. The next two items, the Wigwam Rearing Station was actually a project that was approved in fiscal year 22. It went out for bid and when it came back, it was unaffordable and they only had one bidder. And so the hope and the intent is to rebid it and have additional individuals bid on that project because we were unable to secure it under a contract by the end of June of 22, the funds were reverted into the operating fund. And so we're just re-asking for that budget approval to move forward with that same project. It's the same dollar amount as was approved in 22. And therefore the request is the same. And then the Cheatgrass Imaging Project was an initial ask of 250,000 in fiscal year 21. And what occurred is they contracted for a study to determine how well the cheat grass imaging would work. And that has occurred and that study has now found, provided the foundation for them to move forward with the actual cheat grass imaging project that they want to do. And so this is the remainder of that request to move forward with the actual imaging to allow for that cheat grass management. And so again, those dollars, because the study was still going on, were not spent and we're not able to be secured before the end of the fiscal year. Okay. And so then those three items bring the one-time project request to the 7.1 million. And I'll pause Wait, there for if, questions. Um, one thing I, I, I need to file is if there's any gonna be any public comment on any of these agenda items to remind the public to uh, uh, submit an advance sheet or whatever, because after every agenda item, that the commission is to open it up to public to weigh in on it. So make sure that you advance that on any of these agenda items before we, sometimes I get ahead and don't allow the public to go before we vote. So I would like to correct that. So um, do I have any motion for, or is any public comment on that? Um, would I have a motion for approving the one-time project for fiscal year 23? Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. Could I get a little more information on the Jackson Fish Shop from somebody that's... Yeah, I don't remember anything. I don't, know. I don't remember that. Perfect. They're rebuilding the new section. Station is built. Good morning, President Roberts, uh, Commissioner Duby. An update on the Jackson Fish Shop. Um, basically, the Jackson region was in dire need of a fish shop. They currently have a old Quonset hut in the back corner that is not useful at all for storage. It needs tore down. We went out to bid for, uh, I think it was in June, to get um, requests for bids for, I don't know how many square feet it is. I think it's 5,000 square feet. And we received two bids and we, the lowest bid was 950,000. And I don't know what other questions or anything more I can clarify. Where is this located at? Where the regional office is? Or? Jackson Regional Office, yes, sir. In the back parking lot. Did, Mr. President, question for Eric. Didn't it have um, AIS scrub something special? Uh, I don't remember. Sorry. <laughs> I can add a little it was, bit. It was, it was a little bit nicer than just a shop. It, it, it had some capacity to take care of some invasive species stuff, didn't it? No, no, Mr. President, it, it's just strictly storage. And right now it's to the point where they're, it's not adequate enough to store all their boats. They take a lot of their boats out to South Park, south of town there to our WHMA and they store them out there. And, um, and this is simply to meet a need to be able to put their stuff inside during the winter. I don't know if those AIS decon units go inside or not, but okay. they do have two. Uh, one or two AISD con units at the in the Jackson region. Commissioner um, Brokoff, I've I, I've toured that place, and what it's a just kind of a majapage of like a lot of our places trying to put retrofit everything in, and uh, 
And I think their belief is just trying to get it all under uh, one roof, one one way of doing it without all of this little band aids all the way around gotcha. it. So, it, okay, that's correct, President President Roberts. Um, I mean, the boats are outside; ice builds up on them. We need to get them inside so that they can be useful. And then, and the processing from the game animals when they come in from the prosecutions and stuff. They're, they're they just they're just get a shop, the place, they, everything. They're just they just want to they need it to be more uh, just. Uh, and if you're familiar with the uh, parking lot, there's a current storage building there. We're going to build onto the, I think it would be the south side of that building. There's an actual entrance coming off the main road there. We're going to clear that out so that they can bring boats in right off the main road and pull into the storage area and then drive through into the back parking lot. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. President, I'd make a motion to approve the final one-time budget request. Uh, motion is second. made by Commissioner Doobie, seconded by I'll Commissioner second. Bird. Uh, any discussion or public comment? Uh, okay, hearing none. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It's been approved. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And it, this time, I want to recognize we have a senator in the House. Thanks for coming, Senator Schuler, and uh, being a part of this. And we welcome you to our committee, and we welcome any questions you might have for us for the Game and Fish. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, for the next time. Okay. So, Mr. President, members of the commission, as I indicated in my director's report, there are two recommendations for the commission from the Wyoming Wildlife Task Force that I'll present here this morning. To be very clear right up front, what um, I'm asking you to consider today is whether to give the department direction to move forward with the regulation process um, on these two items. This would require regulatory changes to um, chapter 44 and possibly, I think, chapter two for antelope licenses. It'd be either chapter two or chapter 44. But if you agree today that you want the department to propose uh, regulation, take it out for public comment, go through the normal regulation promulgation process, that's, that's what um, you'll have to consider here today and, and give us direction on. So the first um, recommendation that I'll talk about here today is fairly brief. Um, as you know, the, the task force has contemplated this, this whole idea of opportunity and how to provide maximum opportunity for um, Wyoming sportsmen. One of the things that, is, that has ha certainly happened over time is that the number of type one antelope licenses has, has changed. We've had to reduce um, for several years now, we've had to reduce the number of those licenses and there just simply isn't nearly the same number that there, there was available. There were days not long ago when the commission enacted the current regulation on the type, the number of type one licenses a person can hold when we couldn't, we couldn't sell all the licenses even by the end of the season, particularly in places with um, difficult access. But the current regulation allows um, a sportsman to have two type one licenses. They can't get both of them in the initial draw, but they can have a total of two. Um, the recommendation from the task force, again, to try to spread more opportunity out and, and allow more people to hold a type one antelope license was to make a change in commission regulation to only allow a sports person to hold one um, type one antelope license. This is a number that in the past, um, the commission's addressed before, um, it's changed in the past. And so um, that, that's, that's number one and I'll present them both uh, Mr. President, and then I'll ask for, for questions on either one, if that's sure. okay with you. Sure. So the second um, recommendation from the task force is to, um, and this was approved at the June meeting and signed by the co-chairs, Rusty Bell and Josh Corsi. Um, we do have co-chairman um, Corsi here in the room with us today. 
But uh, this recommendation from the task force was to remove the current 7,250 license cap on the allocation of non-resident elk licenses. Um, secondly, to recommend to the commission that they adopt a non-resident regional system similar to how we currently manage deer um, and to provide some more flexibility for, for the department to address um, the state's elk population and to address wildlife management issues similar to how we do now with, with deer. This um, cap of 7,250 licenses, to remind you how it works, um, currently all of the um, limited quota licenses that go through the draw at a rate of 16%, um, that, that draw is conducted first. And once that total number of licenses is established that happen through the normal draw, the difference between that and 7,250 is the number of licenses that can then be used for the non-resident general draw. And so this number was established back in the 80s. Um, the 7,250 cap was, was, issued, was uh, set in the 80s. Um, obviously things have changed since then. These are some discussions the task force had. There's, there's a significantly more elk than there was at that time. And um, the, the, the other, I think, point that the, the uh, task force discussed at length was there was no real, um, there wasn't a solid quantitative biological wildlife management purpose for that number. It seems in a lot of the research that it was, um, it was arbitrarily set. I think it was initially um, in the very first um, round of establishing that number, it was, uh, there was an attempt to base it on a percentage of non, or I'm sorry, of resident general licenses, but obviously that's all changed over time as well. The, um, currently, um, as I indicated, the, the department does a completely different system for deer. So we have non-resident regions around the state, the local field managers establish what a total quota would look like, what a total interest in harvest would be on general licenses. And then they establish a number of non-resident quota. Um, and that, that number varies as a percentage of the total number of licenses issued, but, it, but it's done at a much more surgical localized level based on um, conditions in the ground. The current process is very much a statewide general license allocation for, for elk. So that, that's the proposal from the task force. This passed the group by a vote of 10 to three, and there were five members that were absent that day. Um, and with that, Oh, I, I did want to mention too, the department did study this, um, produced a white paper, presented these options to the commission in 2018, Doug, is that right? In 2018, at that time, the commission um, opted not to make any changes. And, but, the, but this came back up at the task force again, and the task force discussed this at length, received a lot of public comment, and, and has now made this recommendation to you. So with that, I would stand for any questions. And I do know there is some, um, some public comment before, before you make a decision on whether we need to move forward or not. Mr. President, question for Director Nesvik. Back to item one, recommendation one, the type one antelope tax. Mm -hmm. So currently, does that apply to, so currently you can get two type one tags? So you can get one in the initial draw? And then you can go get a leftover type one as well and, and end up holding two at the end of the day. That applies to residents and non-residents. It does. And the task force recommendation is just to go back to, you can only hold one type one antelope tag. Additional tags would have to be then Dauphin. Correct. Okay. Mr. President. Yes, sir. Uh, I recently had some discussion with our, one of our local biologists in my district and He's very concerned about the antelope situation on the eastern side of Wyoming. Uh, he said he did a line transect in June. Uh, there's still some data interpretation from that that's going to be done, but his initial data said that there's probably six antelope per square mile in our area, and the doe fawn ratio is decreasing dramatically. So I would definitely 
being agreeable to whatever we can do to definitely take the ability to take two type one licenses away because we got to do something with this elk herd because i mean antelope herd because it just keeps dwindling so yeah. i think it's a good idea thank you mr president <laughs> i just wanted to to let the rest of the commission know as your representative on the task force i am supporting both requests the type one and also the 7250 reduction or removal um, speaks for itself on the antelope uh, as far as the 7250 is concerned, uh, that number really is, is an arbitrary number. It has no basis in, in elk management or management of any species that we currently do. There's no other species that we just have a number sitting out there since 1989, I believe, um, where the populations go up or down. Um, this will just allow the department to develop a, a licensing system very similar to your non-resident regional deer licenses will have no uh, effect on licensing of resident hunters. They will still be able to go buy a license. Uh, where the, the changes could be just depends on how the regions are set up um, as, the, as to license availability. And I think, I think that's the big, we don't know type thing until we actually look it over. I would encourage the department if we go this route to not only look at hunt units, um, but also try to get some semblance of an idea on drawing percentages and how that will work as well. Uh, I would hate to have uh, some non-resident regions developed to where when it's currently a little over three points to get a general tag, all of a sudden jump to eight or 10. Uh, I, I would not like that myself. I would like, so I, I think that has to be taken into consideration as well. Uh, we don't wanna design a system that makes it harder for people to get licenses uh, of all types. Uh, so where possible to, to, to look at those numbers and try to make a system that is somewhat fair, but it's not, non-resident deer is not that way. There are some areas it's easy to draw like and some areas not. So, I mean, that may turn out that way as well, but because there will be, I mean, I hate to say it, there will be winners and losers. There'll be some areas that will be easier and some areas will be harder, uh, but it will also be based on biology, hopefully, priority number one. Uh, to ensure our elk population. I mean, we, you know, we, we can control elk right now with, with cow tags, that's fine. Uh, but every other species, when our numbers increase, we offer more type one tags. Uh, we have not been doing that with elk on a general basis. Uh, and I would also venture to say that when this first started in, in the late eighties, uh, you know, Wyoming had a lower population than we do now. So the number of general resident licenses was lower than we issue now. So that has changed over the years. It increased as our population grows, whereas our non-residents has remained flat. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's a reality. Uh, so I would, I would just wanted you to let you know that uh, my position as a commission member on the task force, that's the position that I've been taking. Um, where, and everybody's keep, the 7250, and everybody just says that, well, it's thrown out there. How? I have a hard time. How did we, why are we saying it was just thrown out there? I mean, I mean, for me, everybody says arbitrary as such and such. There's got, there had to be some sort of a thought on the 7250. I mean, I mean, somebody had to have some sort of a discussion on it. I just kind of throw in clarification on that. Yeah. And if Doug, Doug will correct me, he did a lot of this research himself and he was a, a drafter of this paper, but as I recall the information that we were able to find, it was somewhat, there was some basis in a percentage, obviously, first of all, 16%, and then a percentage of, of about 16% of the total um, general licenses issued in the state. Uh, you know, I can't concretely say that's exactly how they determine the number. I do know there was a lot of back and forth and there was a lot of um, compromise that happened when they were having these discussions. You can see it in some of the old minutes, but I think that's the basis. And Doug, you can correct me if you've got any additional information. Yeah. It, yeah. 12. Yeah, the number 12%. was 12 at that time. And I, I also think there was a lot of discussion on, on an average of the number of non-resident license sales over two or three years to come up with that number as well. It's my recollection. Some of the other outfitters in this may, may know that as well, but 
Any other discussion? Um, Mr. President, I have, I have a comment. I'm sure my fellow commissioners have gotten just as many email um, from residents that are opposed to us lifting the cap because their comment is we'll be overrun with non-resident hunters. But I would just like to get it on the record and have the discussion for clarification that if we do lift the cap, we go to a regionalization of elk, just like we do mule deer. Our local field managers still put a cap of how many non-resident tags will be issued in a region based on her densities and, and all those factors we consider. So that's really not a valid argument that will be overrun with unlimited non-residents. Is that correct? Mr. President, Commissioner Brokott, um, that is correct. And one thing I guess I would say, and this is, this is my perspective, I really believe that the regionalization and the cap being lifted have to be tied together. They have to be hinged at the hip and that doing one without the other um, may not help us a whole lot um, because we need to, to address the concerns you brought up. You know, we need to be able to not just have all of a sudden a, an increase, you know, every new general license holder, non-resident general license holder show up in the snowy range. That, that's not helpful here. Correct. <laughs> Mr. President, but it's, 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 it's regulated, it's not, Legislating though the seven two fifty is not legislated. It's not. It's commission. Okay, Mr. President, I would also, if we do go this route, I would I would suggest that we give it a year and let let the department come up with a good program. Uh, if we were to do that right now and, and rely on on having the season set by January application deadline, I'm afraid we might not have as complete a job as possible uh, so if we go that route i would like the commission to consider that yeah now, how mr. we handle the interim year that's another topic but and mr president commissioner duby i completely agree with that i think that we need you know there's steps here the commission has to make if, if you tell us to move forward today we would bring this to the november meeting if if we move forward with regionalization and lifting this cap we need to have you know, additional public comment as we're developing those regions and as we're developing those quotas. And, and we can't do that between now and January 1st. That's not going to work. No, that's and it would have to be in place if we're going to join them at the hip. It have to be in place by January 1st because that's when non-residents and residents start applying for licenses. Good point. Yeah, I, excuse me. Right. I think that's a good point to, to the public is, is this won't happen today and there will be ample time for plenty of opportunity for comment as to the design of the system as well, much like we do everything else. Comment. Okay, this I'm going to, I have a few comments from uh, the public at this time. Uh, Jeff Muratorn is... Uh, is it Zoom? This is not the right control. Okay. Jeff, can you hear me? Okay, Jeff, can you hear me? Jeff Muratone. Jeff, when you come back on, let me know. Okay, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. Um, first, I would like to respectfully disagree with something that was said, and that is about the public comment that's been done on this issue of 7250 in the task force. Um, as with the, the previous uh, study on this back in 2018, resident sportsmen and hunters are, are very much against removing that cap. Uh, the task force allowed a two day comment period online and there were only 27 comments and the majority of those were against changing the cap. I just wanted to make that clear that I don't think at this point, and I know that the commission is 
concerned about what the public feels about this, but I don't think there's been nearly enough comment on this by the public to, to move forward at this point. Uh, I would love to see the commission take up that white paper and get all the information you can about the 7250 elk cap. Uh, something I might share with you uh, pertaining to how 7250 has worked in the past and how it's working right now. In 2005, there were 56,000 elk licenses sold in Wyoming. Uh, Non-residents purchased 10,000 of those licenses for an 18% uh, of, of all total licenses. Last year, in 2021, we sold 74,500 elk licenses in Wyoming. 14,200 of those were non-resident. So the 7250 cap isn't the, the total cap of, of what non-residents get. They get additional elk licenses and they get leftover elk licenses. So for, in 16 years, that proves the cap is still working. Uh, non-resident licenses went up over 4,000 in that period. So I think this is something that needs careful consideration. I, I hope the commission chooses to research and, and go through the white paper, see what's all there. Uh, the biggest concern resident hunters have is what's gonna happen in general elk areas? Are we going to see an increase in bull elk hunters on the non-resident side uh, or, or what? So I, I think that's probably the biggest concern we have with that. Thank you. Any, any questions from the commission to Mr. Murakawa? Yes, Mr. President. Okay. So for purposes of clarification, the 7250 cap is only on the initial draw, and then they can get the additional licenses and leftovers after that? That's correct, as it is with antelope and deer as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Murto, do you have anything else you wanna add? Okay, all right. Uh, next one will be Buzz Hedrick. Hedrick? Mr. Hedick, you there? Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you're Buzz Hedick. I am Buzz Hedick. That would be me. Okay. And I'm Commissioner Roberts. So go ahead and uh, okay. uh, we're yep. looking for your uh, comment. Okay. Uh, President Roberts, uh, members of the commission, uh, Director Nesvik. So I, I'm also opposed to this moving forward. Uh, I've been to all the task force meetings and um, in that one of those task force meetings, meetings Jennifer Doring uh, made the comment that we would have to be increasing general elk licenses by 1,000. And I don't know where that number came from, but right off the bat, I was pretty uh, concerned about that. And my reason for that is where do we put another 1,000 general non-resident elk hunters? So I did a little digging and uh, talked to some various people with the Game and Fish Department. I'm gonna throw some numbers out for you guys and gals on what the current number of non-residents are hunting a lot of these general units. The Cody thoroughfare area, 30% of the hunters in, the, in that area are non-resident hunters. You also have regulation about 8416. So if we go this way, which I don't think we should, are we gonna be reducing the number of non-resident hunters down to 14% in that region. So that would be a 16% loss or 14% loss of non-resident opportunity in the, in the thoroughfare. Where I hunt elk in the Snowies and the Sierra Madres, which is very good elk hunting 
And I just, I, I, I've yet to see a general area where I'm like, yeah, we just flat have too many bull elk here to hunt. We need to do something about all these bull elk. That's, that's not the case. It's very good hunting, but the reason it's very good hunting is because of this cap, the 7250. But anyway, the Sierras and the Snowies, where I hunt most of the time, 17% of the, uh, the hunters there are non-resident. That would have to be a reduction of 1%. Gray's River, uh, an area where I work primarily uh, at my day job, uh, that's 20% non-resident hunters. That would have to see a reduction of 4%. So I don't know that the goal is going to really uh, of removing the cap is going to work to do anything except for possibly, in my opinion, reduce opportunity uh, for non-resident hunters. Uh, and I think Commissioner Doobie made a great point that there's going to be some areas that are going to be huge losers in this. I would imagine the Cody thoroughfare area is probably going to take eight to 10 points to draw. Uh, where I hunt, there's probably going to be a little bit easier opportunity to draw, but maybe not. Uh, and I'm really worried about the distribution as far as where we're going to stack another thousand hunters if what Jennifer said is true. And the way you control an elk population is not to give out more bull tags. Uh, I know it was very successful in the Sierras where I hunt primarily. Uh, they started issuing a lot more uh, type six permits that herd, herd unit dropped you know, 6,000 elk in just a matter of a few years by just changing a few things, issuing more cow permits. That's how we control elk herds in Wyoming. We don't do it by killing bulls. And the other thing I, I think that is, is just really not fair about this whole process, uh, several years ago, I went to the department and I tried to get an aircraft and drone regulation pushed through, what, which ultimately did happen. That was a two year process. And I, and I think that's the way these processes should work. I think it should go to the public for a lot of public uh, review and, and to get it out there. And in my opinion, that was a really simple, a simple regulation change, uh, but yet it still took two years and I'm comfortable with that. And now it seems like we're fast tracking this just because of the task force. And I just don't think that's fair. I think we should just go back to doing business how we used to without the involvement of the task force force. Uh, the, the task force, in my opinion, has not been running very well. Uh, there's been some major issues with it. And uh, so I just I just think we should go back to doing business. I, I put a lot more faith in the commission than I do a task force. And like I say, I don't really care that 7250 was, a, a, you know, how that number was, you know, came about. The bottom line is elk hunting in Wyoming is the envy of the West. And I argue that the reason for that is because of the 7250 cap. So whether it's arbitrary or not, it's working, it's working well, it's worked since 89. And like I say, all you have to do is look at the number of non-residents on any hunting forum, anywhere that wanna come hunt elk in Wyoming, we are producing a great product here. And I just don't see any reason to, uh, to change things up at this point. And that's all I have, thank you. Any Comments from the commission? Okay, thank you, Mr. Hedick. Okay, um, is there anybody from else from the public that would like to comment at this time? Do we have any more that come in? Okay, um, one question. One question. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any? Um, is there any more discussion with the commission on these two topics on the antelope and then the seventy-two fifty? Mr. President, uh -huh. I'd like to make a motion on the type one antelope that we approve the department's recommendation. I guess it's the department's recommendation. So you, to a, to approve, move forward, approve it as a locked in vote. Kind of a, well, what's the procedure? I forward. think I think this is a procedure that we would have to go through comment as well. Okay. Yeah, this so, is just to go ask the department to put to draft a regulation, right. take it through public comment. Type one and moved by Commissioner Doobie, 
to move the, the <coughs> antelope uh, type one forward. Is there a second? Second. Oh, second. Okay, second, uh, Commissioner Jolovich. Uh, any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. Okay, also the next item would be on the 7250 cap. Um, is there a motion to move that forward? So moved. Uh, Commissioner Lundvall or Commissioner Bird. Commissioner Bird has motioned Second. it. Uh, Commissioner Duby has, uh, Commissioner, Bird, Commissioner Bird has moved it. Commissioner Duby has seconded it. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? It's uh, both of the items have been uh, voted on and approved to move forward for the game and fish to go through the process on public comment. So, okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, next item will be uh, awards recognitions. Uh, Chief King. Service is on our first. No. <laughs> <laughs> President Roberts, where is your where are the jokes? While we're waiting, jokes. As I recall, to retreat, you were very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Give us a recap on your uh, cornhole form. Your help, Mr. If you'd like to just bribe me a little bit more, go ahead. <laughs> President Roberts, Director Nesbick, members of the commission. Um, thank you. It's it's really a privilege and an honor to represent one of our outstanding wildlife biologists, uh, Gary Freilich, with his 35 years of service award. Um, I had to ch chase Gary down out in the hall. Gary is not one that really would like to stand here for recognition. He's probably <laughs> much more comfortable and at home in the hills um, and, and working hard out in the field. But I'd like to take just a few moments and and talk through uh, some of Gary's career. So like a lot of our employees, we're, we're really fortunate that, that people's life paths and, and choices um, bring them to the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And, and Gary is, is certainly no exception in that regard. So when Gary graduated from high school, he served a four-year stint in the US Air Force and then obtained his wildlife degree from the University of Montana. And after working or after completing his degree, he found himself in this corner of the state uh, carrying out some wildlife research work um, in, in Sublet and Uinta County. Um, that work was extremely important to us. He did some work studying moose on the winter range near Kimmerer. He researched some other energy development impacts on elk and other wildlife near Mountain View. Um, all of this was temporary employment. And then in 1988, he was promoted to a permanent position uh, in Cheyenne, where he, where he served diligently. I'm sure Cheyenne was not the place he wanted to land and spend his entire career. Um, in 1990, he was assigned to the, uh, the Buffalo Biologist District. He, he served in Buffalo as a biologist there until 1993, when he transferred to uh, Star Valley to, to take on the biologist uh, responsibilities there. Many of you know Gary. He's, he's an incredibly talented biologist, extremely hardworking. He, he represents what, what epitomizes a field biologist. He's probably covered every inch of his district, either by foot or by horseback, or flown over it. Um, he knows the resource that he manages extremely well, and, and Im equally importantly, he, he knows his constituents very well. So Gary has run the Alpine 
uh, check station for uh, ever since 1993, almost 30 years of running the Alpine check station where he's talked to thousands of hunters that have passed through there. I, th I think that's pretty amazing. In addition to that, he's, he's participated in, I, I don't know how many hunter education classes, but he's probably helped well over a thousand, thousand students in hunter education courses. Um, he, he has uh, been recognized several times for his efforts. He's recipient of a peer recognition award. He was recognized by Wyoga for being the agency personnel of the year. And in 2015, the Wildlife Division recognized his efforts with the uh, Wildlife Division Employee of the Year Award. So with that, again, my, it's uh, my pleasure to recognize Gary for 35 years of service to the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Certainly, this is uh, very humbling, and I uh, want to thank Rick and the director and certainly this commission uh, for this opportunity. Um, certainly, this is not uh, an award that I take lightly. It's uh, certainly my colleagues that have had the opportunity to work with over the last uh, 35 plus years played a key role in, in where we're at with uh, wildlife management uh, and certainly in the state of Wyoming, Western Wyoming. And so it is with uh, uh, a great deal of humbleness and, and gratitude uh, that I thank this commission, past commissions, and certainly um, the director and uh, his office, along with uh, the wildlife division, all the regions I've had the good fortune to serve with over these last uh, uh, 35 plus years. Thank you. For all the presenters, we're going to do the, the photos right when we're done here before lunch. Good morning, President Roberts, Director Nesvik, members of the commission, Eric Boltinger, Chief of Services. Um, this is a great commission meeting. Every time of year, I get excited because we're recognizing some really great people in each division. So for today, um, I'd like to announce that our 2021 Services Division of the Division Employee of the Year person is Todd Groskoff. Um, I'm excited about this as I present Todd Groskoff with the state. Todd Groskoff, who is a statewide Habitat and Access Supervisor as a 2021 Services Division Employee of the Year. Todd joined the Wyoming Game and Fish Department in 2014 as the supervisor of the statewide Habitat and Access team. Todd brought a wealth of habitat restoration knowledge from the private sector. He has increased the efficiency and effectiveness of the statewide team to an impressive level. And something I'll note before I go on, the statewide crew, I wish that I could present today numbers on how much the statewide crew saves the commission and the department when it comes to stream restoration type projects. It's just a huge amount and I'll get those numbers for you at a later date, but I'm really impressed with the work that these guys do and how much we save by rather them doing it in-house rather than contracting it out. Um, Todd's communication is, best, is his best quality, an important one with him based in Cheyenne. He can effectively communicate with his employees regional personnel, local governments, non-government organization, NGOs, and various vendors. Todd is a problem solver. He will consider all possible solutions and seeks input from everyone. Todd exemplifies the code of the cowboy conduct, ride for the brand. This is because Todd lives by Wyoming Game and Fish's motto of conserving wildlife and serving people every day of his life. His dedication to Game and Fish is unprecedented. He puts the wants and needs of the department above his own. Todd's attention to detail is impressive, and he ensures he completes all projects he leads in a high-quality professional manner. He supervises three specialists, three biologists, and one coordinator. He allocates equipment and staff based on statewide and regional needs. This is a huge task when determining where to send tractors, implements, loaders, dozers, excavators, backhoes, and dump trucks around the state. Todd is a master of this. 
because he is so talented at coordinating with biologists and contractors, as well as allocating resources and directing work, the statewide habitat and access crew team received Wyoming Game and Fishes Department's Team of the Year Award in 2017. Todd has been instrumental in many high profile projects, including the installation of the Heward Pipeline located on the Wick Bume WHMA, where his team installed 10,600 of 42 inch diameter pipe, head gates and outflow structures to replace a degraded irrigation canal. His team was also in charge of the Diamond Lake Public Access Area Pipeline Project, where they installed 5,800 feet of 24 inch PVC pipe to help deliver water to the popular trout fishery in Southeast Wyoming. The statewide crew also assisted greatly with the Sunlight Creek Stream Restoration Project on Sunlight Basin WHMA, which recently held through high flows this season due to large part of their high quality of work product. In light of Todd's many great qualities, accomplishments, dedication, and leadership, we are proud to recognize Todd Groskoff as a 2021 Services Division Employee of the Year. Excellent. Uh, just real quick, uh, President Roberts, members of the commission, Director Nesbitt, um, this award is a direct reflection of so many throughout the, the department in all divisions, including the director's office and all of you. I'd just like to give a shout out to them and tell them thank you. Without their support, I could not receive this. So thank you very much. Well done. Morning, President Roberts, Director Nesbick, members of the commission. Uh, it's my privilege to stand here again um, and recognize one of our outstanding employees in the wildlife division and recognize our wildlife division employee of the year, Mrs. Uh, Kendra Moore Brown. Um, it is an, an extremely uh, an honor for me to represent or uh, to present this award to Kendra. So Kendra has worked for the state for 15 years. She started out with our Access Yes program as an administrative assistant there. Uh, she was there in a time when that program was getting up and running and her ability to, to help that program get up and functioning uh, was instrumental in, in the success that that program enjoys today. She has a really keen eye for detail and uh, she, after serving in that access yes position, she took on the unique role of serving as both an office manager and an assistant to our deputy chief in the Casper office. So in that role, she wears a lot of different hats and she moves from uh, different responsibilities and, and, and does it effortlessly. So on an annual basis, uh, Kendra, for, for just for an example, she reviews uh, 200 plus damage claims and, and helps ensure that our damage claim process moves, moves uh, smoothly. And, and as you well know, we, we pay over a million dollars annually in damage claims. So it's a, it's a big workload and, and Kendra's attention to detail is uh, greatly appreciated in that regard. I think when I was a regional wildlife supervisor, I think I I, I thought that um, I could turn in some damage claims that were perfect, but it turns out that Kendra would quickly tell me they are not perfect. Um, she has an amazing ability to, to uh, uh, find, uh, comb through the details. So, and, and you know, another little thing, you'll notice that Mr. Scott Edberg is with us today. And, and you guys know Scott's uh, uh, kind of a su superhero. He's pretty, pretty amazing amazing guy with a lot of talents, but <clears throat> every superhero has a superpower. <laughs> and you are looking at uh, Mr. Edberg's superpower. That's Kendra. She worked uh, for a long time with Scott to ensure that uh, the division and the department's work was done well. I'd, I'd like to recognize her for that. She has been instrumental in creating some new or helping get some new techniques going, helping our field folks with, with uh, our damage program. She took it upon herself to institute 
uh, a new monitoring program that we're experimenting with where we're coordinating with a company that can use satellite technology to help monitor crop damage. Kendra took that on um, herself and, and has run with that experiment. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the results of that. So as you know, we've had a lot of transitions in the wildlife division over the last several years. And, and Kendra has really had to step up. And, and again, she wears a lot of hats every day, but in all these transitions, she's picked up added responsibilities. And she's just done that with a, with a great personality and a positive attitude and has stepped right up. And wherever the division needed help, Kendra was there to, to take charge and get things done. So with all that, it's um, my pleasure to uh, present to you the Wildlife Division Employee of the Year. Thank you, Director Nesvik. Thank you, Dana Fish Commission. Thank you, Rick King. And of course, um, Mr. Edberg. <laughs> Working for the Game and Fish Department is an honor, and I appreciate all of the support I received. Uh, Mr. Edberg has been a wonderful mentor for me over the last 10 years. Um, I appreciate um, the willingness that he has granted me to create a more um, inclusive and open communication when dealing with damage claims. Um, I just really appreciate um, all of this. Thank you. <laughs> Director Nesvik and Chief King, uh, I, on behalf of uh, Kendra's a rock star mm -hmm. and uh, nothing short of it. And uh, every dealing I've ever had with her has absolutely been enlightening and pleasurable and i could think of no better person than kendra to get this award thank you can you imagine keeping up with scott edberg every day <laughs> i no, and that's no. that's a double rock star yeah Five, three. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, fiscal vision mr president director uh, commission. Um, today, it's my honor uh, to introduce the fiscal employee of the year, but you notice she's not here. So um, um, I'm just going to introduce her real quick and then and then step away and we'll take care of uh, uh, the life happens presentation at a at a later date that's going to be uh, uh, better for her. But the fiscal division employee of the year is Adrian Andrello. Um, she was our draw coordinator. Uh, for the past few years, a very key position in the department. As uh, all of you know and, and may be able to understand, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure in licensing, a lot of pressure in draws, uh, in getting it right, getting them printed, getting them mailed, um, answering customers' questions, um, you know, responding and, uh, and adjusting to uh, uh, rules, regulations, legislative changes, and uh, making sure those are incorporated. Uh, with IT, programming, testing. Um, there's just a lot there. And Adrian was just absolutely fantastic about um, learning her position, uh, fulfilling that key role, taking some pressure off of uh, the licensing manager and her peers there. Um, so, uh, plus she had a wonderful pers personality, um, kind of quiet, um, absolutely fantastic, gracious and kind, very pleasant. And she had a keen sense of humor, and she always found a way um, to, to jibe others. And um, me particularly, a jibe that still stings in my rib is the draw results uh, would come out, and she'd congratulate me on being able to hunt on a general license for another year. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, big congratulations to Adrian, um, and I know how much she meant to licensing and all of fiscal, so uh, I'll... I'll catch up with Adrian later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adrian.
President Roberts, Commissioners, Director Nesbitt, uh, good morning. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, present to you this morning uh, the Fish Division Employee of the Year, Jeff Stafford. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, whenever you uh, uh, receive a award from the department, it's, it's extremely important. And in the case of these Division Employee of the Year, they're, they're really important because you're nominated by the board. And in Jeff's case, he was nominated twice by uh, five different co-workers. So that's pretty impressive. It just shows the amount of respect that Jeff receives from his co-workers. Jeff has worked for the uh, department as a contract and permanent employee since 1996. During that time, Jeff, Jeff has worked at seven of the 10 fish hatcheries and rearing stations in the state. And currently, Jeff is the uh, superintendent at the Wigwam Hatchery in, near Tensleep. And he's been there since 2010. Um, Jeff cares deeply for the fish raised and stocked from the facility. The fish produced are the highest quality and his enthusiasm for raising the requested numbers and sizes is unmatched. He's very good at communicating with the regional fisheries management crews when it comes to stocking timing, size changes and flip clipping and fish tagging. He's always willing to work with the crews when stocking dates need to be changed. Jeff's interest in fish he raises does not end when the crews stock the fish. Um, his perspective from an angler's point of view is a valuable addition to the management of Wyoming's fisheries. He's always asking how the fish are performing and um, in the field interested in what he can do to improve that performance. Jeff, Jeff has had a large hand in making some of the waters across the state destination for anglers. Jeff's passion for fishing, being able to tell a good fishing story, um, and Jeff is full of it. I mean, I mean, he's full of stories. I, I, I apologize, Jeff. And knowing uh, where the premier fishing spots across the state was important in developing the uh, Master Angler Program. Jeff was a co-lead in that uh, committee and did a great job steering the committee and helping the final product, the one that the Fish Division and Department is proud of. Proud of. This program has been uh, in, in, the, in uh, the work since 2019 is an extremely popular um, with both residents and non-residents, young and old. Um, as a supervisor, Jeff is well-rounded and respected by those that is supervised. He is exceptionally knowledgeable when it comes to aquaculture and all things fish-related. He spends the extra time to teach the art of the trade. He makes it a priority, striving to create opportunities for his employees to gain skills and experience to provide, prepare them to advance in their careers. He leads by example, Display, displaying a great balance between work and family, and he's understanding and supportive of his employees' families' lives. Jeff treats a new crew with respect and is very fair. Former employees have mentioned that Jeff is one of the best supervisors they've ever had. Jeff has had a very successful, um, been very successful over the past year, but most importantly, over his career. He has approached fish culture with passion, and that is the gold standard. Year after year, the Wigwam Rearing Station produces high quality fish that provide excellent opportunities for rank anglers around the state. Thank you, sir, for all your hard work. Brian, run. <laughs> All right, Mr. President, members of the commission, I have the honor to do a few awards here. So first, I'm going to start with the team of the year. This is a first, actually. This is the first time we've ever had nominations and recognition of an entire division as the team of the year, but this year's team of the year is uh, the fiscal division. So I'm gonna ask Melissa and Meredith to represent them and come up here to the podium with me. Um, we are going to, um, in Cheyenne, have uh, some recognition for the entire division, obviously logistically to get the entire division over here to Evanston today was gonna be difficult, but many of them I know are, are here watching online. We actually had, for this award, we had nominations from two, two different divisions. 
um, for the, the fiscal division as well as Meredith and Melissa for this award. So, you know, that means something when it comes from those folks that you're serving every day and that you're working with every day. And, and really that's, you know, that's what fiscal division is all about. It's a lot of their work's not real glamorous, but I can tell you this, that if uh, people can't draw their licenses and people don't have gas for their vehicles and people can't go out and, and implement all the great work that you all approve out on the ground, um, the, the department ceases to be able to carry out its mission. And so they are absolutely pivotal. While they're not out there every day in a green truck and a red shirt, they're pivotal for us to be able to meet our mission of serving the great people of this state and, and conserving our wildlife. So I'm gonna mention a few of their, um, some of the, the key excerpts from the nominations for these two ladies, as well as the fiscal division and, and, uh, and recognize these two ladies. So, um, you know, there's an, an amazing amount of institutional knowledge that's held in the division. And they take a lot of great pride in who they select for and who they train to be a part of, of Game and Fish. There's a lot of agencies around the state that, you know, employees move around back and forth. They try out different things, but, but the fiscal division in the Wyoming Game and Fish Department is the envy of many state agencies. They want to come work here. And a lot of times when they come, they don't ever leave. And it's because of the culture that, that these ladies, and you know what, Chief Phipps needs to be up here as well, because he's a big part of the culture of the division. So come on up here, Gregory. Um, but, but they create an environment that is just ripe for being able to serve, um, serve our great department, serve this commission. They work weekends, they work long hours. They, at times, you know, if you've, you've all been in the Cheyenne office and you know that when you walk in the front doors there, you're greeted with a smile. Those folks that are working at the front counter and the, um, that are part of the telephone information and the front counter personnel, those, um, those folks are part of the fiscal division. And, and uh, just exceptional, I get, there's not a week that goes by that I don't hear good things about those folks that the public is greeted by every time they, they walk through our door. They have really um, scaled up their efforts here in the last couple of years to learn new software, um, to deal with a lot of challenging political issues, as well as all of this work that's been generated in the research and the analysis that's been generated by the Wildlife Task Force. Um, they work routinely with other state agencies like the, uh, the state auditor's office, as well as the attorney general's office, um, the legislature, every single bill that uh, it has a game and fish impact, they have to evaluate what that fiscal impact is gonna be on the department and provide that to the decision makers so they can consider that when they pass bills. Um, extremely, um, dedicated group of folks. They really, you know, when, when I sit down one-on-one -on -one and I talk, especially with these two ladies here, and I ask them, you know, what, what is it about, about game and fish? And while their, their job every day is to deal with numbers and contracts and budgets, it's about wildlife. That's why they're here is wildlife. And, and, and so that's really cool. And I think that that represents the, the culture of the, of the fiscal division. Very proud of them. Um, recently, they have implemented um, a new budget module and a document management system that was that came as a recommendation several years ago um, to improve our efficiency and to improve our ability to, to do our jobs um, and to, to work through all of the, the fiscal challenges that we have every day. And it's been a, a big lift. The commission allocated a lot of resources to it, um, but they've um, they've been able to pull that off and it, it's continuing on, but, but they've learned a lot of new, um, a lot of new applications and software. Um, they've had to collaborate with all kinds of different outside vendors um, internally with our IT folks. Um, and they've, they've created a really long overdue system that, that really is going to improve our ability to be accurate and to do the work that we have to do every day and be transparent about it. This new budget module was built um, completely from the ground up to really be unique and aligned just with Game and Fish. It's not something you just take off the shelf, bring it in and make it all work. It's gotta be tweaked and aligned um, for, for our agency. And it's really made some significant improvements and we're gonna continue to see the fruits from all their labor in the future. Um, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of these folks on a daily basis and um, it's just always absolutely a pleasure. Um, Think the world of all of them and uh, they are definitely deserving of this recognition.
President, the words of Elvis. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well then. All right. So like um, the divisions, the the group that doesn't belong to a division that, that works under the umbrella of the director's office, we we have an employee that we recognize every year. This is separate from the director's award. It's specific to those employees that are that are housed within the director's office. And this year's recipient is Miss Ashley Leonard. Is Ashley here? So Ashley is online. Her husband is here, though. That's good. Um, maybe we should have him come up and accept the, the award. He's also one of our great employees. But I'll take a minute to talk a little bit about what um, her coworker supervisor said about her and why she's deserving of the, of the 2021 um, Director's Office Employee of the Year. Um, first of all, she's very driven, very accomplishment focused, and she's responsible for the conservation education programs in our camps. She oversees all the camps up at the conservation camp, and um, she has been instrumental in making that whole program um, fit to the new opportunities we have at the camp and, and to also grow it. Very dedicated to the agency and wildlife, um, believes strongly in the department's mission, um, has a ton of enthusiasm. It just kind of boils out of her when you see her um, for conservation education, constantly working towards improving all of those programs involved in, you know, both within her um, sphere of influence and also outside of that as well. She works with other divisions, other employees. She brings that positive attitude to the, the people that she works with and really just creates a really cool environment to, to work in. She's constantly thinking about others and how her work is gonna affect other people. Um, she likes new ideas. She's very innovative, very bright. And, um, and she's been successful in being able to implement a lot of those new innovative ideas. She works with the public regularly and does exceptional with that. Like I said, a very positive attitude. Um, and she just, um, there's, if you give her a mission, um, she's gonna go at it full bore, at a lope right off the beginning. Um, there's no slowing her down. And, you know, she's also demonstrated because of that positive attitude and how driven she is, she's got a lot of leadership qualities. And, you know, the leadership doesn't necessarily happen just because you have a position. It happens because you're willing to work with others and set a good model and lead by example. And Ashley, Ashley does all of that stuff. A lot of work in her community, um, summer camps, helped with a lot of hunter education needs, um, she has gone out and done a lot of presentations for the department to the public. Um, she's been involved in Inspire a Kid and that she develops that, that newsletter. Um, overall, very organized, does a lot of great planning and just has an extreme level of professionalism. Very deserving of this award. And I will look forward to seeing Ashley who just had her second child here recently. I suspect that's why she's not here. It's been more than like two days, but I mean, um, She's got her second new baby at home, and, and I look forward to seeing Ashley when, when uh, she gets back to work and congratulating her for a well-deserved award. So each year, I have the distinct honor to be able to select from all approximately 400 of our employees, one employee who has gone above and beyond um, over a long period of time to do great things for wildlife and for the public and for our agency. And um, it's a great honor for me to, today to announce that the 2021 Director's Award is going to Mr. Doug McWhorter. So Doug was told to come down here today because one of his long-term compadres and is, uh, is Gary Fralick, who you know was recognized for 35 years. And so when Doug got here today, I said, what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, Gary's getting his 35 year um, years of service award. So he has no, he had no idea before he got here, this was coming. So. <laughs> but Doug, um, I've 
been very privileged to work with Doug for many, many years. He's got 35 years with the department. Um, without question, both an ex and just an exceptional leader and a mentor to many folks across the department. When you've been around and been in, as involved in the most contentious issues that we deal with, um, as Doug has, you're going to have the opportunity to influence a lot of people, and he has, both in the department and out. Um, he's had, you know, he's not ever been in a, in a like a staff level position. He's never been a deputy chief or chief of the, of the division or anything, but he has chosen within his, um, within wherever he's been charged with uh, and whatever assignments he's been given, he's chose to lead at the statewide level. And I wanna talk a little bit about some of the, the statewide work that Doug's been involved with. He's worked um, for a very long time because he's, a, he's our bighorn sheep expert. He's, he has as much knowledge as anybody in this state on bighorn sheep management, bighorn sheep history, he's writing a book about it. And so he, because of his expertise and his interest and his passion, his on the ground work and um, work with on the ground with sheep themselves, has had the opportunity to be involved in a lot of these bigger initiatives across the state. He's been involved with the wool growers, stock growers, lots of legislators, highly influential people all over the state that have been involved in major wildlife policy related to bighorn sheep. Um, he has a work ethic that's just phenomenal. He's always been one of my mentors. I've worked with him in multiple capacities. I, I actually followed him as the warden into, he had left recently as the biologist in Pinedale and Everywhere I went, I heard about Doug because Doug had such an impact on, on people and, and worked, worked hard. The first time I got to see Doug um, in, a, in a contentious meeting was in Mr. Lundvall's town in, in Cody, Wyoming. And, and um, Cody, Wyoming, people really value wildlife and they're very passionate about it. And um, we were dealing with some really tough elk management challenges at the time. And large carnivore issues and lots of grizzly bear conflicts and people mad about it. And, and Doug could walk into a room about whatever topic I, I put him on this, uh, this elk working group. And it was really, and he could just walk into the room and because of his credibility and the manner in which he interacts with people, he could just own the room and people believe him when he talks because he talks from the heart. And he, and he means what he says and says what he means. And uh, just an incredible ambassador when he's, uh, when he's out in front of a lot of people. He's led our Bighorn Sheep um, working group for a number of years um, as, as a co-chair. He's done a ton of on the ground, probably the largest Bighorn Sheep research project ever done in Wyoming. Um, this has evolved into large scale capturing and collaring and disease surveillance body condition measurements for several of our core native herds of bighorn sheep. Um, he, this has led to a lot of recent new proposals that we've had with regards to um, new lamb seasons and ways to use those to deal with disease. He's um, worked with Montana State University and uh, on the Mount Goat uh, bighorn sheep interactions and a symposium that was conducted. He's w been involved with um, a recently released book, um, Greater Yellowstone's Mountain Ungulates, A Contrast in Management Histories and Challenges. And this is all on bighorn sheep and, and mountain goats. He has served as the co-chair of the statewide bighorn domestic sheep interaction working group, which is made up of both the public and the, and the department and other agencies to deal with the, the Wyoming plan, the plan that we're also proud of and that is the model of the West. Um, Doug has been an instrumental part of that from day one and continuing to um, ensure that we adhere to the tenets of that, that great piece of work. Um, he was recently organized, or he did organize the biennial um, symposium for the Northern Wild Sheep and Goat Council um, that took place in Jackson. Um, he has received a very long list of awards from his peers. He's been the Wildlife Division Employee of the Year um, he's been the Wildlife Conservationist of the Year for the Wyoming Wildlife Federation, um, Wildlife Professional of the Year from the Wyoming chapter of TWS. Um, he's received the Outstanding Leadership Award from the department, um, Wildlife Manager of the Year from the Wyoming Game Wardens Association, um, recognized by his peers in Cody, um, and also 
uh, the Wild Sheep Biologist Wall of Fame from the Wildlife uh, or from the Wild Sheep Foundation. He um, began his career, like I said, 35 years ago. He did a, a bachelor's of science degree at Wichita State University in 87 and a master's from UW in 1993. And um, right after he, he uh, completed his education, he came to work for us as a, as a biologist in Cheyenne and then moved around. He was in Cheyenne Wheatland, transferred to Pinedale, and then uh, went and transferred to Cody. And now um, back to Jackson as the wildlife management coordinator in, in Jackson. And he's been there for, for eight years. So in summary, um, I can't think of anybody more deserving of um, an award um, like this and be recognized for all the work he's done for so many years for Wyoming's wildlife and Wyoming's people, and especially bighorn sheep. So Doug, congratulations. And This isn't, this isn't fair. Um, I wasn't prepared for this, um, but I will, <clears throat> excuse me. I will just say that my career has been incredible. Uh, I owe that entirely to the people uh, that have been around me during that career, my coworkers, colleagues, friends in the department, in other agencies, other entities, uh, the support I've received from every boss I've had up to the director and the commission has been extremely meaningful to me. So uh, that's that's made my career just a, a charmed one. And I, I do have to say that I've always considered uh, being entrusted to manage wildlife for the citizens of Wyoming a, 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 an incredible privilege. And I've never uh, taken that responsibility for granted. So with that, I'm very humbled and just thank you so much. All right, and last for today, I have the honor again to take another great opportunity to recognize a very long-term friend and coworker um, with the Department's Lifetime Achievement Award um, for Mr. Scott Edberg. Please come on up, Scotty. So everybody knows Mr. Edberg, and you know what? He, we had an opportunity to thank him for his service um, when he retired from the agency here back in February and um, had a good chance to tell him thanks for all of his work um, as the deputy chief, culminating as the deputy chief for the wildlife division. But, you know, really we have, we don't, we don't award like every year the Lifetime Achievement Award, it, it really goes only to those folks that really have an above and beyond exemplary contribution to the state. And there was no way to, to not um, give this award to Scotty Edbury. That's why we made him come back one more time to stand in front of you and let me say really cool things about what an incredible man he is. I also wanna recognize his wife PJ is here today and obviously she's been a significant portion of his career and his success and all of the many, many nights that um, she was home alone while Scott was out doing great things for our state. Um, he started with us and offered his talents up beginning in 1991. He was first the Glen Rock Game Warden. Many, there's people in this room, um, one of them on the commission and one of them in the public that I know have known Scotty since that very first warden assignment back in 1991. And um, he quickly demonstrated his value to the state. He achieved excellence right from the get-go. He was always that, that guy that was looked up to. He was used um, to train new employees, and he was used as a mentor to employees, you know, very early on in his career. He was an exceptional wildlife law enforcement officer. He knew how to, to take the Wyoming approach to Wyoming law enforcement and, as a game warden and could go and catch the baddest of bad and do it in a way that really reflects the badge that he wore on his chest and the red shirt that he wore and the green truck that he drove every day in a, just an exceptional manner. He worked there in Glen Rock for, 
gosh, up until 2000. And then he moved over to Pinedale, decided he wanted to go jump into some new issues and take on his first supervisory role. He was the first game warden supervisor that we had um, in Pinedale and really the first one that we had in the state. It was a new position that we'd created to deal with some of the challenges we had at the time over in that part of the world. Very engaged right off the get-go and all the controversial issues there. Um, he really um, demonstrated some effective leadership skills. People love to follow Scotty because of the enthusiasm and the passion that he brought and the care. I mean, everybody knew he just the way he acts, you, you just could tell he, he cares about you. You know, he, this is how I've told this story before, but I got to tell it again because it's funny. So every morning, the way Scotty would start off the morning at like five in the morning is he'd call all of his guys like, where are you at? What you doing? OK, bye. You know, and he he would uh, he, he was he had so much care for the people that worked for him that, that that that's that's how he showed how much he cared is he made sure he checked up on his guys all the time. Um. Eternal optimism is a word I would use to describe, or two words I'd use to describe Scotty. Um, just a lot of energy, and and he carried that right right to the end. In 2004, he was recognized again for his great leadership, and he was promoted to be the Casper Regional Wildlife Supervisor, um, where he took on a very important job. As all of you know, the regional wildlife supervisors are critical to our mission. Um, in 2011, one of my more brilliant decisions I've ever made, <laughs> Thursdays he asked me if that was true, but it was. Um, I brought him on to be my deputy chief when I became the wildlife division chief. And, um, and that's the position he served in until he retired here recently. You know, he had a real eye for a lot of the stuff you see in the books, those regulation books um, that you often have to pour through before these meetings. Um, he had a real keen eye for detail and statutes and regulation and doing the right thing for our state. He had um, a knack for thinking through the second, third, fourth order effects of how a decision might affect us down the road. And um, he, he did exceptional work with, with regulations, um, law enforcement policy, um, grizzly bear, working on how we responded to the increase in grizzly bear conflicts with humans, specifically attacks on humans. Um, he's an expert in chronic waste and disease and led a lot of the department's efforts with regards to how we've dealt with chronic waste and disease over the years. Um, played a key role in dealing with how, the, how we would implement regulations on aquatic invasive species and then and, and enforce those. And um, He's really, you know, when it comes to those kind of things, he's, he's a legacy in the department. It, it will be a long time before we don't see Scotty's fingerprints all over our policy and our regulations. Um, always led by example, right to his last fall. Um, he was out in the field. He planned every year. As busy as Scotty was, he planned to make sure he was out in the field working hunting seasons, working at check stations, going out on boats, and um, being out on the ground with, with troops, which was incredible. He also took on a, a significant role with our, both of the, the big organizations that we work with, with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, as well as the Western, Associ Western Association. And then also um, with the National Association of Conservation Law Enforcement Chiefs, he and I worked together on a steering committee that put together and, and started um, a leadership academy, and, and Scotty was a big, big part of that. We had members from all over the country that, that worked hard to put that thing into place. Um, he was also, he, he loved our culture and believed in it so strongly um, that he was a key part of all the right things to preserve as much of our history as we could. He was um, involved in the Casper offices um, historical display there and that that all the work that went into putting that together and finding all the right stuff to put in there um, he had has um, integrity that is above reproach and if Scotty said it you can take it to the bank and I can personally attest to that for many 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 years um, that I could always trust what he told me was 
um, to his knowledge, the, the best answer and the most accurate and truthful answer that I could get. Um, you know, one of the things that his folks, um, you know, when they, they look at quotes that might describe Scotty from famous people, um, one that they list is Teddy Roosevelt's thought that character in the long run is the decisive factor in the life of an individual of nations alike. And, and Scotty believed that character really, really mattered. I know that he will give all the credit for everything he's done to the people that he worked with every day. And that's another testament to his character. But he is one of those people who made a difference. Highly effective, driven, passionate, conservation law enforcement officer and a leader and a policymaker. And um, just one hell of a good guy. And uh, it's an absolute privilege, Scotty, to have you back one more time and tell you thank you. A golf and get a free meal or something but uh, <laughs> wasn't really expecting this in any way shape or form but uh, first thanks to pj and the family without them i would be right today but uh, follow up doug mcwarder's words my success is because of the commission my fellow employees and the publics that we work with they they did all the work i just kind of championed the effort and, and moving forward so um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to, to receive this. And I wish uh, congratulations to the other award winners today in the, in the past and the future, because again, they're the ones that do all the work in the trenches every day. Thank you. It's here. Okay. Uh, this time we're going to recess for lunch and we're going to go back on session at uh, 12 30. So we'll move up the afternoon just about 30 minutes, but we're going to go for an hour. Uh, do I hear a, any motion to recess for lunch? Mr. President? First, I just want to personally thank all the award winners, too. I mean, it, uh, they do a yeoman's job trying to make us look good and it doesn't always work out. But I, I appreciate all the reverence that, you know, without them, we'd be nothing. And their, their dedication to this department and all of the employees that I've seen over the years is second to none. Nine to five means nothing uh, to our folks. I just want to thank you all personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an announcement. One announcement. So we will, for the award recipients and their chiefs, we will do photos where? So Regina says we're going in the lunchroom towards the north end, and that's where we'll do photos quickly. And um, need president there too, please. Any motion for a recess for lunch? So moved. So Motion by Commissioner Jolovich, second by Commissioner Brokoff to motion for lunch for recess. Well, we'll go back in session. Uh, uh, Works for me, I guess. At 12.30. Thank you. <laughs> I'm talking about my sleep these days.
Nadine? No, uh, Susan. Susan Johnson. Okay. I knew it a long time ago. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to call us back to order. Um, I note the presence of all of the commissioners. A, uh, the first item after lunch is uh, Sean, and you go ahead and uh, on the acquisitions. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesbick. So we have some uh, property items for you today. The first is not currently on the agenda, but it is a, um, a property that you've been briefed on previously, and it's in the, the budget. It's a, a replacement for the current Buffalo Warden Station. Uh, as you know, with housing being as difficult to acquire as it is these days, we, we move pretty quickly on a property there. Uh, we got that under contract for the asking price at 385000 and we are scheduled to close on that this week on the 22nd. So we just wanted to let the commission know that's where we were at with it and make sure that there were no concerns, issues, or questions. Did you say 385 or 380? Uh, 385,000. All right, thank you. All right, with, with that, we'll move on to the agenda items on the, the current agenda. The first is what we're calling the chimney draw conservation easement donation. This is actually phase three of the Munger Mountain conservation easements. Uh, the last one we previously brought to the commission in November of 2021. This is very near the South Park wildlife habitat management area in the Jackson region. Uh, so as you can see here, we have a, Let's see if I can back to switch here. Okay. So on this map, uh, just to give you some proximity, this is the South Park WHMA. Uh, the previous two donations to the commission, uh, Munger Mountain One and Munger Mountain Two, are located here. And this current proposal for a donation is this kind of faded red here. So th this whole corridor area is uh, being conserved due to its very high uh, valued habitat for a multitude of species. Uh, this particular easement is for 200, and, or excuse me, uh, 236 acres was conserved on the Munger Mountain One, uh, another 146 on the Munger Mountain Two, and this one conserves 256 acres, um, 181 of which are covered by the Forest Legacy Program. So you can see the estimated total project cost of this easement. Uh, the, the total cost of the easement is estimated to be $18 million. $10 million of that will be provided from Forest Legacy funding, $195,000 from WWNRT, and the remaining will be donated by the landowner. These easements are very important for that area to uh, keep that, that habitat in check. Uh, it's very desirable site for development. So the uh, conservation fund, the Jackson Hole Land Trust and some other partners have been working very hard to, to conserve that particular area. And the Wyman Game and Fish Commission has previous two donations and it has the same provisions as the previous two easements and the Jackson Hole Land Trust monitors these easements for us on an annual basis. So the department is recommending that the commission accept this donation as well. Commissioner okay. Roberts? Yes. So we would entertain a motion to accept the donation or have some discussion. <clears throat> All right. Uh, motion is to accept the chimney draw corridor conservation easement donation. Um, do we have a motion? Uh, it's moved by Commissioner Jolovich. Second, Second. by Commissioner Doobie. Uh, do we have any discussion? Mr. President, I have a question for Sean. Sean, when we get a donation like this, do we have annual reoccurring costs of any kind? Do we have to do the fencing or 
Is there any maintenance costs in these deals? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Brokaw, each conservation easement is different, but in these instances specifically, we have very little uh, cost on the department's behalf, especially when it comes to what would be mainly the only cost to the department would be monitoring. But again, that that's being provided to us by the Jackson Hole Land Trust in these instances. So um, from a from a cost to the department basis, these are very, very minimal. Great. It's a nice donation. Any more discussion? All those in favor signify aye. 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 All those opposed? <clears throat> Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The next property is what we're calling the Rock Springs property acquisition. So the Green River region and the department has determined a location at the intersection of County Road 33 and US Highway 191 <clears throat> as a, the best location for an AIS check station. So this is on the east side of Flaming Gorge Reservoir. So Aggie Grazing LLC, also they're basically a subsidiary of Sweetwater Royalties. They've agreed to sell the department, the commission 10 acres. Uh, we offered $100,000 and they accepted. So we're currently working on that contract. Uh, we had an appraisal completed uh, supporting that price. So we're ready to move forward. Uh, here's kind of a location based on its proximity to Rock Springs, Green River, and the, the Flaming Gorge area. And I know Josh Leonard's in attendance and he can probably give some more detailed answers on any questions you might have. But here's a aerial photograph of the area. Um, you can see Highway 191 running along here. The property's positioned right at that, that intersection of the County Road 33. Uh, what specific highway, so. size of the does what specific is that road going into is, it, is that going into the the fire hole side or is that mr president that's correct okay. that goes in the, the fire hole area and it, again it, it's 10 acres there right on the highway where we can ideally bring boaters in and, and do the checks so the department's recommending that the commission move forward with the purchase of this property okay um is there any motions for the uh, for the department to move forward on the Rock Springs property acquisition in Sweetwater County? Mr. President, I guess I just have one question too. So we get the land bought. What does it take then to get it all set up for a check station? There'll be probably a significant cost to get that done. Uh, an estimate. Yeah, uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Bird. Uh, there will be some some expenses there to develop the site and make it usable for not only the AIS check station, but I know that uh, the fish division has some potential other plans in the future, and, and Josh can probably speak to that a little bit better than I can. President Roberts, uh, Commissioners, and Director Nesvik, we currently have in the FY23 budget uh, about $440,000 for this check station. And 100 of that is set aside for this purchase. So it'll be about $340,000 more um, to develop that site and get the check station up. Thank you. I have a motion. We'll move. So a second. Uh, it's moved by Commissioner Duby, seconded by Commissioner Brokaw uh, to move forward on the. Rock Springs property acquisition, Sweetwater County. Any discussion? Those in favor, signify aye. 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 Those opposed, hearing none, move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. The final project uh, we have this, this afternoon is the Bear River Divide access easement. <clears throat> so several of you were able to accompany us out on the tour yesterday to kind of see the expanse of the, the Bear River Divide HMA. Uh, this HMA is fairly important to the, the Evanston area, the community, uh, access to hunting in particular in this area. The grazing association that we're working with uh, holds approximately 91,760 deeded acres in the area. And if you include the additional BLM state lands that are within that, that boundary, it's about 200,000 acres of access. 
to the area provides access for, for deer, some elk hunting uh, and pronghorn hunting as well. Uh, this is probably, yeah, well, in fact, it, it is. The department issues more HMA permission slips on this area than any other in the state. Uh, and as you heard in the presentation yesterday, uh, it's, it's got a lot of other important aspects about it for migration as well. So here's a map of the, the area. As you can see it coming out of the north part of Evanston, uh, how large it is. And we traveled kind of through the middle of it yesterday, coming across here and then back on the highway south to Evanston, just seeing a, a portion of that property. Uh, we, we negotiated with uh, the Grazing Association a 30-year term with a $2 million price, uh, which we will pay out over a five-year period at $400,000 per year. So this, this basically equates to 73 cents per acre on an annual basis. We use a combination of information from Montana's block management program, Office of State Land leases, and some, some leases that the commission holds through the lands program already to kind of determine uh, a good way to negotiate. And we felt like we arrived at a, at a reasonable price for the, the size of the property. So at this time, we're asking uh, the commission to approve the purchase of this easement. Um, I believe that we might have a uh, public comment on this, on uh, uh, Jane Haven. Haven. And Shane's representing Wyoming Outdoor Council. Hello. Thank you, Mr. President and Dr. Nesbeck for recognizing me here today. My name is Shane Haven and I am the Wildlife Migration Corridor Intern for the Wyoming Outdoor Council. I am a Wyoming native and have grown up hunting, fishing, camping, and playing in the Wyoming outdoors my entire life. I'm a full-time student at the University of Wyoming, working on a double bachelor's degree in energy and environmental systems and energy and natural resources. And it is my hope to go on to focus, to go on to law school and focus on environmental law. The Wyoming Outdoor Council's mission is to protect Wyoming's environment and quality of life now and for future generations. The Wyoming Outdoor Council has worked in partnership with many NGOs and government agencies in this ongoing pursuit of protecting public and state lands and keeping them open to the public. The Wyoming Outdoor Council would like to take this opportunity to thank the Wyoming Game and Fish Department for pursuing and capitalizing on this opportunity to keep the Bear River Divide HMA open to the public year round for many years to come. Wyoming Outdoor Council has also like to thank the UNO Livestock Grazing Partnership, the Belle Butte Grazing Partnership, and the Bear River Land and Grazing for working with the Wyoming Game and Fish to allow public access to their lands to ensure access to landlocked public areas. The Bear River Divide is an essential area that has been important to hunters, anglers, and outdoor enthusiasts for years. Unfortunately, as we all know, HMAs are suitable only for five years before they have to be renewed and can usually be canceled by the landowner before the five years is up. One example is that these private lands can be leased to private businesses and shut off to the public access. However, the Wyoming Game and Fish has worked tirelessly over the past year to reach an agreement with the grazing associations to ensure that this HMA will be open to the public year round for the next 30 years. There's also an, an upside to the $2 million five-year payouts. First, it assures that administration changes and fiscal cutbacks did not interfere with the Bear River Divide program in the long-term or the Wyoming Game and Fish budget as a whole. Funding is available now, so it is an opportune time to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. Second, getting the payments out of the way in this first five years allows for future access yes funding to go to other HMAs and access yes properties to ensure public access to public lands. And at the same time, it keeps the Bear River Divide open to the public for an additional 25 years. We would like to say job well done and thank you. 
Wine and Game and Fish Department. And thank you to the UNO Livestock Grazing Partnership, the Bell Butte Grazing Partnership, and the Bear River Land and Grazing. We greatly appreciate your ongoing work to create opportunities for Wyoming hunters, anglers, and outdoor enthusiasts, and for continuing to be great stewards of the outstanding resources of our state. Thank you. Any questions from the commissioner? Thanks. Um, are you going to be asking to move forward or vote to sign the easement? Um, Mr. President, we'd like to move forward and close on the project. Okay. Uh, I entertain a motion for uh, the Bear River Divide Access easement in the Uinta County. Uh, do I have a motion? Mr. President, I make that motion. I went on the tour yesterday. This is an absolute unbelievable piece of property with what it's going to provide for the sportsmen of the state of Wyoming. Thank you. So the motion's made by Commissioner Ladwig. Second. By Commissioner That's a Jolovich. gimme. Commissioner Jolovich. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Discussion. You guys are not sitting by each other. Now. <laughs> Mr. President, I do have a question. Sean, um, What's our payment strategy? How, how much of that money would be access yes dollars? And um, um, Mr. Mr. President, Commissioner Brokaw, so as you know, through um, some earmarked funds through House Bill 122, there's funds set aside for access. The intent is for those uh, funds to pay for this access. Very good. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, favors have it. If we move forward, please. Mr. President, uh, if, you, if I may, can we circle back to the Buffalo Warden Station acquisition? Yes. Uh, could we ask the commission to vote on that particular project? Um, department recommends moving forward with closing on that home at $385,000. Do we have a motion for the commission to move forward on purchasing the Buffalo Warden? Home at $385,000. So moved. Uh, Commissioner Jolovich has moved it. Second. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Doobie. Uh, any uh, comment? Finish the deal. Okay. Finish the deal. Close it up. Get her done. Good job, man. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, chapter 10. And in my understanding, we're gonna do chapter 10, and then we're going to address chapter 69, and then we're going to circle back and vote on 10, and then 69, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, President Roberts, Director Nesbick, members of the commission, uh, before we dive into these regulations, I, I just wanted to take a minute to recognize our, our folks that have been working really hard over several years to update these regulations. It's been an, a long, lengthy process. A lot of our folks across all divisions, fish, wildlife, and services have, have worked together to update, um, clean up these regulations, and, and bring them to you today. So um, with that, I'll turn the time over to Mark Nelson to address Chapter 10 first. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, that's getting queued up. Uh, President Roberts, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, uh, we thought it'd be a good idea just to give you a brief history of Chapter 10, uh, why it looks uh, what it is right now, how we came to this regulation over the years, all through legislation and regulations. So it'll just be a brief synopsis of, of some of our legislation.
Okay, thanks for your patience. So way back in 1905, uh, legislation was passed that allowed a responsible resident person of good character to <laughs> capture any game animal uh, okay. except moose for the purpose of domestication. And all they had to do was uh, apply to the chief game warden for a fee of a dollar and they could move on with that, those animals. In 1909, uh, the state actually declared wildlife as a property of the state, but they allowed that uh, domestication and prop propagation to continue until 1927. Then jump forward to 1975, uh, legislation uh, established that there could be no private ownership of bigger trophy game animals. However, that specific legislation in 1975 exempted the NX Bar Ranch uh, they could still own the elk that they had on the ranch. Then looking at some of the regulation history, the Game and Fish Commission approved in 1967, chapter 10, and it was fairly a, a bare bones, basic regulation that just said, uh, if someone wanted an animal, they had to seek permission through the commission. And then in 75, the commission did address that legislation uh, that said there's no, uh, ownership of any living bigger trophy game animal and the commission did exempt the game farm uh, in that regulation in 1975 the nx bar and then uh some uh, things happened that really did uh, uh, shape chapter 10 in our history uh, in 1989 and 90 john dorrance who was at that time the heir of the campbell soup fortune uh, wanted to bring in some animals. And uh, first uh, thing that he wanted to do was uh, bring in some uh, hybrids. And he also wanted to have some exotic animals. And he wanted to have native wildlife. So really three different categories that he was looking to do, categories of animals wanting to bring in. So, uh, the Game and Fish refused to grant him permission uh, to bring in uh, certain animals, uh, which he contested through U.S. District Court. Uh, and the Wyoming Supreme Court actually did, dismissed that case, and Dorrance did not uh, file a brief. Uh, hold on one second here, let me back up. No, that's correct. So the U.S. District Court and the Supreme Court uh, they dismissed that case because Dorrance did not file a brief through the Supreme Court uh, and he had to remove hybrids. So through all that litigation with, with John Dorrance, with him wanting to bring in exotics, wanting to bring in hybrids, wanting to bring in native wildlife, the commission in 1992 really strengthened our chapter 10 regulation. Uh, they strengthened it. They, they uh, did not uh, allow importation of any kind of native wildlife. Uh, they really increased, the commission increased the health standards that uh, people need to adhere to when they brought in certain wildlife. Uh, people, if, if a disease outbreak occurred or escapes occurred, they had to pay for the cost of depopulation. And we really expanded our application requirements. And in that year, the commission did address the NX game, uh, game farm in more detail. They permitted the game farm for 23,000 acres, and that's in Northeast Sheridan County. And the commission at that time said the permit was attached to the land. So with that, we'll get into the, the heart of our draft proposal that's before you. And like Chief King said, this was quite a long endeavor, uh, four years actually, of our team that worked on this cross divisions. Uh, we started with chapter 10 and quickly realized that chapter 10 has its fingers in a lot of different regulations. 
It has fingers in uh, non-game regulation, uh, scientific permit regulation, some other cold-blooded wildlife regulation. So uh, it, took, it took four years just because it was fairly detailed analysis. And we also learned that many of our health requirements in chapter 10 are outdated. Uh, there's certainly new uh, wildlife health uh, testing and uh, certain diseases have cropped up that we haven't dealt with before. So we address those. Some animals have come on the scene that are injurious to the state's wildlife that we don't want in. So we added some animals. Certain animals actually um, are a detriment. They're, they harm themselves or they're hard to care for, for that particular animal. So we've exempted some of those. And I'm gonna give you a, really an overview of the major changes. Uh, you have the draft before you. If you have specific questions, I can certainly answer those. <clears throat> so the first thing that our team found was that it really didn't make too much sense to keep cold-blooded references in chapter 10. Uh, chapter 10 now deals with warm-blooded and cold-blooded, but there's such a difference between cold-blooded and warm-blooded when you look at health requirements, look at cage size for if, you're, if they're gonna hold or study an animal. We found that it would uh, be better to split chapter 10, keep chapter 10 warm-blooded and make a new that we'll propose later on today, chapter 69 for cold-blooded. And we also shortened the title just to, uh, uh, brevity is, is good and, and the, the title now captures everything that, that we need in the in the regulation as far as the naming of it. So domestic animals, we did add, uh, originally in the draft before you, we took out the domestic re European rabbit because that's listed as an injurious species. So we removed it. We actually put it back in. Uh, the wild European rabbit is injurious. The domestic one is not. So we didn't want to exempt or, or prohibit from importation later on these domestic animals, European rabbits. So it's a little difference in what you have before you. We put that back in. Uh, our wildlife vet, Dr. Sam Allen and I met with the Wyoming Livestock Board on these other species that you see in blue there. Uh, we proposed to add domestic quail and uh, the common quail and the Japanese quail or the button quail as domestic animals. They've been domesticated since the 15th century. We also are adding the domestic water buffalo back in and the domesticated zebra. And the livestock board actually uh, defines zebra as a horse right now. In section five, one thing to note is that we did insert or add that if wildlife escapes, that the department can take uh, the wildlife if it poses a threat to public safety or to wildlife resources. Currently, we have to wait 48 hours. This will give us immediate action. Section 11, so this is warm-blooded wildlife prohibited from importation and possession. You can't bring them in, you can't possess them at all. A new one on the list would be uh, the order of the non-human primates. And we talked to uh, various people, uh, authorities at zoos, other scientific experts, uh, and the, those primates are extremely hard to care for. Uh, zoos even have a hard time caring for these animals. So an individual that, I mean, they're such a social animal, they need such care and attention. Most of the states do not allow them to, to be possessed. The CDC actually prohibits their importation except for scientific research. We added the red deer and the red deer hybrid. They're actually in there as, as not being uh, allowed to be imported or possessed. But we wanted to make sure to clarify because there's been a name change with the scientific name of the North American elk was service elephus, now it's service canadensis. Red deer saved, uh, stayed service elephus. So we wanted to make sure that remained in there that these animals are not allowed in. and animals that you can't bring in, but you could possess them if you captured them in Wyoming. Uh, these would include wildlife declared as pests, which currently are prairie dogs 
and um, ground squirrels. And then wildlife defined as predatory animals, <clears throat> predaceous birds, Eurasian collared doves, and mute swans are prohibited from importation. And this protects our wildlife resources from disease, competition. Section 16 addresses uh, possession and importation of wildlife, uh, specifically here with subsection three, uh, we included that raptors will need to be uh, inspected, health inspected prior to entry into the state. Currently, uh, a health assessment does not need to be done. Uh, commission received several comments on chapter 10, and a lot of those did deal with the health requirements for raptors, opposing that restriction. Um, Dr. Allen did some uh, surveys of surrounding states, and she did find that uh, most of the states, uh, I think I have a list here, Utah, Idaho, Montana, do require a CVI, the certi Certificate of Vet Inspection, prior to these birds being in the state. Colorado does as well, except uh, residents can move their birds in and out of the state for 30 days without a, a vet inspection. And then, as I said at the beginning, uh, the Chapter 10 health inspection uh, requirements have been revamped. Uh, they've been uh, recategorized. Uh, Dr. Allen and, and previously Dr. Wood did a lot of work on, on updating the health appendix. And Appendix 1 used to just be for cold-blooded, uh, so that's been removed. This deals with Appendix 1 now for the live warm-blooded inspections and procedures. So those are the major changes that, that we're proposing to 10. Um, I know you're going to review 69 here, but uh, President Roberts, I can certainly stand for questions if there's any. Yeah, I could. Question, zebra and water buffalo domesticated? Is that what you said? Yes. I heard that right. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> President Roberts, the, the dom there's domestic zebra and domestic water buffalo. And the, there is a wild buffalo that has a totally different scientific name than the domestic water buffalo. I'm sure I heard that right. <laughs> it seemed right. Maybe. In, in uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. President, in the Wyoming Livestock Board Regulations Chapter 8, I believe, horse, uh, they list definition of horse, and in that definition of horse, they list zebra. Other questions on this? Um, now we'll hear from... Uh, I, I was going to wait until I don't know whether to wait to public comments on all of it, 10 and 69, and wait till do it both at the same time for public comments, or would you like would it be better to do public comments on 10 and then do the public comments on 69? It doesn't. Uh, yeah. I believe there is comment on 10, and 10 I might take a while uh, to go through. I don't know. Um, so what what I want to do is let's do 69. And then we'll I'll call for public comments on 10 and 69, and then we'll do the vote. We'll separate them and vote for that. How's that sound? Perfect. Okay, thanks. I didn't know that. Well, good afternoon, Mr. President, member of the commission, director. Um, it's uh, uh, nice to be up here today. This has been a long project and a lot of work, and we're, uh, I think there are 11 or 12 of us that worked on this at different times. Some of the people that started working on it don't work here anymore. Um, so, you know, you've been working on a project a long time when that happens. But as Mark Okay, so we, as Mark mentioned and Rick mentioned, we began in 2018, there were 11 or 12 of us. Um, we started looking at Chapter 10, and, and one of the long complaints that people have had about Chapter 10 is that it's so long and complicated and hard to understand. And so our, our first goal was, can we make sense of this ourselves? 
<laughs> can we make sense of it for others? Could we organize it differently? We knew early on that we wanted to split the warm and cold blooded apart, but we weren't sure. Um, we knew we wanted the structure in 10 and 69 to be similar if you were using them to the extent they can. So we looked at that structure. We, one of our uh, guiding principles, this, this, stat, this regulation and the series that we're gonna talk about today, one of their primary goals is to protect the resources of the state. So as we looked at those regulations, that was top of our list. Um, try to make it a little more understandable. One of the things we did, Mark mentioned in, in appendix one was all uh, fish health related, really related private hatcheries. We moved that into our private hatchery regulation. Anyway, so we split those into warm and, and cold-blooded chapters. Um, 69 is the new regulation. That's the one I'm talking about. Um, anyway, so 69 is the new one. Um, as we look through these regulations, Mark talked about the tentacles that go that 10 had in a lot of places. We realized there were some sort of direct first order uh, impacts. And then some of the regulations that we worked on impacted other regulations. So that's why we've got eight regulations in a row here for you. And as we looked at those regs, we really wanted to remove redundancy from one chapter to the next. We've had problems in the past where it said something in chapter 10 and we changed it somewhere else and, and created a conflict. So we worked hard not to do that here. So for example, with aquatic invasive species, there's a chapter 62 that lists what the aquatic invasive species are. So in these chapters, all we do is point you to chapter 62. We don't create any lists that might end up being in conflict. So we looked um, at that. When I go like this, it's going to go <laughs> So I'm going to give you just a quick overview of, of chapter 69. You've had, you have a chance to read it. I'm sure you guys read every word of it from front to back, but just in case there's anybody in the audience who didn't, I'll just give you a quick overview um, of, of some of the components. So right away, we talk about what you can, what's illegal to import or possess. Um, and that if you have an illegally possessed animal, you can't release it into the state. Um, we laid out commercial use and for, for cold-blooded wildlife, it, it's a bit challenging. We wanted to protect the sensitive native species. There's some things that we simply don't want to have to get in the business of permitting. For example, if you are importing crayfish to eat them, we don't want to issue a permit every time you're going to have a crawdad boil. So we tried to clarify, you know, if you do import them, what you can and can't do with them, but there are things we didn't want to get into. And then similarly with the pet trade, there are a lot of animals that are, are traded uh, in pet stores and that's just the thing that we didn't wanna get into a redundant permitting. So what you'll see in a little bit are some of the things that we say, you just can't do this in a pet store. For example, uh, African clawed frog, or they're, they're just some critters we don't want pet stores selling, but otherwise we kind of don't wanna have to mess with permitting that because it's um, be a lot of work. There's a section on transportation. So if you're bringing them into the state to stay in the state, if you're trying to transport them all the way through the state, or if you get wildlife within the state and you're transporting them around within the state, we clarified some, tried to organize those things. And then the real guts of the regulation are three sections about permitting requirements. First one says, these are, are, um, are animals that you cannot import or possess in Wyoming. And then the second category of, of these are things you can import them or possess them, but you're going to need to have a permit in order to do that. And then the last one is here's here's things you don't need a permit for. Um, so that's the real um, key part of this regulation. Um, then we we step into inspection requirements. So at this point of the reg, you if you need a regulate if you need a permit, then these are the sort of things that you'll worry about. Um, inspection for invasive species or disease, 
um, things you have to tell us about if you have if you have wildlife that's permitted and they get real sick if you have invasive species if any of them escape you need to notify us we talked about stocking and personal use so we we pointed out right away if you're stocking fish like you do now under chapter 49 go see chapter 49 this chapter doesn't apply but you can't stock um, crayfish or or frogs or turtles or other things like that. So try to describe um, what you can do and point you to the other regulations for stocking. And then here's where I mentioned, if you have a, if you need a permit, here's how you apply the conditions of the permit. If you have a permit, how we can inspect those animals, um, what it takes to renew your permit. If your permit is denied, what the review process is, that's a new piece in all of these regulations to, to spell out if, a, if you are unhappy with the department decision, the steps that are available to you um, to, uh, to appeal that. And then what happens if we revoke a permit? And then finally, what happens if you die or your permit is revoked? What, what happens to the wildlife? So that's the overview of the regulation. Um, so we had public input on this. We all, the well, all eight of these regulations we're talking about uh, were out for public comment in, from you know, April 18th to June 3rd. We accepted comments online. Um, the, the five aquatic regulations, the four existing ones of 49, 50, 51, 53, that we'll talk, Dave will talk about. Um, and then the new regulation 69 that I'm talking about. We had a dozen people tune in on Zoom. We had a couple of people come in person to the office in Cheyenne. Um, really frustrating, Wayne. I'm pushing the forward button and I'd like to go forward. There we go. Um, so we got two public uh, comments online about chapter 69. One comment, uh, one commenter had two things. One of them was a, the appreciation support for the uh, interstate transport provision. And one was a, expressing concern about certificate of veterinary inspection requirements as it relates to hauling fish. And, and that was misunderstood that the CBI, certificate of veterinary inspection requirements don't apply to fish because fish health inspection, you have to have fish health inspection instead. So. Um, that was those. And then another person commented on our definition of a tropical fish. And the full definition is down there on the bottom. And we had added to our prior definition, documented to exceed 24 hours in scientific literature. This person um, comment was the 24 hour provision. You know, didn't like that. Thought really what he thought is we, we care if they don't survive the winter, and that's true, but that's hard to put in a definition. So we just reverted back to the, the, the definition we had before and just say, if it's not documented in the scientific literature. So made a minor change to that one. And that is that. So are there any questions about chapter 69? I was curious about the interstate transportation provision. What's that entail? So if you are hauling both warm and cold-blooded wildlife through the state and you um, come into the state, you need to stop at a port of entry and get a, an interstate transportation permit. And that would, will allow you to transport the fish for to warm and cold-blooded wildlife in terms of the, the permit you have to get at. And then there are some of the health requirements apply and there's some exceptions about things that don't apply if you're going right straight through. That's just to get through the state. Correct. Coming through. Yep. And people transport stuff through the state that we don't allow in the state with some frequency. Right. I say looking at Mark, who issues all this food reviews all Okay, um, what I'll do now is I'll open up the 
comments for the public comment for chapter 10 and uh, 69 both at the same time. So uh, I'm looking at uh, Al Corbett and Brian McCarthy. McCarty? Are they Zoom? Are they going to be coming together or are they separate? Okay. technological issues here um can the commission hear me yeah could you go, could you go ahead now okay thank you i'm hal corbett with the uh, law firm of lonavon riggs here in sheridan i have with me uh brian mccarty brian is the manager of the nx bar ranch uh his family once owned the nx bar and uh, brian is the grandson of alan fordyce who uh who created the nx bar We'd like to comment on, particularly on um, uh, section 26, D7 of, uh, of chapter 10, addressing the NX bar, which is the only uh, legal game farm in the state of Wyoming and uh, likely the only one that will ever exist. Um, if you, uh, if you, care to hear a little bit about the current operation of the NX bar. Uh, I'd be happy to give Brian a minute or two to talk about it. Uh, it's whatever the commission's pleasure is in that regard. Anything you'd need to, any, any information you can give would be very helpful. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Brian, maybe just tell them how it operates today. Well, um, the NX bar is currently owned by uh, the Chase family out of New Mexico. They've had it for the last 20 years. Um, the, our numbers are 1,300 head, and uh, we've reduced that number considerably in the last 10 years. And our goal is to get down below 1,000, 900 head. Um, the, the Chase family does not commercially hunt the NX bar. It's uh, hunted by family, friends, uh, employees. They uh, donate quite a few hunts to the Wounded Warrior uh, Project. They take anywhere from 10 to 20 Wounded Warriors a year. They provide them with facilities and, and transportation, taxidermy. Uh, and then they also donate quite a few hunts locally for education and uh, trying to kind of target youth hunting. Uh, we actually, uh, if we don't meet our quota for the fall, we'll invite locals and uh, let them come out and harvest elk to, to get our quotas every year. Um, they, they, they do know commercially hunting, I would reiterate that again, so it's not a, uh, commercial at all. And the NX bars had a great relationship with the game and fish for uh, as long as I can remember. I've dealt with them, uh, you know, last 40 years uh, and have got along great with them. Uh, right now, Craig Smith and Dustin Shorm are the ones that I uh, communicate with and, and have got along great with them. And we don't import we don't export we have no intentions of uh, and very healthy herd uh, and we're keeping our numbers down to to help keep it that way so our facilities are in great shape uh, we do artificial inseminate a small amount of cows every year to change our bloodline um, the perimeter fence has uh, had an enormous amount of work done on it it's very good shape. We're actually uh, we're going to a fireproof fence now with uh, metal posts, and it's got eight foot high tensile wire around the entire area, thirty four miles of fence. So it's they really put an effort towards keeping the facility in great shape. So, if I might, um, 
I guess here's the request that we are making in uh, section 26 of chapter 10, since about 1992, the, uh, that chapter and uh, the regulations had made reference to 23,000 acres. The annex bar game farm permit is attached to 23,000 acres in Northern Sheridan County. In fact, the currently fenced area is about 22,000 acres, but back in 1992, the ranch requested 23,000 to just provide a cushion. Um, so uh, to cover any eventuality. What we're requesting is that the, in those two references to 25,000 acres be changed to either, uh, 23,000 acres be changed to 25 or 26,000 acres, which would allow an additional 3,000 acres to be included in the game farm permit area. Those 3,000 acres were originally part of the NX bar uh, back in the 1970s. Um, the, they were sold by the ranch uh, in the uh, 1980s with time of financial difficulty for many ranchers, but they were repurchased by the current owners of the ranch. Um, it would, uh, if, if we could change the acres, it would provide 3,000 more acres for uh, the elk to move in. It would be a little lower elevation country for the winter time. And <clears throat> I've provided you with a map in your materials that would, where you can see that the ranch was once consisted, when the permit was first issued, the ranch consisted of 35,000 acres. 10,000 uh, acres to the south of the county road were sold off. 3,000 acres to the east were sold off, but then reacquired by the current owners. Um, I would uh, argue that it's within the power of the commission to do this because the entire 35,000 acre annex bar was grandfathered um, when private ownership of wildlife was outlawed by the legislature back in 1975. The, um, the regulation chapter 10 was modified in 1992 to clarify two points. Number one, that the permit would transfer with the land. Permit was the primary reason for that. And that allowed the family to sell the ranch to an owner, a different owner and have the permit transfer. Um, so that would be our request to the commission that the two references to the acreages in section 26 of chapter 10 be changed to allow this 3000 acres that was once part of the ranch to be brought back into the game farm permit area. And if that happens, then the ranch would construct a new metal elk proof fence uh, as Brian described, around the, um, the additional 3,000 acres. Uh, obviously, elk would not be turned into that pasture until the fence was constructed. Um, but that's our request, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Yep. I, have, I have a question real quick. Um, I, I noticed on the uh, 10,000 acre, what's the status of the 10,000 acre parcel that was sold along with the 3,000? The 10,000 acres is owned by a different family and has not come back into the ownership of the uh, of the NX bar. So that's not part of the equation today. It's a cattle ranch owned by the Dow family. So, so what would preclude uh, the current ranch to purchase that back and want to expand also on the original term of agreement for uh, the animals there? Well, I don't think, uh, Commissioner, I don't think anything would preclude that, but I do know the Dow family, and I think I can tell you that it is not for sale and it's not likely to be for sale. Um, any questions? Mr. President? Sure, Doobie. So, Mr. Corbett, you're, you're saying that these 3,000 acres um, didn't change its status once it sold off originally. Um, I, I part, of our problem, part, of, part of our problem is that whether it's legally, whether when that was sale was, was done, whether it was basically taken off the books. Well, I guess my argument would be that um, 
the legislation uh, that, that prohibited the private ownership of wildlife made exception for the existing game farm in Wyoming. And the only one was the NX bar. And it was 35,000 acres at that time. Um, so now that the, uh, now that the 3,000 acres comes back, has come back into common ownership with the 22,000 currently under the permit, I would argue that the legislation uh, and, uh, would authorize the additional 3,000 acres to be included within the permit. I guess what I'm still hung up is about the 10,000 acres. Uh, it seems like to me you're putting them, I, I don't know how you would, you could separate the 3,000 with the 10,000 coming back, even though it's a different, it, it's a different family, who knows the future? And would it set precedence with the 3,000 to come back at the 10,000 later on at a, a future years? Well, I guess uh, you, you might have a point there. Um, we're not requesting the 10,000. And frankly, I don't think that um, the current owners of the NX bar will ever be able to acquire the 10,000. But Because uh, um, you, you mentioned the 35,000 and the 10,000 is part of the, the you know, the 10,000 is part of the 35,000. Correct. I don't know if we we blocked. Mr. President. Um, it should be. Oh. Um, can we can we authorize a chapter 10 and chapter 69 uh, as it currently stands? Because this isn't, the, and then we need a lot more information from our people on whether we can legally do it or not um, before we can make that decision today. And I, I think, can we separate the two or um, or do we? I mean, do we have to resolve this issue, issue before we pass the chapter 10 or is it a separate? I guess that's my point. No, you do not. So you do, you do not need to, you can pass chapter 10 without making this change. If you need to gather more information prior to making a final decision on the request from NX bar. If I might, uh, I guess that's, I'm not necessarily for or against. I, I just don't know what we legally can and cannot do. And before I could make a decision on that, I think we'd have to get some input from our AG's office or whatever as to what we are allowed to do and not to do. Uh, commissioners, I would uh, certainly, if, if, you, if that's the way you wish to go, I would certainly extend, a, a Brian would extend an invitation for commission uh, people, staff people, uh, anyone to come and tour the NX bar. We'll show them the area, we'll show them the elk fence, the facilities, the uh, 3,000 additional acres. Uh, if that would be helpful to the commission's determination, we'd certainly be willing to do that. Is that what other animals are on the ranch? Brian? Uh, there's 19, 19 head of buffalo, and then of course the elk, or the deer and the antelope along with the state, we do have mule deer and antelope. There's no cattle, uh, and then of course the elk. I'm having a hard time hearing. Uh, could you speak a little bit in? I, I was just wondering about the exotics that you have on there. Uh, what Brian said was there are some uh, 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 antelope and deer within the uh, fences. Those, of course, are state owned wildlife, not privately owned. There are how many buffalo? 19. 19 buffalo. And then, you know, coyotes, uh, you know, regular wildlife that can get through or under the fence. But there's no exotics then? No exotics and no cattle. I know it's the original permit, a lot of four exotics in there. What uh, happened there? Uh, that is correct. Exotics were originally permitted and there were some uh, there at the very beginning when Alan Fordyce ran it. There haven't been exotics on the ranch for 40 years, 40 years, 40 years. And, but there, it's still in the contract that you could put them there if you would like, isn't it? I haven't, I haven't actually thought about that. Um, I don't know what the answer is. 
I just noticed that, that on the 2000 or the 1974 agreement that uh, they had that it had something listed, but maybe you can answer that question for me. Roberts, the uh, chapter 10, it just allows, just permits through a collection of elk. It's, there'd be no exotics. That would have to come through another request, go through a review process, but they're just elk on that game farm. Okay. Mr. President, to, to me, it's not a question of, uh, you know, uh, the Game and Fish officials at work, Craig Smith and others, they, they you know, the NX Bar is doing a fine job and, and doing all the requirements, whatever. To me, that's not an issue. To me, is whether we legally have the authority to do so or not. And that I do not know. You know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Corbett says that he thinks that we do, which is fine. Um, but I, I guess I would like to find from the AG's office whether we do or not. Yeah, Mr. President, we're the, the department's glad to go and have some discussions with our attorneys at the AG's office and come back to you. We can even come back as soon as the next meeting and provide some additional information on legal authority. Yeah, I, I would just hate to vote on something not knowing whether we had the legal authority to do so or not. It's a good idea. And I guess I'm hung up a little bit on the the exotics, the original contract, and the 10,000 acres that would be uh, part of it to it. That's the kind of questions that I want answered before that I would entertain anything for it. Because elk are one thing, exotics are another. So to me, but um, there's. Uh, um, well, I guess, I guess I would suggest. I don't know if it's a formal. I would suggest that we table. Uh, this issue until we get an AG's opinion or a legal opinion from the department. And in the meantime, pass chapter 10 and chapter 69. If, okay. and, and I would certainly invite uh, us. Uh, Thank you. Um, then move on. Any other thing you'd like to add? Discuss this with me. Be happy to talk to them about it. I appreciate that. Um, uh, move on to, if nobody has any more comments, we'll move on to the next comment. And uh, from uh, Paul, you know, forgive you, but you'll have to help me with your last name. Miss, yeah. Good afternoon. What, what's that? We can't hear anything because of an echo. Can we fix that or something? It'll probably be gone when this is off. No, it's the Is it? I know it's. Hello. Very hello, hard to hear hello, down here. Hello. Testing one, two, three. That's good. Right, very good. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you, President Roberts, Commissioners, Director Nesvik, and uh, staff of the commission. I'm Paul Zajak. I'm the Executive Director for the National Aquaculture Association. We were one of the groups that commented on chapter 51 and 69, and I'm gonna to comment to 69 at this point. So um, this is gonna be an unusual comment, I think, we really wanted to extend as an association our appreciation to your leadership and staff and fisheries for how they responded to our comments, the generosity and courtesy they extended to us working with rules. So uh, my association represents fish and shellfish farmers all across the country. We deal primarily with federal agencies and sometimes with states, not as often, but mostly federally oriented. We're the regulated public, so we deal with a lot of regulations. There's about 20 congressional acts and nine federal agencies that regulate aquaculture in the US. And I have to tell you, it's been a pleasure to work with this agency. And we wanted to communicate that to you. Our concern with this particular chapter was in stopping fish trucks that are moving in interstate commerce what would that inspection entail and would it stress fish? Would it cause a fish health issue? And your staff has assured us that it won't. And we're hoping to work with them in the future as they develop the procedures that they're gonna to need to put into place for their inspectors to ensure that doesn't happen. We ship fish all across the United States as bait, as game fish, for different to stock AAA grass carp for weed control. 
So shipping is a big stress factor for fish. And uh, we really would like to see this to be as smooth a an inspection process as possible. And we've gotten that assurance from staff and we really appreciate it. So thank you. And, and where are you located out of? I'm actually in Tallahassee, Florida. Oh, it's nice of you to come. Well, it's <laughs> a beautiful state. I'm glad I came. Um, it's just an administrative office. I have a 22 member board of directors from Maine to California to Colorado to Washington State, Florida, Mississippi, throughout the country, really, where there's any significant amount of fish farming or shellfish farming. Well, 22 headaches. Um, yeah. I appreciate you. That, that may, your, may your staff feel better. You know, I have 22 bosses. Um, <laughs> this particular regulation was reviewed by an aquatic animal health committee and an aquatic nuisance and non-indigenous species committee. So we work through committees that are composed of farmers that are subject matter experts in this area. So I'm, I sort of connect the dots, make sure the paperwork gets done and appear to groups like yourself, but I'm, I'm not the guy. There's, there's quite a few people behind me that do all the work and I'm, I'm humbled and, and very privileged to work for them. And I've offered to your staff, I offer to the commission, if you ever have questions about aquaculture, no matter what it is, we would be happy to come back and present or answer questions directly. Hopefully you have my contact information and I'll be back in a minute on 69. So. Okay. Well, uh, Thanks. appreciate that. Thank you. Jack. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any more public comment on uh, chapter 10 and chapter 69? Any more? And I think, uh, well, do is, We'll move to, uh, you'd like to move to um, um, go to approve chapter 10 as written now, and then we can table the, uh, the ranch topic later. How do you know? <coughs> President Roberts, I just wanted to, to mention that we're, if you do approve, we're requesting effective date of January 1. 2023 just that'll that won't uh affect current permit holders that this change would uh oh. come into place and give us time to to get our databases running and good to go on january 1. okay um i'll entertain motions to approve chapter 10 in uh it's going to effect in january one um Without the the part, and we're going to table the 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 XZ Ranch, uh, and um, and we'll address that as we get more information and we get more up to stuff in it, and uh, and we'll revise if we need to. Uh, but right now, we're just going to uh, vote on whether to accept Chapter Ten as written. Uh, do I hear any motion? So moved. Uh, Commissioner Doobie has moved it. Second. <laughs> Commissioner Lundvall has seconded it. And uh, any discussion? No discussion. Those all in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, chapter Chapter 10 is wrong. Okay, Mr. President, just as a matter, just want to make sure everybody's clear. So if we'll bring information back to the commission and the commission will have to provide the department direction at that time. If, if they want us to move forward with updating chapter 10, because we, we have to, we haven't taken that through public comment. We haven't gone through the administrative procedures act regarding that change to chapter 10. So it's, it's just a matter of understanding in September, we could bring you some information. You can decide whether you want us to move forward with that change or not, but it'll have to go through the, the process that we just went through with chapter 10 it would just be a one change that we would be going out and, and requesting public comment on and going through the process for yes that's that's i think that's the intention of the commission there is that correct that's correct okay um so then let's move on to chapter 69 uh I, do i have a motion to approve chapter 69 you want to take comment first or should we discuss oh it? yeah i'll take comment first well, no, I'll do motions, then I'll do comments. 
<laughs> I move I'll to. Do, I'll do motions and then I'll do. We'll talk about it. Okay, I move to approve chapter 69. It's motion to approve by Commissioner Brokoff, seconded by Commissioner Brokoff. I'll second. Okay, and uh, now we'll take discussion on 69. Any discussion? We're just going to do the commission. Yeah, we did them both. So, so, um, and this will be the discussion on chapter 10 and 69 to, well, no, just chapter 69, excuse me, 69. Um, anybody? Okay. Those all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next will be presenter number nine. I'll take. Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesbick. As uh, Rick mentioned, there are a lot of tentacles in chapter 10 and when we crack that open, it leads to a lot of different places. And so one of the chapters that had to be opened in order to correct a lot of references to, to chapter 10 was our private fish hatchery, reg right? chapter 51. This is a regulation that, that not only regulates the in-state hatcheries in Wyoming, of, of which we have three hatchery owners, but it regulates out-of-state hatcheries that are importing into the state. And we currently, this year, have three of those hatcheries in Nebraska, three in South Dakota, two in Arkansas, and one in Utah that import fish into Wyoming. And I would just note that the Wyoming facilities uh, produce trout, uh, the supply for the private sector of warm and cool water species comes from these update facilities that, that import fish into Wyoming. So I'm gonna start by just trying to give a relatively quick review. This is a fairly long chapter now of uh, the changes that were made, but I'm gonna spend more time on how, on the extensive public comment we received and our responses to those changes. But the first thing we did was delete the references to chapter 10, which is now a warm blooded wildlife chapter and incorporate a lot of references to chapter 69. But because we were opening it up, um, there was a lot of opportunity to try to simplify this regulation and, and to eliminate redundancies. So a lot of effort went into providing appropriate references to other regulations and statutes and to try to try to make things understandable. One of the most substantive changes was to take all of the fish health content that used to be in chapter 10 and the chapter 10 appendices and move it into chapter 51 because it really is all about health inspections at private hatcheries. And then the other thing we did was uh, really started thinking about our aquatic invasive species obligations as they extend beyond watercraft. We have uh, a lot of uh, facilities from a lot of different states bringing fish into Wyoming. And we know from our own experience with our state and federal partners that there are aquatic invasive species issues in hatcheries. And we've been unable, for instance, to get largemouth bass for a number of years because we can't find a, a state partner that has a, a clean source that doesn't have an AIS issue. So we know there are going to be some instances of uh, AIS in private hatcheries as well. So uh, a major impetus for the revision was to try to ensure that these private hatcheries were clean and free of AIS. One of the requirements was that these inspections be conducted in a certain time frame, from the middle of June to the middle of October. Uh, that's a time frame when Wyoming's designated AIS are likely to be most detectable. Um, burrowing crayfish, for example, wouldn't be detectable in the, in the winter months. We defined an aquatic invasive species hatchery inspector uh, with a, a clear definition of the people that have the qualifications to conduct these inspections. To date, we oftentimes get an aquatic invasive species inspection that's submitted by, say, a large animal veterinarian or something. And so we wanted to, to change that. 
And we also propose that we use environmental DNA as a screening tool. It's a tool that you all are probably familiar with that was used with water supplies around the state when we had the moss ball issue last year uh, and the year prior with uh, the zebra and quagga mussels coming in with those things from Ukraine. We also have been dealing with a lot of relatively unique operations in the last few years, and it seems to be growing each year. These are things like ornamental fish hatcheries, hatcheries that produce aquarium fish, uh, mollusk and crustacean aquaculture. We dealt with a, a request a few years ago where a, a fellow in Gillette wanted to raise lobster-sized crayfish from Australia. Um, hobby fish farms, like small backyard operations that are just for personal use. And then aquaponics is ever growing in popularity where people are growing edible plants and fish in the same controlled environment. And we've always been trying to interpret how our regulations apply to those sorts of operations and they didn't apply well. Um, so we tried to incorporate appropriate regulations. We've also been operating uh, essentially the concept that in order for a hatchery to do business in Wyoming or to import fish into Wyoming, they have to have fish health inspections, they have to be licensed. Recently, they have to have pass AIS inspections. Um, and we tried to kind of solidify that concept in this new regulation by, by calling that a, a term, a department approved private fish hatchery. So, any hatchery can go out and buy a license on January 1 and get licensed in the state of Wyoming if they meet certain requirements in their design, but that really doesn't afford them the ability to do business in Wyoming until they become a department approved private fish hatchery that's met our licensing requirements, which really, like I say, boils down to a hatchery license and past health and AIS inspections. And then the chief of fisheries must designate them as such before they can stock, sell, transfer, or receive fish. The AIS section of the regulation was modeled after the existing fish health section that was in chapter 10. And it breaks pathogens in chapter, it did break pathogens in chapter 10 into different categories based on their <clears throat> severity of their threat. And we did the same thing with AIS. We broke the, uh, the scariest critters into the emergency prohibited category. Those are zebra and quagga mussels. And then the next category is prohibited AIS. Those are, those are designated species that are not yet in the state of Wyoming, uh, like Eurasian water milfoil, um, and rusty crayfish, which just showed up recently in the Laramie River. And then the regulated AIS are things that are already here in the state and the focus is more on, on containment that they not be moved around further. In sections eight and nine of the regulation, we explained how the chief of fisheries would <coughs> prescribe an action should a pathogen or an AIS be found at a hatchery and we called that a reasonable action. And it would be prescribed by the chief of fisheries based on, on the threat level of the pathogen or the AIS that was detected. We also added the Department Decision Appeals process that Dirk mentioned that's been in chapters 10 and 33 already, but we felt it's particularly important for this chapter, which unlike a lot of department regulations, regulates private business extensively and their ability to, to uh, have a livelihood. So this gives them the opportunity to resolve a grievance without having to go to a contested case here. So public outreach and comment for this chapter really started over a year ago when we sent a letter to all of the hatcheries that had been licensed to, uh, that had been approved to do business in Wyoming over the last five years and tried to summarize where we were headed with the most substantive changes that we knew we would be proposing. And, uh, it was really a little bit surprising and that we didn't hear anything. And uh, we started to wonder if the letters really had gone anywhere. And then within some period of time, started hearing from colleagues in other states saying, what are you doing over there? We're hearing from hatcheries and we're hearing from the National Aquaculture Association and our own people were getting phone calls about uh, 
you're going to try it. Or we're trying to shut down the private sector with our AIS regulations. And so at least we knew we had been heard. Um, we went out to public comment, as Dirk mentioned, the same meeting this last May. Um, I'll just mention that of those 14 attendees, uh, either Zoom or in person, they represented uh, 10 different hatcheries, eight of them out of state. So we had some really good comments at that meeting, but then we received really extensive comments from the National Aquaculture Association and uh, a private ornamental hatchery up in Sheridan, along with a few others. So for the remainder of my presentation here, I'm going to focus on what I think are the most substantive comments we received and how we responded to them. And uh, if you see a green check mark or green text here, it means we we tried to accommodate that comment. We thought they had a good point. Uh, if you see a, a red X, it's something that we didn't think we could improve upon with the existing draft. But the first comment was uh, the backyard ponds, the private individual wants to rear tilapia in a backyard pond. We ought to be exempted from all other requirements of this regulation because we had provided that sort of exemption for someone with an aquaponics operation. So if they were rearing plants and animals in a pond, they were exempt from everything, but if they didn't have the plants, they weren't. Um, so that was a, a reasonable point. We added a definition of a hobby fish farm and provided them the same exemptions that we were to those with aquaponics operations. So if they're rearing marine fish, tropical fish, goldfish, or koi, they would not need a private fish hatchery license or have to meet any of these requirements that we're talking about today. How, how, big, how many, uh, on a, what's considered hobby? How many fish hobby? Uh, it's not defined by number. The definition here is a small scale operation. The big difference with a hatchery is that it's not connected to the waters of the state, either with its water supply or its discharge. So it's isolated. So we don't have those AIS or health concerns and that they're rearing fish, marine, generally tilapia, that if they were to escape, could not survive a Wyoming winter. They're a tropical species that can't survive below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The next thing, the next comment we had was regarding the definition of an aquatic animal health inspector. And that definition currently is underlined there. It's not been changed. It's the regulation that we, the definition that we pulled over from chapter 10. But the definition means that uh, it requires that these fish health inspections are conducted by someone who's met the standards established by the board of certification of the Fish Health Section of the American Fishery Society. And we decided to, that that had served us well for a lot of years and that it probably wasn't necessary to change that definition. The next comment we had was related to an ornamental fish hatchery. Um, and on the application requirements, it says that an ornamental, that any fish hatchery has to list all of the species that they intend to raise and the sources, the locations where those come from which makes a whole lot of sense if you're talking about trout in a hatchery in Cody, but the uh, operator of this operation pointed out, you know, he gets fish from all over the world. He doesn't know what species he's gonna get every year. And he, it would be very difficult, if not impossible to list every species and source when they're coming from the former Soviet Union and Taiwan and every place else. So we, we made an exemption, we added an exemption that we said, where the department could exempt private fish hatcheries that are licensed solely for ornamental fish from those specific application requirements. Another comment was that a language in section 3B that's unchanged from the past chapter requires that if there's parts of a hatchery that are more than a quarter mile apart or that lack a common affluent, so they have to be licensed to separate facilities. And the comment was really this would apply to a whole lot of hatcheries all over the country and uh, could really be unnecessary and problematic. Um, it is unchanged. We do have two hatcheries in Wyoming that have multiple licenses because they are spread out or lack of common effluent. And it, it, this would only apply to facilities that are licensed in the state of Wyoming. And here, you know, it has not 
been a problem at all. So we chose not to make a change to that based on that comment. Another comment objected to language in section 4D that says, um, you know, if, a, if, if an AIS shows up in a watershed, why should it impact our operation if we had nothing to do with it showing up there? Because the regulation says that the chief of fisheries may deny or rescind that hatchery's designation as a department approved private fish hatchery if an AIS is found in the watershed. And uh, we really, we did struggle with that a bit um, in terms of uh, this term watershed, which I'll talk about next. But, you know, it's really a, a risk of doing business as a private hatchery owner if your water supply is a surface water that AIS could show up and establish there. It's one of the reasons we've gone through such extensive biosecurity efforts at our own facilities, but um, it's a, it would be a major concern. But so we decided to retain the flexibility so that the department could, we did say may deny or rescind designation because we want to retain the flexibility. Uh, the department may choose to deal with quagga mussels upstream of a hatchery a lot differently than they would curly pond weed downstream of a hatchery. The other comment on that particular regulation was watersheds undefined. And uh, how do we know what you're talking about when you say uh, if an AIS appears in a watershed? And that is a, that's an issue. Uh, the, could be a small spring creek uh, flowing into the Laramie River that ends up the whole North Platte, that's the whole Missouri but we could not come up with an adequate way to really define that. And again, I felt that it's really necessary to provide the chief of fisheries flexibility to consider that stuff on a case-by-case -case basis because a watershed, when you're talking about dry scented mussels upstream, you might go a long ways upstream and be really worried um, if it's brook stickleback that are are downstream in a pond that's within the watershed, you might not have any concerns at all, but we ended up retaining that language without any ability to come up with a better idea. Another comment objected to requiring hatcheries to conduct surveillance of watersheds for AIS or pathogens, where the language that's underlined there is what the draft reg did say said it shall be a condition of operating as a department approved private hatchery that you notify the chief within 48 hours if you become aware of an AIS or a pathogen at your hatchery or in the watershed. Um, we weren't really requiring anybody to conduct surveillance, but uh, understood the comment that uh, that's pretty unenforceable to say that somebody would have to report if there was an AIS in the watershed. And really our source of information for those sorts of things is our partners and other state conservation agencies and our own information. So we went ahead and struck that requirement that a hatchery report AIS in the watershed. Another comment objected to language that said uh, the chief may deny designation as a department approved hatchery if an AIS has been detected in the last three years. And uh, Said, well, what if I go in and, and treat and I eradicate that in two weeks? Why, why are you concerned about three years? And, and really, our experience with other states that have had problems, uh, a state hatchery in Montana and a state hatchery in Arizona, have treated, they eradicated AIS, thought they were there, had them eradicated, and they reappeared. So again, we use the word may deny to try to deal with these threats on a case-by-case -case basis, but knowing how difficult it can actually be to eradicate AIS or pathogens, we decided to retain that existing language to provide us flexibility to deal with those on a case-by-case -case basis. Another comment said the fish health and AIS inspection requirements of section five are really problematic for an ornamental fish operation. And what they're referring to is an ornamental fish hatchery, at least the one we are going to have in Wyoming. All the fish are in individual tanks. No water goes from one tank to another tank. Um, if you're going to follow our health inspection protocols, you have to 
do lethal sampling of 60 fish from each lot. Um, they probably don't even have 60 fish of each species in, in one of those tanks. So some of their fish are worth $450 a piece and we're not likely to do lethal sampling that would shut them down. So we added a requirement that said that uh, sufficient, what we decided to do was not being able to picture how we would do fish health inspections on dozens of species from all over the globe that we would just require that those hatcheries be constructed in a manner that their effluent has sufficient treatment that a pathogen or an AIS couldn't get out of the facility. We, we added this requirement to the application section 3B that says they have to include sufficient water treatment to ensure that fish pathogens and live parasites, plants and animals are eliminated from all the water discharge. And then in addition to that, we uh, essentially provided some language that said the department shall exempt those hatcheries that are licensed primarily for ornamental fish from the health requirements of the section. But when we thought about AIS, uh, we did not want to exempt them from the AIS inspection. Again, thinking back to the, the moss ball example, um, these things that came in with the aquarium trade, we, we will figure out appropriate protocols for conducting AIS inspections that it's relatively unique catchery. So we edited some language there that's in quotes at the bottom that said that we may exempt catcheries licensed primarily for ornamental fish or solely for bait fish from specific AIS inspection requirements, meaning we will, we will have alternate AIS inspection requirements for those facilities. Another common objective to language in section five that said, um, hatcheries have to produce the past three years of records of AIS and health inspection requirements upon to the department. Um, essentially said, well, you are the ones doing those inspections and, and you should have those records. Why should the uh, hatchery have to produce them? We essentially uh, feel like that, that wasn't really the intent. Hatcheries are already required to produce uh, production records for three years. I don't think it would be problematic if they had to provide the health and AIS inspections as well. But the bigger problem is essentially a, an out-of-state hatchery that may be applying to import to Wyoming for the first time. And we want to see a three-year history that they've been disease and AIS free before we authorize them to import into the state. So we didn't make any changes there either. Um, the National Aquaculture Association, soon after our letter went out in July of 2021, contacted us expressing really, really pretty extreme concern about our proposal to use environmental DNA as a screening tool at hatcheries. Um, they provided a pretty extensive review of some of the literature that's out there where, where DNA, eDNA has been a problem. Uh, we have some of our own experiences where it's not concrete. Uh, it means that the DNA for an animal is present. It doesn't mean the animal's present. There can be cross-contamination issues when you're actually doing the sampling. There can be cross-contamination issues in a laboratory. You can get different results from different laboratories. Uh, our intent was that this just be a screening tool. So if we had a positive hit with eDNA, we would have to go back and confirm the animal was present. Uh, that really did not uh, assuage any concerns of the NAAs. Their, their concern is that even a positive finding with eDNA could really, I'm paraphrasing, the, uh, tarnish the reputation of a hatchery to where their, their, their product might, they may lose customers, they may lose business, and it may have a false positive. In the end, we decided we were just beginning to use eDNA ourselves. We bought some detectors that are we used on walleye that were shipped from North Dakota recently. Uh, we thought it best to use it in our own facilities and those of our state and federal partners. We had some labs identified that were giving us consistent results before applying the tool to the private sector. We deleted that language. 
Another objection that we heard from multiple commenters was that we we're going to require the private sector to pay for AIS laboratory analyses. We haven't been requiring that lately. We have federal grants that pay for those analyses, but we thought if they ever go away, um, that should be a cost that's fitted by the private sector. Um, the comments were essentially, how much is that going to be? And what's it going to cost? It's really hard to do a business if you can't anticipate what your expenses are going to be. So we decided that for the foreseeable future, we have no concerns about continuing to have these grants and to continue to pay those costs. So we went ahead and altered the language so that the department would continue to pay for those expenses for the time being. Another comment objected to fish hatcheries being charged with the surveillance for unidentified pathogens where we had said any diseases or pathogens are, are not listed as emergency prohibited, prohibited, regulated, but which are known to be present or detected during inspections have to be reported to the department. Um, we weren't really requiring any additional surveillance. We have just seen multiple fish hatchery health inspection reports where the inspecting laboratory notes something that was present that may not be a pathogen of concern, but they found gill lice or something. And what we want is that those things be passed on to us. So we tried to clarify that by just altering the language a little bit to say that any diseases or pathogens not listed, but which are detected during your routine fish health inspections be reported. When you're doing disease or AIS testing, some of the protocols that are used are not completely conclusive. You get a positive test, but in order to determine that the pathogen or AIS is there requires some follow-up confirmatory sampling. And uh, one of the regulations requires that if we have a positive finding for an AIS or a pathogen, no fish can be moved around the facility. They can't can't be moved on the facility, off the facility, and other things can't come in until confirmatory sampling is completed. That's an interruption for their private business, and they wanted to try to limit that interruption to seven days. Um, we talked about that, but just did, really didn't think that was prudent. That we have to have our fish pathologist may have to travel to Cody to do confirmatory sampling. You may have to start bacterial cultures ahead of time to complete testing and, and just not completely realistic that that could always be done in seven days. So although we understand that concern and we would try to be quick, uh, we didn't make any changes to that regulation. Another regulation requires that those emergency prohibited AIS, zebra and fog muscles, they're found at a hatchery. You immediately have to destroy all of the fish on the facility you have to completely decontaminate it. I mean, it's a big hit. Um, it would be very, very costly for a private hatchery. And the comment from an ornamental fish hatchery was, why would you destroy all of my fish if they're not even on a common water supply? The no tank can infect another tank and they come from different parts of the world. That was in a reasonable comment we tried to address where we said that we added a subsection to that regulation to ensure that the destruction of fish in those facilities would be limited to the ones that were in the infected water supply. The same hatchery commented on our transportation requirements, which are quite extensive, they include where the water has to come from in the tank, in the tank of fish. Uh, only the authorized species on the application can be imported and and there are multiple references to the stocking location. So this just doesn't apply to me in a dealing in aquarium fish. Their fish are flown into DIA. They drive down, pick them up in a van and haul them back to Sheridan. And um, it was a reasonable point. So we exempted those hatcheries from all of the transportation requirements of the regulation with the exception that if they find an AIS is present, they have to report it to us. Another comment on a mandatory reporting requirement that you see down at the bottom of that slide is that if the 
Well, that's not actually the mandatory reporting requirement. The, the reporting requirement that if you know an AIS is present, you got to tell us um, that that's largely unenforceable. And uh, the part of that statement contradicts another part of the regulation. But you know, I, I would contend that the mandatory reporting requirement is is not unlike our AIS statute, which is right there, that the person who knows that an unreported AIS is present at a specific location in the state has to report it immediately. And we were essentially saying the same thing here, that any person transporting fish shall notify us immediately if the shipment is found to contain an AIS. Um, I think the source of confusion was that we went on to say that no water, fish, plants, or other organisms can leave the tank until final disposition is determined by the department. And I, I think disposition is being interpreted as a, a destination. Um, so we tried to clarify that. And what we're really talking about is the course of action that's defined in regulation. That should something be found, the chief of fisheries would be contacted and he would determine if that load was turning around and going back to North Dakota, if everything had to be destroyed right there, if they'd be passed on through the state, that it would be dealt with in a case-by-case -case basis. Another comment, I, I believe this one was also from the NAA, was that uh, uh, the fish health inspection procedures are referenced in the appendix to this regulation as standard operating procedures that we have that we'll share with you. And it doesn't go into great detail about where those come from, but the comment was essentially why not recognize superior equipment procedures and a few examples were provided. Um, but really, uh, you know, our fish health lab, as you know, is one of the premier labs in the country and they go through really strict accreditation process where each of the tests has to be accredited and every four years. And I think upon any further investigation, they would see that our, our standards are equivalent. The standard operating procedures that they're gonna see are, are equivalent um, or superior to the alternatives that were provided. And they're, they're blue book type standards that are very, very commonplace in, in the industry. I think that's, that's really everything I have. Um, there were a lot of comments from really a few individuals for this regulation, but we, we did our best to try to balance the uh, concerns in the private sector with the need to protect the, the state from AIS um, that might be in private fish hatcheries. So and stand for any questions. If you have. What's the enforcement? What's the What's the penalty for a misdemeanor or what did we have it, what it's under as far as if they don't comply? Um, is it, what's the, what's the penalty for it? Is what, just under the. Yeah, it's a general, it doesn't have a specific, its own um, violation code that I'm aware of. It's just violation of commission regulation. And I don't, remember if it's a high or low misdemeanor and what the penalties are. Can you help me with that, Rick or Dan? So if they don't report the AIS or whatever, then- It's a misdemeanor. A misdemeanor, 756 months or something kind of thing. Then they don't, okay. Then it's a, yeah, it's self-reporting, but yeah. Yeah, the, um, President Robert, members of the commission, Director Neswick, I, I am not familiar with the penalties. I know Director Neswick, the, the, the significant ramification for the private in-state hatchery would be the immediate loss of that department approved status. So they would not be able to sell remove fish. So even though they have a license, they would be done doing business. We could also move to revoke that license if we wanted to. If they were in an out-of-state hatchery, we would revoke their importation permit and they'd no longer be doing, that would be the extent of our, our footing there would be just no longer allowing them to import into Wyoming. Questions? Questions? Um, uh, Mr. Bajak, you wanted to comment? <laughs> Mr. President, I really appreciate it again to appear before you. 
Um, I think relative to all the comments we made, uh, I'd like to just focus on the fish health inspector. We recommended that an accredited a USDA accredited veterinarian be included under that definition. And it didn't occur to us at the time, so my apologies to staff and to you for not further explaining why we made that recommendation. We're currently working with USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service to create a comprehensive aquaculture health program standards that would be applied at the farm level. And this is a voluntary program, non-regulatory, but once a farm enters into that program, they come under the purview of, of APHIS, of the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And it has five components. There's an animal health uh, team created with either a fish health pathologist or an accredited vet in that team. And then that team develops a biosecurity plan for the farm. And the biosecurity plan is really a, a broad-based risk assessment the risk assessment of those health risks to the farm where it's located, but also to where the markets that farm would go to. So they would be managing the farm to, to prevent or mitigate any risks to the farm, but also to the markets where they would be going. There would be surveillance, reporting, and response as part of that overall plan for the farm. So this is a very integrated effort and it kind of matches and thinking about it outside the box, what your agency is trying to accomplish. That farms that under our CAPS program that would be exporting to Wyoming would be trying to meet the Wyoming requirements by actively managing the farm to prevent those risks to the farm and to the products they would ship. So uh, it would be a long-term effort, but we would appreciate like to see CAPS, this Comprehensive Aquaculture Health Program Standards, recognized by the state to benefit both the state's objectives and ours. So that's been kind of the long-term plan. We're now approaching APHIS about putting this into regulations, similar to programs that some of Wyomians might be familiar with, like the National Poultry Improvement Plan, the Scrapie Plan, or a, a new pork plan to have animal health for those livestock, agricultural livestock. Uh, so it's, it's a minor change that I would like you, that we would appreciate that you consider is to include an accredited vet as an aquatic animal health inspector. Thinking into the future that if CAPS comes about, and we believe it will, we've been working for it for quite some time, then everyone benefits, both the farm and the state and the people that are receiving our live products. Do you think you could send me some information on that? Absolutely, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, probably send it to, I don't uh, Just send it to the commission. It'll get commission? to me. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. President Roberts, members of Commission Director Nesbitt, uh, I think Paul makes a a good point there with this accredited veterinarian, um, USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture approved veterinarian. Uh, our in-state hatcheries are all inspected by our fish pathologist, Carl Smith. And uh, I don't believe that any change is necessary for an in-state hatchery since we conduct those inspections, but we, uh, we don't, although this language that Paul's commenting on doesn't, is not changed from chapter 10, our intent isn't really to regulate who collects the samples, that we are that strictly regulate who collects the samples at an out-of-state hatchery. And I think the addition of a accredited USDA veterinarian for, for an out-of-state hatchery is probably a very good suggestion that we could incorporate in a few minutes in some language um, with a pretty simple change before the regulations were approved. But I, I do think it would probably be an improvement to the regulations we propose. And we could have that in prior to the January. I think we could have it within uh, about 30 minutes here. 
Yeah. That'd be good. And then we'll, yeah, let's do that. Like, okay. Uh, at this time, I want to take a break for everybody. Everybody seems so. If we take a 15 minute break, we'll come back and we'll address this again. Thank you. We'll go right from where you started, Joe. Right, right from where you're ending, you might say. Okay, let's go back in and to uh, the break over, and we're going to go to uh, chapter 49, and then we are going to come back to 51 to have comment, the last comment on it, and uh, and discussion. But in the interim, we're going to go 49 and proceed all the way through 49 at this point. So thank you. Okay, the, the next chapter that was opened, uh, the attempt to revise chapters 10 and, and 69 was chapter 49. That uh, used to be private fish stocking because we incorporated some regulations about stocking amphibians and mollusks and crustaceans. The title was changed to private stocking of cold-blooded wildlife. Um, just to give some context, I, I, the the private fish hatcheries that I that I listed in the discussion about chapter 51 from out of state and in state stock on average about 450 different stockings in Wyoming's on private lands each year. So this is a it's a big deal. There are a lot of fish from a lot of places going to a lot of places around the state of Wyoming. And this regulation is more on the private individuals and it's regulating what they have to do to get fish from a private fish hatchery to stock on their property. Uh, I'll do the same thing I did with the last regulation and give a description of the changes and then the, how we responded to public comment. But we, as I mentioned, we changed the title first. Then there were a lot of, uh, we, we added a lot of references and we did this with all of the chapters the committee worked on. There's so many interrelated tentacles between so many of our regulations that unless you know that there's an applicable statement off in statute somewhere or off in another chapter, uh, you're just left swimming to try to, you'd have to read all of our regulations to understand them all. So wherever we could, we provided applicable references to chapter 69, for instance, uh, in chapter 49, there's eight different references to chapter 69, and there's six different references to chapter 51, and we added multiple references to applicable statutes, and we really help, uh, hope that that'll help simplify interpretation of the regs, um, but that was one of the first changes we made. And one of the most substantive changes was to convey our commission policy 7C on, on fish stocking in the private fish stocking regulation. And I don't know how many of you are aware of that policy, but it essentially says that a wild fish management philosophy has been adopted for all streams that have the potential to support satisfactory wild trout populations. And that really just means, that, you know, we stock a lot of tailwaters across the state. Um, a lot of fish go into altered habitats. But when a stream has the potential to, it's not heavily altered, it has, it's supporting wild trout. There's a, a, a large body of scientific literature supporting the fact that it's very difficult to boost that standing stock in that stream with stocking for the long term because there's a certain carrying capacity there already. So we, we wanted to convey that policy and regulation. And we did that by editing section four in the application where we had previously had some more nebulous language about the department's authority to deny an application to stock fish. But we wanted to be more clear and we said that we could deny the application if it's to stock game fish in a stream that's been documented by the department to support naturally reproducing game fish populations or 
The department determines that the species requested may threaten native species due to predation, hybridization, or competition, or otherwise conflict with department management goals for the drainage. So just wanted to clarify that that authority exists and put it into regulation. Ornamental ponds are, are growing in popularity throughout the state, particularly in places like, like Star Valley. They're backyard landscape features that people like to put goldfish and koi in. They're defined as not being connected to the waters of the state. So if there is a, a backyard pond that flows into something, whether it's an irrigation ditch or a stream, it, it wouldn't meet this definition of an ornamental pond. But we tried to clarify our ornamental pond regulations throughout the chapter because they, they were not very clear in the past. And we prohibited the stocking of amphibians, reptiles, mollusks, or crustaceans into these ponds because those are all animals that could get up, crawl up, walk away. Um, we made an exception for turtles, which are quite popular in ornamental ponds, if the pond is constructed in a manner to contain the turtle. You know, the, the backyard is fenced and such so that they can't escape. Um, and we exempted people that are stocking marine fish, tropical fish, goldfish, or koi from needing a private fish stocking authorization for these small ponds. So as long as they're stocking saltwater fish, tropical fish, goldfish, or koi, this regulation would not apply to them. And again, we use this concept I described for Chapter 51 of the Department Approved Hatchery throughout the regulation. And those are current authorized commercial hatcheries we list on our website that would, if this regulation were in effect today, those would be considered our department approved private fish hatcheries that private landowners could get their fish from. In section six, we edited uh, the section on types of fish stocking. And there's a sec subsection in there on game fish stocking that references three defined terms from chapter 51, cold water fish species, cool water fish species, and warm water. And in definition, each of those terms has a list of species. And I just wanted to point out that we specifically excluded some species from those lists. We didn't include walleye, we didn't include yellow perch, and we didn't include smallmouth bass. So um, black crappie and catfish shown on the slides there, they would they would be okay for stocking in private waters, but we didn't want to allow private landowners to stock walleye, yellow perch, and smallmouth bass. We have multiple examples you're probably aware of around the state where we're currently trying to eradicate those species. They, they tend to be moved around by people illegally. They tend to establish and they tend to not uh, be a good thing for the, the sport fisheries we're trying to manage in different waters around the state. We also edited the section on type of fish stocking, um, the subsection on vegetation control, which is deals with grass carp stocking. And grass carp are an Asian carp that eat primarily aquatic vegetation and they're used throughout the country to try to control aquatic vegetation. But they uh, can cause a lot of resource damage if they reproduce or if they spread. And so our regulations have required for quite some time that to stock them in Wyoming, they have to be from a certified triploid source, which is a sterile source that can't reproduce. But even then, um, if they escape, they can live to be very old and they can get very large and they can still do quite, do some, cause some damage, particularly to smaller ponds. So we, uh, we clarified in regulation or added a regulation that we, they cannot come from a broker. It's an intermediary that goes and buys the fish from a hatchery and then they have them and they resell them because we can't control if that intermediary might also have diploid fish, uh, sterile fertile fish at their facility and that the, 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 the triploids and the diploids are being kept separate. So we want them to come straight from the vendor. Um, we also prohibited their stocking and flowing waters. These final three bullets that we added to regulation have been in place in the southwestern part of the state in the Colorado River drainage as part of the multi-state agreement for a long time. 
but we decided that they would be appropriate to add statewide, that they're prohibited to be stocked in flowing waters. They, they can't be stocked in waters connected to the 100-year floodplain. And in our past agreement for the Colorado River drainage, that, that floodplain language can be kind of problematic if you go out and try to figure out if a place is on the floodplain and you're inside city limits, you can find a FEMA map and tell right away. But if you're out in the middle of Albany County on a ranch, it can be really hard to determine if you're on the floodplain. And in the past, the onus of determining that floodplain was really on the department to decide whether or not to approve that request. And in regulation, we're putting that back on the landowner and they would have to hire a qualified engineer and show us where the floodplain is. And if the pond was on the floodplain, they'd have to berm and screen the pond to make sure that those things couldn't escape in the event of a hundred year flood. And then we added the section uh, on requesting an appeal to a department decision. Again, because these are decisions that affect private landowners and their property, uh, we want them to have a procedure for resolving grievances prior to having to go to contested cases. And we also edited section 10 on record so that when paperwork is submitted following a private fish stocking, it used to be the private landowner that's submitting that paperwork that says this many fish of this species and size were stocked in my pond on this date. We've changed the regulation so it's the private hatchery that is uh, doing the stocking and, and signing the forms and submitting them to the department. That's most of the changes. They were presented at the same public meeting we discussed a few times that was attended primarily by representatives of private fish hatcheries in state and out of state. And we only received one comment on chapter 49 from a, a hatchery that's currently and long been authorized to stock in Wyoming. And we had had language in the past that said, once you're approved to stock your water, you have 30 days to finish that stocking. Otherwise you have to come back to us and amend your stocking authorization with a new date. Um, we thought we would extend that to 60 days to give them more time to get that stocking completed without having to do an amendment. But the comment was, you know, why limit that at all? We had this, this was our draft language and it was quite long. Um, essentially says you have 60 days otherwise we'll start over and amend things but we we took that comment and decided that it was reasonable to just eliminate that need for amendments and ensure that stocking is completed by the end of the calendar year and that was the sole comment and our sole response to it so if there are any questions i have to answer i have a question um and you said some of the grass carp triploids are allowed Sigmund? on the grass carp on the my, my thing is is the, the problem that arises that, that I've heard is the, the triploids on the rainbow trout and why we don't allow those trout to be stocked. This is particular in the Salt River region. region and, right, right. Yeah. So your question, President Roberts, is, is why would we allow triploid grass carp but not triploid rainbow trout? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a, it's a very good question and it's complicated, but I'll try not to be too long winded, but multiple states around us have gone to triploid game fish in an effort to reduce the consequences of illegal transplants so that if a walleye gets moved from the water of stocking to another place, at least it's not going to reproduce. Um, our partners to the Paracle. Our, our colleagues of the West in Idaho, you know, they have they have gone heavily towards triploid stocking to the point that rain triploid rainbow trout are stocked on top of native cutthroats. That at least they won't reproduce and hybridize with them. We've really tried to steer clear of that in Wyoming and manage for our native species, and haven't seen the need to go to producing triploids because when we do. Uh, the private sector demand will absolutely be there for I want to put triploid rainbow trout on my property in the Snake River drainage. And, and triploidy is a complicated procedure that our fish culture section has figured out and can do a pretty good job of. 
but it's it's not a hundred percent. You have to get really good at it, and then you have to have an acceptable level of triploidy where you decide to proceed. Otherwise, that pot of fish gets gets called. And we would not want the private sector to be creating triploids on their own and having to try to regulate that science and that procedure. So we would likely be forced into a situation where we were doing triploidy for the private sector and providing those eggs um, for sale. I, I hope I'm not misspeaking to, to Bill or anybody else, but I think that's a, a, a significant concern and we've chosen to steer clear of it for now. When it comes to grass carp, we're talking relatively small numbers of expensive fish that uh, are intended to control some vegetation and then they're not there for sport, but the triploidy is uh, certified by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the procedure by which they certify the individual lots of triploides, the, the testing is Coulter counterbalance testing triploids um, by individual lot where they go into a private fish hatchery and certify that those fish are definitely triploid and then that hatchery just has a short period of time to sell those fish and then the next batch has to be certified. So it's really, they're similar, but quite a bit different. It's just, it's just hard to explain it for me. Uh, you, you take a triploid and you tell somebody, you can't stock that because you, unless you can say it's 100%, 100% uh, not going to reproduce, nothing's certain 100%. And, and so you're, you're, and the demand, like you said, the demand for a triploid rainbow would go crazy because they're just better hardy, quicker fish to grow, better, you know, thing. And, and so I just thought, well, you know, why are we, you know, why is it good from one end and the triploid is good enough here, but if it's not triploid, it's not good enough there. And the changes that we proposed is to the comments that we expect to see is why are you making this identify the floodplain? Why are you worried about escapement and berming? They're, they're triploid. Why, why are you worried about streams? So we really are putting kind of safety check on safety check on safety check because of that concern that they may not be 100% of the fish may not be triploid, but it's certainly. Um, but in all I think you're not gonna let them do it. I mean, in, in all said and done, basically you're not gonna let them do it is what I'm hearing. No matter what the presider, whatever it is, if it goes to that, Salt River drainage into the Snake River drainage into Palisades down to the South Fork. You are not going to let them put any kind of a a, a, a triploid or a rainbow in that that area. It's got to be 100% cut toe. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, President Roberts, right now that would be correct because our definition of the fish that are available to the private sector is on those lists of cool, cold water, and warm water, and they don't um, include any triploids. <clears throat> That's my question. I just any questions. Okay. Is uh, any comments from the public? Anything? Uh, and would this be something you're ready to vote on? To you're done. Are you done? I believe I'm done. We're having, okay. I didn't, I'm not looking at the agenda, but I don't think I'm up here any longer. Okay. <laughs> Okay, is there an motion to approve chapter 49 on the private stocking of cold blooded wild, cold blooded wildlife? Uh, do we have any motion? Uh, Commissioner Bird has motioned it. Okay. Commissioner Ludwell has seconded it. Uh, there any discussion? No discussion. Uh, all those in favor to adopt it? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, motion carried. Uh, 49 is incorporated. See how good that works if I stay out of it. We're ready. So, um, all right. Let's go back to readdress uh, chapter fifty-one. There's gonna there's been slight change in it, and the change is going to reflect. Did you did you type it out or did we put it re revision to it? I guess. What I'm going to be asking for is we're going to review the, the, the change in 51 and I'm going to ask for public comment on that. And if so, then we'll incorporate it with the, with the 
uh, main motion to 251. Uh, since we had a public comment um, that we're attempting to address, I, I think we can make a change in response to public comment. Okay. And the suggestion that we had was that in the appendix to chapter 51, on the very first page is where it's the only place where we refer to aquatic animal health inspectors in the chapter 51 reg outside of the definition section. And it currently reads all fish health inspections shall be completed by an aquatic animal health inspector or fish pathologist, except as provided below. Uh, in order to address the comment from the NAA, we would suggest that we clarify that the, we're only talking about in-state private fish hatcheries having to be inspected by aquatic animal health inspectors or fish pathologists, and then add a section D that would say that at out-of-state hatcheries, we would include United States Department of Agriculture accredited veterinarians as acceptable inspectors to collect samples at those out-of-state facilities. Um, any comment on that from the public? Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, that's what I got. So what I'll do is uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve Chapter 51, Private Fish Hatcheries, uh, and also the, the new, not amended, but incorporated. Uh, do I have a motion for that? Uh, it's motioned by Commissioner Doobie. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Bird. Uh, any discussion among anybody? Uh, all those in favor to uh, signify. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It, motion carries. It's incorporated. Okay. So, Nicole Hatcher's not going to look at the camera. Let's go to, let's see. What? Mark Nelson? Yeah, you got it. President Roberts, members of the commission. Uh, while the PowerPoint's getting queued up, uh, we're gonna, we'll discuss chapter 33. Uh, you have before you our draft proposal. Again, I'll give you a, a broad overview. Uh, if you do have specific questions in the draft, certainly let me know and I can answer any questions. First, simple name change. Uh, we don't need all the verbiage we we put in the regulation or in the title to shorten it for simplicity's sake. In the definitions in section two, we did remove the, uh, the words uh, government entities. Uh, we really restricted ourselves with that in the definition. There's more than just wildlife agencies uh, and agriculture agencies that, that we deal with in scientific permits. So that's been deleted. And in the application requirements in section three, uh, permittees found themselves in somewhat of a conundrum where the, if they needed a federal permit, they may have been studying, let's say a, a migratory bird in the US Fish and Wildlife Service would not issue them a permit until they had a state permit, but we wouldn't issue a permit until they had a federal permit. So they were kind of in a bind. <laughs> so we added the language that we'll issue a permit and they can't take action on that permit until they get a federal permit. So it lets them get, get that federal permit going. In section three for the application requirements, uh, we had 20 days where a person would submit an application and, and we would act on it within that 20 days. But there was some confusion on what 20 days was. Did that include weekends? Did it include holidays? So we change it to 30 consecutive days, which will still give us enough time to, to work on and act on those applications. Section four, the permit conditions. Uh, permit shall be issued in accordance with the health requirements of chapter 10 or chapter 69. Currently, if uh, 
scientific permit was issued for someone importing an animal, we had to issue them in addition to their chapter 33 permit, a chapter 10 permit, so they would follow the health requirements. This will allow us just to issue the chapter 33 permit, no duplication of effort on our part. They have to follow the health requirements to import. In uh, chapter 33, there's wording that uh, if there's a conflict in the regulation that chapter 10 is the controlling regulation. Since we split uh, the cold-blooded into the new chapter 69, uh, if there's a conflict in a cold-blooded uh, realm in this regulation, chapter 69 is the controlling regulation will take precedence. That's it, fairly short and sweet. I can certainly answer any questions if you have any. Um, no question is any questions from the public uh, comments or questions from the public. Uh, if not, I'd entertain a motion to approve chapter 33 scientific research, educational and special purpose permits. Uh, do we entertain a motion? Uh, Commissioner Bird has moved it. Commissioner Ludwall has seconded it. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, motion carries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See you again. <laughs> Go. All right, thank you, President Roberts, members of the commission. Uh, chapter 52 revisions are before you. Um, I'll go over some of the highlights. Again, if you have questions, feel free to, to ask me, and I'll certainly uh, try my best to answer them. So chapter 52 is our non-game regulation and Again, our team that was formed for chapter 10 uh, looked at all the, the different uh, regulations that, that 10 kind of impacted. And we saw in 52 that we really kind of, we really needed to clarify that chapter 52 for in-state take only for non-game wildlife. It doesn't deal with importation. It's just for our wildlife that are in the state. In the definitions, we did add some definitions because the terms were used throughout the non-game regulation and the definitions are tied back into the statutory uh, definitions of exotic species, predaceous birds, Pika, Pika. and protected animals. To clarify what 52, uh, the intent of 52, we did add a purpose section. And again, as I said before, it's really to clarify that it deals with the take of non-game animals from within Wyoming. And uh, to any take of those animals may require a permit. And if they do, the permits would be under chapter 10, chapter 33, or chapter 69. Similar to the previous chapter that we looked at, we did uh, place in that the controlling regulation is chapter 69 for the cold-blooded species when there's a conflict. Section five deals with taking of non-game wildlife from within Wyoming. And if at any time, a researcher wants to study one of our animals and actually capture them, take hold of them, put a collar on them. Uh, they do need a, a chapter 33 permit and that'll benefit our state uh, because part of the permit requirements is reporting and we wanna know what they found when they take our animals and study them. That'll help us better manage our wildlife. So that requirement is in chapter 52.
currently uh, the regulations is a, maybe a little confusing. Um, currently written, if someone were to unintentionally kill, let's say they ran over a non-game uh, animal with their vehicle, the way the regulation currently reads is that they need to contact a law enforcement officer. That's really not what we wanted for all um, of these species. So we were just trying to, to hone in on, and, and our non-game section sure. supervisors here can correct me if I'm wrong, but we wanted to really highlight the swift fox and the gray fox. And if they're unintentionally uh, run over by a vehicle, reporting, you don't have to report that. But if they're unintentionally taken in other ways, which would be, let's say a trapper has a snare set for coyotes, and he ends up taking a swift fox, uh, then this regulation says he has to notify a uh, law enforcement officer of that take. So they cannot be taken intentionally. There are species that uh, um, are special concern with, with their status as, as far as being in Wyoming. We, we wanna ensure that they remain a healthy population. And then for those unintentional takes, uh, they have to get permission from a law enforcement officer to retain the pelts from those two animals. Section six, commercial use, uh, really stays the same. We, we, we know that 69 now is part of this, so we added the chapter 69 for commercial use of non-game wildlife. And it's also uh, referenced in the current fishing regulations. So then we'll go through the different species here, categories, start with amphibians and reptiles. Scientific take, uh, if someone's gonna take these two species, they need a chapter 33 permit. Um, and they can't be taken in any other way except through a, a research permit that we would issue along with the desert whip snake, the eastern spiny soft shell. Uh, those species are of concern to us that there should be limited take of them. If they're not listed uh, there, then uh, they don't need a permit to be taken, unless again, it's for the scientific use. Live amphibians and reptiles taken for personal use need to be uh, contained and not <coughs> released or allowed to escape. And that's also incorporated in chapter 46, fishing regulations. We did add that if anybody were to take an American bullfrog, that that uh, animal needs to be killed immediately. And that's because of their extremely destructive um, habits that would uh, really impact negatively uh, Wyoming's wildlife. So moving on to birds, uh, really the same verbiage for scientific take. Uh, we added that if anybody's gonna take any predaceous birds, exotic species of birds, uh, birds declared as pests that they still need to get a Chapter 33 permit, so we can uh, benefit from the information that they, they gain from their research. And then if they're not taking those animals for scientific research, they don't need a permit uh, to take uh, those predaceous birds, exotic species of birds. Um, Mute swans can be taken for personal use, but mute swans can be destructive. And we don't want commercial use of the mute swans. We don't want them uh, being raised to sell and spread through that way. So we limited the take for commercial use to, for the mute swan. Fish side of things, we added that Goldfish and koi taken or purchased for use as bait need to be killed immediately. And uh, live goldfish or koi cannot even be in 
possession while fishing. That's to protect our resources from competition from these species. And that is also in chapter 46. For mammals, if a mammal is going to be used in commercial use, they'll need a permit, a non-game animal using commercial use. For instance, if someone wants to capture rattlesnakes and sell them for commercial, that'd be a commercial use, that could really impact uh, in a negative fashion on those populations on one ranch. It could uh, really depopulate rattlesnakes. I'm using that as an example in that area. So we wanted to spread out the use um, and we've done that with rattlesnakes in particular. We don't want to destroy in one area that population. Uh, the yellow-bellied marmot uh, was inadvertently omitted in the last chapter 50 go round, where they were not, they're not currently allowed to be taken, where in the past they were a non-game mammal that, that didn't need a permit to be taken. We wanted that back in so they, they can be taken now uh, without a permit. Taken there. Oh, the, the Norway rat uh, was is in our current chapter 52, but they're actually defined as a domestic animal in chapter 10. So they don't belong in our non-game regulation. So we removed it from 52. For mollusks and crustaceans, uh, for scientific take, uh, mollusks and crustaceans, uh, if they're going to take these critters, they need a chapter 33, the California floater and the plains pocketbook. I have no idea what those are, but plain pocketbook. They would need a scientific permit to take those. So mollusks and crustaceans can be taken without a per permit. We added for crayfish uh, that once they're transported away from uh, where they capture them, the body water where they capture them, they can't be used anymore for fishing bait. So they, they might catch them in one lake they can use them for fishing bait there. Once they remove them, they can't use them for bait anymore. Uh, we don't want any kind of disease being spread or undesirable species, crayfish being spread. So I'll certainly entertain any questions if the commission has any. We're, we're curious what the pocketbook is. I, <laughs> Kirk said he actually had a picture of one up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got it. Got it. Okay. No, that was answered. Okay. Um, any questions from the public? None so. Uh, okay. At this time, um, this was, uh, we're going to be voting on um, Chapter 52 take of non-game wildlife within uh, Wyoming as presented. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay, Commissioner Ladwig. Second. Second, Commissioner Leadville. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> It passes. That's a plain pocket. Sure. <laughs> okay. We can arrange that. Yeah, wow. I, gonna... I think I've seen them in the croquet. It's going to be a uh, like next regulation. Is, uh, right. Chapter 50 uh, mm -hmm. Fishing Preserves. Jeez. 
I don't have slides for this. A fairly brief regulation. I'll try to be try to be relatively quick. That the fishing preserve regulation is we're really talking about uh, fishing clubs that someone can have a water that they pay a fee for to have licensed as a private fishing preserve. And one of the most significant changes throughout this regulation was to add a number of really appropriate references to statute. And it's really impossible to understand our fishing preserve regulation without also opening the statute. There's a statute on preserves and you really need to, to know both to understand the regulations. We tried to provide some guidance by having refer relevant references uh, to statute. Change the uh, title of section four to stocking of fishing preserves and, and really kept that as brief as we could and said that it would be done in accordance with chapter 49. In section six, permission to fish, method of take and verification of catch it is another place where we provided reference to statute where it is required that that people that uh, it says that during the term of their license a fishing preserve license holder can grant permission to other persons to take fish and to charge a fee and then no fishing license is required uh, in section b of section six we clarify that because people are fishing without a license the uh, fishing preserve license holder has to issue a written statement <laughs> to people that are in possession of fish so that they were stopped by an enforcement officer. They could show that those fish were legally obtained because they have a receipt for them, but they may not have a license. And we added the requesting an appeal to a department decision that we've added to a number of these regs. That's it. Any public comments? Or anything okay um looking for a motion to uh, approve chapter 50 fishing preserves as uh, presented is there a motion mr lundvall they're not making eye contact <laughs> we'll move so move a second commissioner doobie has moved it seconded by commissioner bird all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Chapter 53 is on landowner lakes and ponds. It's in another regulation that has a lot of uh, accompanying law and statute. We made sure we provided reference to those statutes so that people could understand their requirements related to landowner fishing lakes and ponds. We revised the definition of an individual, which sounds fairly straightforward, but we've had landowner lakes and ponds, which uh, afford the landowner, their spouse, their children and grandchildren to fish without a license, to have uh, essentially like a, an LLC or a partnership be designated as the landowner, which would afford that fishing without a license to a lot more individual, a lot more people. And statute, um, is fairly clear about the intent being that landowner fishing lakes or ponds should be um, that should only be a department designation that's given to an individual. So we clarified by saying it it doesn't mean a partnership, a corporation, trust, limited, an LLC, or a homeowners association or similar type of organization. We uh, clarified in section four that. Fish can only be taken by legal fishing method was already there, but that the individual landowner, landowner, spouse, children, grandchildren can fish without a license on these. Um, these are a department designation. You don't have to pay any fee to get designated as a landowner, lake or pond. You just have to apply to the department and meet the requirements of statute and this regulation. Like chapter 50, um, in section 4C, the individual landowner has to issue a written statement to a person removing fish. That language used to be a receipt. We don't actually provide receipt booklets or forms for people to issue these 
thing. So we changed the language from receipt to a written statement and what had to be included on that statement at the end of that section 4C. We've also uh, had a relatively difficult time over the years tracking these designations. Once you give one out, um, there's, they've essentially been permanent and then the time and the property may change hands multiple times and people aren't aware that it's designated a landowner lake or pond. So we decided to suggest that they be designated for a five-year period and that that would automatically expire upon sale or transfer and that they'd have to be renewed to have help us track where these things are. And then we added section 4E where the department could deny or rescind the designation if they failed to comply with regulation. And we added the requesting an appeal to a department decision. That was the extent of the edits to that chapter. Any public comment on it? Uh, going to be asking for a motion for uh, a vote to approve chapter 53 landowner fishing lakes and ponds as presented. Um, do we have any motion? Moved. Moved by Com Commissioner Jolovich, seconded by second by Commissioner Bird. Uh, any discussion? Uh, no discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. We'll go ahead. Now, I don't know on the next. Yes. Thank you. That's uh, okay. Let's at this time, let's do. Uh, Chapter 42, Dan Thompson and uh, Justin Clapp, whoever's doing it. We'll go find our carnivore people. You gone now? People look <laughs> yeah, people look do we, do we need a small break? Yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back and uh, we'll start with uh, uh, chapter 42. Okay, um, everybody's back, and what we'll do is uh, this will be uh, item number 15. And Dan, would you take it through to start it? Thank you, President Roberts, Director Nesbitt, members of the commission. I actually have the easy job today of just introducing people. Uh, so, first off is Chapter 42 Mountain Lion Regulations. Justin Clapp, our biologist at Alander, is going to present that information to you. Uh, Justin's been with us full-time since 2014, but he was actually a seasonal before I started um, working on bear monitoring, but uh, Justin's currently pursuing his PhD on the CWD study that you've heard about with mountain lions and Casper, as well as working with us at the University of Wyoming, and I will turn it over to Justin. Okay. Thank you. I'm the commission director, Talbert. I'm going to make sure that my clicker. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's not just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I'm stuck in the past. Just hey, looks like my clicker's working. Um, thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try and keep this presentation. It's pretty brief, um, but there will likely be some conversation to be had toward the end of it. Um, so again, chapter 42, mountain lion seasons. Um, we're gonna start off with an outline. I'm gonna briefly mention the management plan that we have in place for mountain lion management in Wyoming. Uh, talk a little bit about the statewide harvest trends and some of the objectives that we have set and how we achieve those objectives. Um, I'll move into the proposed regulation changes, uh, the public comment process, You know what we proposed to the public, some of the comments that we got back from them about mountain lion hunting seasons. Um, and, and others, and then, and then wrap things up with, and do the best I can to answer any questions you might have. So to start out Wyoming's mountain lion management plan, the goal is to sustain our mountain lion populations in core habitats at varying densities. We call this an adaptive harvest approach 
because it provides guidelines for local managers to make decisions at local levels. And we do that by managing hunt areas, which is the smallest unit that we, that we have in the state at the hunt area level towards source, stable, or sink management and, and variations thereof. Um, and within a management unit level, if we have a mix of source, stable, and sink, it provides that sustainability for mountain lions to move from one hunt area when they, when they disperse from their natal range and occupy adjacent areas. So we have both immigration into hunt areas um, from young mountain lions setting up a home range, and we have immigration out um, when they disperse from where they're born. And it's that balance that provides our sustainability. So on the screen, you'll see uh, the shaded areas that are colored are the different mountain lion management units that we have. Um, within those units are our hunt areas. And basically there's five of them. The West is pretty robust. It's a pretty big area. And that is broken down into some smaller analysis units just to make things um, a little easier to manage. And so the idea is that within those hunt areas, they're comprised of areas that have contiguous mountain lion habitat that promotes movement of mountain lions among those hunt areas. Now we certainly have mountain lions that will move across management units and, and even across the state and we've documented pretty long dispersals from young mountain lions but a higher probability of dispersal and movement within those management units. And so within each management unit we can have our regions um, you know review their objectives and where we want to put heavy pressure on mountain lions and uh, in an attempt to reduce densities, but also offset that with areas that have less harvest pressure that provide recruitment and provide those animals opportunity to move and fill in those vacant home range areas. Okay, so most of the uh, data that we collect in order to, to make these determinations on the function of the hunt area is acquired through harvest data. And so we do have a mandatory check for all mountain lion mortalities. And some of the data that we collect includes the age and sex of the animal, the lactation status um, for, for females, obviously the location of the mortality, selectivity, which has to do with whether a mountain lion hunter was actively searching for a certain quality or animal, maybe an older aged animal or a male mountain lion when they were when they're hunting. The method that they used, um, whether they used an outfitter and a, and a measure of effort and how many days they hunted, how many tracks they saw, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we compile all this data and we do it on a three-year cycle. We review chapter 42 and bring it to the commission every three years. And the reason we do that is because mountain lion hunting is variable based on the conditions, not only the density of cats, but the tracking conditions, what the snow conditions are that year, um, what type of hunting pressure, what type of outfitters are out there. And so what we find is with harvest data, sometimes we'll have a year that has really phenomenal snow conditions, great tracking conditions, and we'll have a spike in harvest. And then the next year that harvest might be low. And so we can get a lot of bouncing up and down in our harvest trends. And so by assessing this data over a three year period, we're able to more accurately get an assessment of the local population trend at the hunt area level. So, for monitoring techniques, the three major parameters outlined in our management plan that we use to make an assessment on a hunt area. The first one is the mortality density. And that's basically the number of human caused mortalities of mountain lions per unit area of habitat. And we have a habitat map established for the entire state. And it generally goes as you remove more mountain lions that changes the trajectory of the local population. The, the second one that we use is the percentage of adult females that are taken in a harvest. And just like most wildlife management, reproduction and recruitment drives the population. And so tracking females and the amount of females that are taken influences that population on the landscape. Uh, as more adult females are harvested, they're obviously not having kittens and that can influence the population. And finally, the average age of adult females is important because as you continue to put pressure on a hunt area, you tend to take out some of the older age structure out of that population. A lot of the older age males and the older age females will get taken. And what we see generally in areas where the average age of our adult females is younger, it means that, that it's, there's a higher likelihood that older females have been removed and younger females may only have the ability to have maybe one or two litters 
before they show up in the harvest, before they're taken, <laughs> as opposed to a mountain lion, maybe a seven or eight year old female that has had the opportunity to, to have multiple litters. So we use all those parameters and, and we document a lot more metrics um, at each at each hunt area. And we do that to make a classification for each hunt area as whether it's functioning more toward a source level, meaning uh, to maintain or augment the local mountain lion population. And this provides dispersal out to other areas to try and maintain a stable mountain lion hunt area where we're just trying to maintain right about where we're at as far as how many animals we have on the landscape. And finally, sink management, where we provide a lot of hunter opportunity with the goal to reduce that local mountain lion population. And that's generally associated with, um, it can be things like proximity to, to towns, or it can be livestock, uh, a number of different considerations where we might want to provide some sink management. And so without going through all the, all the hunt areas and taking up the next two days of the commission meeting here, um, I have the map set up, and this is just color coded on the assessments that we made in the large carnivore section. Um, the first thing I'll point out is the gray area. We have three hunt areas that are gray areas. Um, they have minimal habitat. They don't have a lot of large contiguous habitat that would promote and support sourcing dynamics. Certainly doesn't mean that there's not mountain lions in those areas, um, even resident mountain lions but they likely don't have the contiguous core habitat to support those, those sorts of dynamics. This also doesn't mean that we, that we don't allow harvest or don't limit harvest in some of those areas, but those areas typically um, don't contribute heavily to our population dynamics. Uh, the rest of the colored areas, as you can see, start with some of the red areas. Those are where we have um, assessed those areas as sink. Typically the age structure in those populations are younger because we continue to put pressure on them. So most of the animals that are available for harvest there are ones that were either recently born or have immigrated in when they dispersed off of the place where they were born. For example, in Northeast Wyoming, you'll see those hunt areas in the Black Hills are, are all red. That's because of a lot of the dispersal that comes from South Dakota, where we get young animals moving in from the South Dakota side provides opportunity hunts for people in Northeast Wyoming to, to harvest quite a few cats. And so harvest densities are high in the Black Hills. Um, so there's a couple other areas that we classified as sink. Um, we have stable toward sink. You see some of them, it's not just black and white. There's some uh, continuum there. We have areas where they show some stability, but we do put quite a bit of pressure on those areas. And those are, are shown in orange. Uh, the yellow areas are where we um, assessed a stable population. And so there's quite a good handful of, of areas around the state that have stability. Um, areas that are leaning more toward source, stable to source. They have good age structure. They likely provide some recruitment and some dispersal into those surrounding areas. And then the dark green areas are areas where it certainly doesn't mean that we don't hunt in those areas, but the metrics and the data that we collect indicates that those populations are, are very strong and, and produce offspring. So skipping forward to our statewide perspective, we can see that generally we're on our fifth management cycle. So we've been under this management strategy for 15 years and we've just finished up cycle number five. And you'll see a couple of things to note in 2021, you can see that harvest is dipped down from 2020, which is um, the, the highest harvest that we've seen to date. Um, and the data for this year that we collected really is only through March 31st, so there are some additional harvests, so um, that bar will likely increase, although I don't anticipate the additional harvest for some of those hunt areas that are open um, through the next harvest season, which will start September 1st, um, but it would probably increase, it will increase a little bit. But we can see these general trends where uh, the population, or the, sorry, the harvest has increased over the first two cycles, dipped down during cycle three and cycle four, and then we hit a new peak in, in the harvest year 2020. Uh, but I think generally mountain lion harvest has increased across the state over the last 15 years. And what this graph shows is, a, is how the age structure from a statewide viewpoint corresponds with increased harvest. As you increase harvest, you take a lot of the older age structure out, and that means that more subadults are gonna dominate on the landscape. And although it's not drastic, we can see that you know, early in the first cycle, 
we were, we were having more than 50% of our harvest come in as adult cats and you know, maybe even closer to 60%. And now that's kind of flip-flopped over a decade where most of the animals that we harvest are sub-adult animals. Um, but it's also important to recognize that that's not ubiquitous across the state. We certainly have hunt areas where the majority of animals are adults, but we do have areas where we've put quite a bit of pressure on mountain lions and had some relatively high harvests, and those can influence the overall pattern for the state. I talked briefly about the Black Hills in Wyoming, where the age structure is pretty low. Um, it's not due to a short of, shortage of mountain lions. It's just the age structure that's there, and it continues to fill in with younger animals that get harvested. So. I guess from a statewide perspective, higher harvest does influence age structure and multiple factors can influence this harvest beyond lion densities. We have changes in tracking conditions, snow conditions. Um, you know, our houndsmen and, and people that are hunting are using more modern equipment every year. Uh, tracked vehicles, you know, GPS collars, um, continually training their dogs and, and, and being more effective out in the field. All those things influence the harvest that comes in. You know, an increased interest in mountain lion hunting just seems to always be on the forefront of people's minds where things like social media and, and people seeing the excitement of being able to come to Wyoming and hunt a mountain lion, I, I truly do feel that that influences the interest and, and folks that, that want to hunt within the state or come from out of state and hunt mountain lions. And, and overall, these differing objectives and the differences in hunt, area, in hunt area pressure around the state they allow those animals to continue this sourcing dynamic that is the backbone of our, of our mountain lion management plan. So moving on uh, to the proposed changes that the department came forward with in chapter 42. Um, in the hunting regulations, we proposed uh, hunt area changes or hunt changes for four hunt areas. Um, and I have the chart down below that show the hunt areas where we propose those changes. All of those were to propose additional opportunity or increase in allowable harvest. And one hunt area had an increase in association with a boundary change, and we'll get to that. So I'll briefly go through in hunt area five. That hunt area is basically between Laramie and Cheyenne, where the objective is for stable to source level. Um, this, this hunt area, I think, I, let me see if my... There we go, hunt area five. Um, it met the mortality limit the last four years. Uh, we classified it as, as stable management. We felt that there was opportunity, more opportunity for hunters and we heard public comment for people that wanted to have the ability to harvest more cats. And we recommended that that mortality limit increase from 12 to 15. Uh, in hunter area 10, which is on the western front of the, of the Sierra Madres in Bags country, um, that area doesn't have a whole lot of suitable habitat. Most of the animals that come out of that area are subadults. But again, the mortality limit for that area was being reached four years in a row. Um, most of the animals that go through that country, um, again, are subadults are probably dispersing off of more of the core areas. Um, there was also some, some conflicts that have occurred in that area. And so we recommended to increase that from seven to 10 allowable harvests in hunt area 10. Moving on to hunt area 14, see right there, um, southern end of the Wyoming range. Um, this area doesn't routinely meet the mortality limit. Um, only once out of the last nine years was that mortality limit of, of 15 met. But that area does have a lot of um, winter closures later in the winter, so it, it limits the opportunity. And what we find in our justification for that is that, you know, there are certain years where snow conditions get really good and people are able to, to reach that 15 uh, animal limit. And given that on consecutive years, there's a lower probability that they would reach that limit, that on the year where the tracking conditions are really good, that we could allow some additional harvest there, understanding that that's probably not the norm for an area like that, given the consistent variability in tracking conditions. And so therefore we propose that we increase that limit from 15 to 20 animals in the southern Wyoming range. The final one is hunt area 28, um, right here in the middle of the state. And that one can be generalized as areas of private land within the boundaries of the Wind River Indian Reservation. This, this hunt area isn't typically an area where you're gonna, you're gonna see a lot of consistent um, 
sportsmen going out to try and pursue cats in that area, primarily because there's so much um, reservation land surrounding those private land that it's not really amenable to consistently hunt mountain lions. And the mortality limit is very low, but it does provide a good source area for the surrounding areas as well. But we did propose an increase from three allowable harvests to four allowable harvests, and I'll show you why. We're proposing that we change the boundaries of Hunt Area 22. And you can see in this photo that it extends, kind of, kind of oddly extends in to include this area, uh, also known as the, the irrigation project or the project that's kind of within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. Now, Hunt Area 22 has a mortality limit of 25 animals, with most of those harvests occurring on the northern end in, the, in country near Tensley. And the questions that we continue to get from folks is, what does harvest you know, way down here in the Wind River drainage impact in the, in the Southwest Big Plains? And, and it's a valid point. And so what we decided to do during this round is to propose that we bisect area 22 at the exterior of area 28 and include that area that we call the project and incorporate that into area 28. Now, with that inclusion, because we are adding more habitat, we thought it would be appropriate to allow an additional harvest within area 28, understanding that we don't have a lot of harvest that occurs there. Um, we would not, however, penalize hunt area 22. That area would be unchanged as far as a harvest limit. We'd still allow 25 harvests there. Um, and so that was that. So I'm going to get to the public comments, but before I do, um, I'm going to quickly talk about a few additional hunt areas that were that based on public comments, we also wanted to propose some changes for the commission to consider today. And those three hunt areas you can see in green, we'll start with hunt area six, that's the Laramie range area. That area started with a relatively low mortality limit, um, provided good source population. And a number of years ago, that, that mortality limit was increased to, to, from 12 to 21. And we ran that for a while until some of the sportsmen and folks were saying that they weren't quite seeing the productivity, not having the success, seeing less tracks, and, and more not seeing it, um, finding the older age, age structured animals that they'd like to see. Um, given that public comment in previous commission meetings, we approved that mortality limit to move down to 15. Um, running that for a handful of years, we did see um, a relative increase in the densities on the landscape. Our houndsmen were telling us that we're seeing cats come back. Um, and so we've determined to try and to try and find a good spot for area six. And we propose to increase that back up to, to 18 to try and maintain that. Area six is probably the, the core of the source area for mountain lions in Southeast Wyoming. Um, and we think we can still provide that, but still allow a little bit of extra harvest for people in that area. The next one is Hunt Area 12, and that is south of uh, Rock Springs, Green River area, Flaming Gorge. And we've run a mortality limit of six in that area for a number of years. Um, and given that a lot of the harvest that's occurring in Hunt Area 12 has been occurring more toward the fringe of that hunt area, not what we would consider our core habitat. Um, again, this, this hunt area has good age structure. It runs as stable management. It usually shows as stable management but we felt we could provide a little bit more opportunity in Hunter Area 12, um, increasing that limit from six to eight animals available. And finally, Hunter Area 23 in the Northern Bighorns. Um, this North Central Management Unit, i just briefly uh, go through them. Area 23, our objective is stable management. Area 21 um, on, the, on the west side is stable towards sink. We wanna put more pressure on animals there. Area 22 is managed towards sink. And then area 15 is, as most of you know, unlimited harvest um, with, a, with a lot of hunting pressure occurring over the last few years in 115. Now, we, we took area 23 to a mortality limit of 15. We got a lot of feedback. We got a lot of public comments of people saying um, that they wanted a little bit more opportunity, keep that season open a little bit longer. And the region determined that, that they wanted to increase that from 15 to 18 allowable harvests in Hunt Area 23. Any questions on the, the, the Hunt areas and the changes that we proposed for this? Okay. okay. So 
when we went out with our with our proposed changes, we received public comments. We went to, or we conducted 10 public meetings. There was at least one public meeting within each region. And we had a total attendance of 53 people that came to the meeting in response to chapter 42. We received a total of 56 official public comments. 43 of those were online, 13 of them were written comments. We received comments from five um, nonprofit groups or organizations across the board. And the remaining 51 were from individuals that, on, that provided online or written comments. And the way that I've broke this down, we had individual feedback. Um, you know, a lot of people, some people just write a comment and say, you know, uh, increase this area by two. That's, that's one comment. Um, but we also had people that wrote a couple paragraphs and they said, I'd like to see this and I'd like to see this. So I broke down um, the, the comments that we received into individual topics. And we had 127 comments and they spanned across 36 different topics regarding mountain lion management in Wyoming, which is, which is quite a bit. And so what I've done here is I've broken down those comments into general themes. And I'll start with the theme of, of general mountain lion management. You can see the pie graph here. And, and I'll just touch on some of the top ones. The, the, the majority of the comments that had to do with general mountain lion management in Wyoming were to maintain healthy populations and not over harvest mountain lions. Um, the second most common for general management um, were comments that wanted to see a later season start. And that was, um, it, it's intended to protect reproduction. So we have a book, birth pulse of mountain lions that typically happens in July and August. For the first few months, sometimes those kittens aren't with the female and therefore that female can be vulnerable to harvest and it can result in kitten abandonment. Our seasons start on September 1st. Um, although mountain lions do reproduce year round, um, there is certainly a birth pulse that happens late in the summer. And so there were some comments and, and we've had these comments pretty consistently about considerations to start the season a little bit later to protect those. However, we also have most of our hunting seasons and most of our sportsmen that are in the field earlier. And so those seasons generally start on September 1st for mountain lions. Um, the third most common comment array was to support game and fish management, just general support for, for what we do. Um, that was good to hear. Um, a couple of comments on establishing specific density estimates. People want to know how many, exactly how many cats are out there. They want to be, you know, us to give them a number. And in certain areas, that's achievable. In a lot of areas, that's really difficult to do. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the source sink management strategy is an effective way to manage animals, but you are not going to come up with specific numbers um, directly within this framework. Um, and then a handful of single comments that that I, I, I won't take the time to go through, but I'll move on. The next theme that I found in our comments was, was specifically toward harvest limits. And when I put all the comments together, 48% of those comments were for no increases or to de decrease or restrict uh, mortality limits. Um, you can see the resident, non-resident and organizational breakdown on that. Uh, the next most common was to increase limits. And Obviously, most of those came from, from our residents. And then finally, we did have a portion of the comments on harvest limits that just didn't want to see mountain lion hunting exist in Wyoming. And so that's how those comments broke down. And finally, we get to uh, one of the last themes, and this is um, primarily driven by our sportsmen who hunt mountain lions, and that is pursuit and opportunity. And you can see that the vast majority of these comments wanted the ability for residents to pursue mountain lions through the end of the season. And briefly on that, you know, the department sets the season length, the opportunity for people to be out and hunting mountain lions. If those mortality limits are met, that season automatically closes for the year. And so the majority of these comments were from uh, some pretty passionate folks that put a lot of investment into their dogs and into hunting. And they came up with a, a variety of different, different um, viewpoints on why they wanted to be able to continue to pursue um, during the allotted duration of the season given by the department. Uh, closely behind that was uh, the desire to implement, implement some type of hound handling permit. Right now, the, um, Wyoming is, uh, doesn't have much regulation on whose dogs can be used. Um, 
and with other states around us. It's becoming more common for other states to regulate and actually have people have a permit to use hounds. Um, and as more states that surround us continue to implement those, Wyoming tends to support the people if they can't go to other states, they'll come to Wyoming. And that includes harvest, but it also includes people that wanna train dogs. So, you know, folks from the mid Midwest who have bear dogs that, that wanna come out to Wyoming and run cats, they, they do have to have a licensed hunter present, but they don't have to have a specific permit to use their dogs. And that's, you know, mountain lion hunting is competitive um, and spe specifically in popular areas. And so we do hear a lot of comments from our sportsmen that it's becoming more and more of a concern. Um, we really pride ourselves on the opportunity that we provide our sportsmen for mountain lion hunting. Um, you can go hunt any area in the entire state um, and until those, until those areas close, that opportunity is open. So um, we like to be able to provide that to people, but um, you know, unfortunately as popularity continues to increase in other areas and other states, uh, implement regulations on people ha uh, handling hounds, um, this might be something in the future that we will have to address in the state. A um, couple of other ones, uh, there is a handful of folks that really do not like the, the non-resident limit that we have in Hunter Area 1 that we established, um, gave the commission the authority to regulate uh, lion harvest based on residency status. And that was specifically implemented to address overcrowding and, and a lot of people in a relatively small hunt area um, during the specific time period. Um, so those are probably uh, certainly the three most common public comments that we got from that. And so for the overall perspective, you know, we, we, were, um, we were approached with the majority of our comments based from our sportsmen asking for those types of things when it comes to pursuit and opportunity. And as a department, we got together, we had a lot of conversations about that. It was not probably specifically when it comes to allowing residents to pursue during the open season. Um, we had internal conversations and it was decided that we would come to the commission and ask for your directive on how we should approach this. Um, given that we did have enough comment, we thought it couldn't be ignored, but we didn't wanna come up with a proposal, particularly because that wasn't something that we proposed initially in our chapter 42. And we wanted to see how the, how the commission wanted us to approach this, potentially to you know, approve this, or to say, we need to provide this topic specifically for public comments, or to, you know, relinquish that and just say, this is not something that we're interested in pursuing at this point. And so in addition to the mortality limit changes that we've proposed and we're asking you to consider, we would also ask the commission to consider um, how you want the department to handle um, some of the comments from our sportsmen on, on um, pursuing through the seasons that are established. Um, this is just the conclusions, you know, the sportsman opportunity I've, I've talked about extensively. Conflict resolution continues to be extremely important to maintain public tolerance, large carnivores on the landscape. Um, public education input, our monitoring and research. I want to thank the commission for the support we have to continue to monitor large carnivores and learn more about, um, about ecology here at the Game and Fish Department. And um, with that, um, I'll do the best I can to answer any of the questions you may have. What are we talking on? How many uh, in-state versus how many out-of-state lion hunters do we have? Oh, well, we're probably, I mean, more resident hunters than non-resident hunters, but it really depends on which hunt area you're looking at. Generally, I think it's about two-thirds resident, about a third resident. But we do have some areas, particularly where we have outfitters that take a lot of non-resident hunters where the majority of the harvests that come in are, are from non-residents and, and they're an important part of the harvest that we, that we bring in. We were getting, I guess, to follow up on that, uh, President Roberts, uh, the, when we made that change for area one, we were seeing around 70% of the harvest coming in from non-resident hunters. And our residents were really concerned about the opportunity that they wanted to, um, to retain to be able to hunt in a, in a very competitive hunt area. And so, uh, for example, in hunt area one, which is the only hunt area in the state where we do have resident and non-resident limits se separated, 
um, we allow 24 harvests total, and four of those are available for non-residents and for residents. And we use up the 24 in, in state, and then, of course, the out-of-state will play out. That's correct. Yes. Mr. President, did you say two-thirds are non-resident and one-third are resident? That's what uh, I heard you say. Yeah, two-thirds would be resident hunters, That's right, generally. Probably. Yes, and about a third non-resident hunters. Okay. But again, that fluctuates wildly depending on which, which hunter area you're considering. And, um, and I imagine pursuit is going to be the discussion here pretty soon. Um, what we're doing, but um, uh, Mr. We'll President, if I might, I, I just in, you know some of the criticism that was in um, public comment was around the manner in which we evaluate mountain lion health and viability. You know, when the department comes forward and talks about. Um, antelope seasons, for example, we provide population estimates and age and sex ratios and a lot of that kind of information that we collect, that our field managers collect. Justin, talk a little bit about, you, you touched on it, but the nuances with mountain lion management and the difficulty and the resources that would be required to actually do a, a count or a population estimate for mountain lions and why source sink um, state or state source stable sink management is the approach that we've taken. Um, kind of discuss that a little bit more. Absolutely. Um, mountain lions are cryptic. They're extremely difficult to assess densities. Densities change across different prey bases and different habitats. And Wyoming is very um, varied in, in, in those prey densities and habitats across the state. When you think about areas from Northwest Wyoming all the way over into areas like the Black Hills and high desert systems in Southern Wyoming. Um, there are certain species where you can implement things like mark recapture to give a density estimate. Um, mountain lions typically, th those, those methods work well if you're doing things particularly like deer or, or especially in like small mammal trapping where you can set out a grid of traps and get a capture probability and catch them consistently. And you can get an estimate. Mountain lions is a lot more difficult. And, and part of that is because the densities are, are generally lower because they're a large carnivore. So if you're doing mark recapture on chipmunks, you can expect to catch a lot of chipmunks. And for mountain lions, you're less likely to do that. In addition to that, you, you know, the, the most effective way to catch mountain lions is through the use of hounds. And so now you bring in different complexities in where people are gonna search, how they're gonna try and find them. Um, you know, mountain lions typically aren't in groups unless they're family groups. So, um, you know, taking aerial photos of herds of elk or deer is something that can be done and you can get sightability estimates and, and you really can't do that for mountain lions. Finally, if we transition into something like black bears, there's even methods there that, that, that our own department implements for <coughs> um, hair snares and seeker models to be able to put up hair snares and have bears climb through the barbed wire and leave DNA that we, can, that we can use as a mark for that animal and we can get density estimates. And those, those really aren't as viable for mountain lions. They just, they just don't provide those estimates very easily. So even if we were able to do that, the amount of cost and, and effort that you have to put into doing that would be extensive and you would probably only get, you know, decent estimates at best for a relatively small area. And so we do rotate around the state in our monitoring, but actually giving estimates of how many animals are on the landscape um, just takes so many resources that it's not a viable option for the state of Wyoming at this point, in my opinion, um, to do. And, and the good thing about it is that we don't need to. We, we, we truly don't. This source sink dynamic gives us great information. <coughs> it lets us know the structure of the population. We know about mountain lion ecology and we know how mountain lions move and how they work, how they reproduce, how those young distribute into new areas. And the work that is the basis for our mountain lion management plan was research that was done in Wyoming. And so, you know, we've had our mountain lion management plan continuing now for 15 years. Um, some would argue that it's time for a revamp. Other states do more complicated analysis, including integrated population modeling. Um, heavy collaring, heavy cameras, uh, trail camera use, backtracking, tra track surveys. Um, but 
for what we get, for what we're able to do with our harvest data and our monitoring um, is really outstanding. And, and I guess that's about all I have on that. Thanks, Justin. Do, do, mountain lion, right, do, do mountain lions have a range? Do they protect their range from other mountain lions or are they pretty? Um... Yeah, President Roberts, ab absolutely. Um, you know, some would consider mountain lions to be self-regulating population because particularly male mountain lions establish home ranges and defend those pretty aggressively. And you have male mountain lions that set up adjacent to each other to, to occupy an area. Female home ranges are generally smaller and overlap those male home ranges so that breeding can occur. Um, as those mountain lions, uh, as you experience mortality, um, the recruitment that occurs when females give birth typically results in those, those kittens when they become of age between 12 and 18 months and they disperse off and set out on their own, they will look for and try and establish a new home range and they will look for vacancies. Uh, sometimes that will result in uh, conflict with the mature tom that has a home range already established and mountain lions will kill other mountain lions for being in those areas. Um, and so certainly, you know, that is, that is kind of the premise of what forces young mountain lions out of an area to occupy a new area is often the lack of available resources within the area that they were born. We will see that particularly with young females, sub-adult females, they will often set up a home range adjacent to their natal range. So right next to where they were born and raised, a lot of the times they'll set up adjacent. And we'll see that with males as well. Much more common for especially young males to go extensive distances, hundreds of miles to try and establish a home range. Um, and part of that influences the genetic flow and keeps populations strong as well. Mr. President, if I might too, I've got you know kind of a related topic that I wanted to address now. So I know that uh, the commission has heard, I have heard um, significant concern from um, many sportsmen around the state indicating their interest in us if we want to do something for mule deer that we address this um, through the managing the other side of the equation, if you will, with, with um, predators. So one of the things that I've asked Rick and his team to do as, they've, as they're embarking on this new study and analysis and new um, techniques that you all approve for mule deer, that at the same time we look at competition with other species like is there an effect that we can document more um, than we already have with regards to conflicts or or um, competition for habitat between mule deer and elk and then also we know that there are some places where um, large carnivores have um, additive effects to populations and there are some places where they're compensatory or where the mortality would have happened anyway and large carnivores are just um, are just the the cause of something that would have already happened anyway with regards to mortality because there's other factors cwd um poor quality habitat other factors that can affect them and so as as we move forward and as we continue to look at this problem both with with um, declining mule deer populations and what we believe might be some some competition with elk and then also the large carnivore factor you know we're we're looking at that and we're having the team Ember. Um, Ember's got that as part of her plan and, and part of um, her evaluation as she looks at mule deer. And I just, I wanted the commission to know that we've had a lot of discussions about this at retreats and at, at different um, at different venues, but um, I, I thought I'd throw that out there. It's kind of relevant to what we're talking about now. Questions? Any? Okay, I uh, have some uh, comments from the public and questions. Uh, Penny Maldonado. Maldonado. Maldonado from the Cougar Fund. <laughs> I don't know it was my computer, my printer wasn't working. So, uh, President Roberts, Director Nesbitt and Commissioners. Good afternoon, my name's Penny Maldonado and I'm the Executive Director of the Cougar Fund. Thank we, you for accepting you to speak and reading up my just long a hair. detailed written comments concerning this year's mountain lion regulations. And thank you for Penny. allowing me to talk to you. 
It's today. Hey. We need to we need to get that microphone. Okay. Nobody can hear what you're okay. saying. <laughs> there you go. How's that? Perfect. Forty-four years ago this month, as a naive and idealistic college student, my heart became inextricably linked with Wyoming. Every vista, whether mountain, forest, lake, sagebrush, or grassland, inspired me. But it was not the landscapes, but the wildlife, whose landscape supported urged me, compelled me to find a way to return. Some might say I'm still naive and idealistic. Back then in the late seventies, the last bounties on mountain lions were being phased out. And thanks to the work of Morris Hornocker and others, a better understanding of their role was developing. So with regulation, monitoring, and many more acclaimed scientists committing themselves to mountain lion research. A body of evidence has been building during the ensuing 40 plus years. That puts us in a place of greater knowledge. That body of evidence has shown us the leading cause of mortality for mountain lions is indeed intraspecific. Yes, that dominant hierarchical territorial social structure, when largely unmolested, leads to generally stable populations. In fact, this is a hard thing with the computer. <laughs> Many old livestock growers tolerated or even welcomed a seasoned mature Tom knowing he was keeping away less experienced challenges to his real estate. When we put too much pressure on lions, that hierarchical structure is impacted and we may actually be perpetrating the outcomes that we seek to avoid. Today, there is an alarming increase in the availability of unlimited hunting seasons for mountain lions across the West. We seem to be coming full circle back to those early days before bounties were wisely ended. But the difference is that now we know better. We know that females give birth at any time of year and that they're pregnant or have dependent young for more than 70% of their lives. We know that however many times it's been tried and studied and tried and studied again, <coughs> Killing mountain lions does not bring the herds back. Yes, lions kill and eat deer. Well, let me rephrase that and suggest perhaps that like we human hunters, lions harvest a renewable resource in order to survive. Unlike us and other wild omnivores, lions are obligate carnivores and they only eat meat. Their lives, especially the females with kittens, are hard, but they're not wasteful, coming back to their caches to fully utilize what they've taken and also sharing the bounty with other animals. Just this Sunday, way in the backcountry, where I volunteered for the last 20 years, a random conversation with a stranger serendipitously offered up this quote, which I'd never heard before and seemed so appropriate for today's meeting. Change moves at the speed of trust. It's concept credited to author Stephen Covey and means that change takes time and can only happen if we've developed trusting relationships with all our partners and a real value for their contributions. I have seen change since the late seventies and now I'm asking you to please, please change course consider making one of the areas, a study area where hunting is reduced and a stable structure of lions is returned. The extreme killing is not working and exploring an alternative would be an incredible step for Wyoming Game and Fish Department. The parks, wonderful as they are, don't count. They are refuges but they don't have the agriculture, the human footprint that re reflects the challenges we face. 
living with wildlife on an everyday basis and that the wildlife base is living with us. Even the pressures of domestic sheep in some of the areas has contributed to extreme pressure on managers for um, harvest mortality limits. And same research evidence exists that growing populations of juvenile immigrant lions means that an intended increase in livestock conflict. In the same vein, mature dominant lions select for larger prey such as elk, which as you just mentioned are over objective at the moment. So perhaps juvenile immigration of lions may also be something to look as contraindicated for deer. You'll not know the answer until it's informed by science. The cougar fund has always had grave concerns that hunting mountain lions creates consequences for females and young that would never be tolerated during seasons on other animals. The reproductive cycle is not predictable and the young take between one and two years to fully mature to successful dispersal. The time with mother is spent learning to be lions for want of a better term. They discover what to eat, the appropriate prey, who to stay away from, humans and their interests. Please consider shortening the season even by a little on the front end to allow kittens born during the August birth bump to mature enough to motivate the mobility to be at side and their mother protected from being taken if hunting alone. Now that we're out and about again at public meetings, I've been able to hear the comments of others who are especially concerned about the mule deer. I understand their fears, but I'm also extremely worried the continuous climb of mountain lion harvest mortality limits to accommodate the idea that we're all doing something will ultimately be hugely disappointing. I know that so much more is being done for the deer, but many still cling on to the idea that removing lions is the answer. Studying a reduction of hunting in some areas may actually provide you with an answer, but killing hundreds of young immature lions over the past few years has failed to do. Going back to that quote about trust and about my own love of Wyoming and being drawn to the courage, integrity, innovation and leadership that I found here. All those things and more can be found in setting aside an area for a new approach. Please will you take this sincere and respectful request into your deepest consideration. Thank you. I have one question, Penny. Do, does the Cougar Fund, do, do you, uh, um, how many deer do you think a cougar consumes in a year? The Cougar <laughs> Fund was formed in 2000. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I've been with them since uh, 2013. Okay, all right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We're going. <laughs> okay. Um, Joshua Dieter, deer. Mr. President, Commissioners, Director Nesbeck, good afternoon. I'm Joshua Didier. I'm a sportsman and a houndsman from Crook County who is dedicated to the management of mountain lions. I hope the time I took me to travel here shows the level of commitment I possess about this subject. I'm a retired soldier of 20 years. Without going into details, hounds have saved my life and have given me a purpose. Having the responsibility of caring for and training a pack of hounds has enriched my life. I'm sure there are many other houndsmen in the state that can relate to my story. They truly do fill the void I fought with, leaving my soldiers behind. I tell you this because it is a lifetime commitment, owning and handling hounds. I am passionate about getting my hounds to reach their peak level performance no different than teaching, coaching, and mentoring a fire team of soldiers. In order to get to that point, you must train, train, and train some more. It is no different with hounds. 
They must be exposed to the woods and their game over and over. I am here today to ask you for the ability to preserve, pursue mountain lions after the quota is met until the end of the current season being March 31st. This would allow us to keep our hounds in the woods doing what they love the most, regardless of the quota. This addition would ensure that harvest quotas are met. The houndsmen are currently afraid to fill their tag because they'd have to put their hounds on the shelf until the next calendar year. The houndsmen of Wyoming have spoken of you as seen with the online comments. Please grant us the ability to continue to train and refine our team members for the entire duration of the mountain lion season. We understand if the commission is unable to make a decision at this time, we do request that the commission give further guidance to the department to move this request forward. Thank you for your time and Nemo at five. Any questions from this? Luke? <laughs> Luke Worthington. President, Director, and Commission. Hello, my name is Luke Worthington. I'm from Gillette, Wyoming. I'm a husband, a father, a rancher, a hunting guide, and a devoted houndsman. I stand in front of you today in regards to the mountain lion pursuit season. I believe as of right now that the houndsmen in Wyoming are getting penalized for harvesting a lion due to if you fill your tag, you can no longer, you can no longer hunt your hounds. Um, until the next calendar year, excuse me. This pursuit season will give us an opportunity on our investment in our hounds, which we consider family, to get out to our local woods and enjoy what we love to do. The pursuit season allows us more time with the youth to teach them and expose them the value of hounds and lion management. This pursuit season will allow us to sharpen our skills and hounds to make our hounds more keen to a particular species. This season is set for houndsmen September 1 to March 31st, and we would like to be able to pursue during those set dates after the quotas filled. Our hounds are not a tool that we can put away and walk from, walk away from for the next season. These hounds are an extension of our family and we re re require care 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. I will ensure you that most of the houndsmen in Wyoming will agree with this, and this is something that is very, very important to us. I believe the commission I stand in front of today can get this done for us today so we can see it in regulation starting this hunting season. Thank you for allowing me to speak in front of you today and taking, taking this rule change into consideration to benefit the Wyoming Houndsman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to the Zoom now, which, uh, um, Looking for Nancy Hilding for Prairie Hills Audubon Society. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right, okay. Um, is there a time limit or anything like that? Well, within reason. All right. Well, let me know if I'm talking too much. Um, okay. Um, this is Nancy Hilding. Um, I'm from South Dakota. I'm president of Prairie Hills Audubon Society. Most of our members are in Western South Dakota. We have a few in Wyoming. Um, we want to thank Wyoming, the, the mountain lions in the Black Hills were extirpated and, and uh, gone. And then they slowly came threatened and endangered. And sometime in the early 2000s, they were pulled off the threatened and endangered species list, which we have state list in South Dakota. And the first hunting season was in 2005. So, we're thankful to Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, all those Western states for keeping the mountain lions going when we killed all of ours. And for seeding our Black Hills and um, other areas in South Dakota to have mountain lions. Um, but I'm here today uh, to just talk about uh, the Northeast Wyoming 
um, to, to protest the uh, aggressive uh, hunting season in the Black Hills and Area 24. Um, you have, we believe that a third of the pine tree habitat, uh, the wooded habitat is in Wyoming and two thirds is in South Dakota. Um, the South Dakota tries to ma maintain for sustaining the mountain lion population and they have a yearly harvest of 60 with a female sub quota of 40. Your uh, combined harvest in 32, 30 and area one is 61. So that's, you have half the habitat, but you have the same harvest. If you read that report that Dan Thompson and others wrote, they admit that the um, Black Hills in Wyoming is being managed as a sink and you're depending on South Dakota, my state, to grow the lions that we ship over there to Wyoming or they walk over there for you to kill in Wyoming. So um, while we're very thankful for you for keeping the lions alive and letting them re-immigrate into South Dakota, right now you're, we're growing the lions and you're shooting them and getting the hunting license fees and all of that. Now, our group represents people who love lions and want to see them out in the landscape and we objected in 2012 or 2013, whenever it was, when there was that meeting in Hewlett where lots of people came to complain that the lions were eating all the white-tailed deer and there weren't enough white-tailed deer. We had to kill the mountain lions aggressively to promote white-tailed deer. Um, it is our belief that the um, thing that determines the white-tailed deer population is not the predators, it's the winter range, the conditions in the winter range during the winter but mountain lions get blamed. Um, if you look at Dan Thompson and friends uh, new report, um, you will see that I think since 2013, the uh, harvest limits in area um, 30 and 32 have never been met. So in essence, the thing that's ending the season there is the date, it's not your harvest limit. So it's sort of like area 24 where there's no harvest limits and it's the date that ends the season. So your, your harvest limits in area 30 and 31, 32 are just ridiculous. They're meaningless. Um, okay, because it's the, the time, but okay. So, um, so then there's area uh, one, which is, is where people fight about who gets to run dogs and out of state, in state. That's the Black Hills National Forest. That in, the, in 30, and 32, those are mostly private land, but the, the area one is the Black Hills National Forest. There's very little hound hunting allowed in South Dakota. So the South Dakota hound hunters wanna go over to Wyoming to hound hunt. So, uh, you know, there is some hound hunting in some areas, but most of the Black Hills, you can't hound hunt. Um, so it, we, we, don't, we don't represent the, you know, more hound hunting, more, more, more mountain lion hunting. We are the people who want to see the lions in our back porches. I mean, in our, at, we sit on our porch and look out and see the mountain lion. We're out hiking, see the mountain lion footprint. And, and you are just nuking the lions in the Black Hills of Wyoming. And you expect us in South Dakota to grow them and ship them over there for you to shoot, which is kind of unfair. Um, but that's the way the law works. Okay, so, um, all right. So we think your harvest limits in area 30 and 32 are ridiculous. So uh, has been proven for the past almost 10 years. Um, uh, okay, so, um, and, and when you are continually killing all your older males and shipping in South Dakota younger males to replace your old Wyoming males that you just killed, this may lead to increased conflicts because you've got teenage lions who don't really know what, how well to hunt. You're replacing the older lions with the teenagers, which may increase conflicts, which at any rate. Um, and I want to make a comment then um, on something that somebody said earlier in the meeting about how area 25 and area 24 
were gray areas that you know didn't have any connected habitat. Um, area 25, which is over by Lusk, um, has the extension of the Pine Ridge ecosystem. The Pine Ridge ecosystem is a pine uplift that exists in Wyoming, Nebraska, and South Dakota. There are hunting seasons in the Wyoming, uh, in the Nebraska part of uh, the Pine Ridge, and there's hunting seasons on the Ogala Sioux Tribe portion of the Pine Ridge in South Dakota. 25 is connected to an ecosystem that exists in three states, contrary to what was said. Okay, so then you get into um, area 24, which is the prairie to the west of the Black Hills. Uh, there are some mountain uplifts up there to the west of the Bear, Bear Lodge Mountains that connect up to some hills and uplifts in Montana. And there was eight year old female killed up there in that area that you say has uh, no, no interconnected habitat. So I'm saying areas 24 and 25 are connected to other habitat. It's just not in Wyoming. So um, at any rate, um, that, that, that's it for my talk. Um, we, we would like you to drop down the harvest limits in the Black Hills uh, so that you're just not relying on, on us in South Dakota to continue, continue to send you our lions for you to sell and get the hunting license and the Pittman Robins and all of that type of stuff from killing our lions. Um, and, and, and you may, you, you may want to manage it as a sink, but not so aggressively because your area 30 and 32 harvest limits have not been met since 2013. And Area one didn't meet the harvest limits last year. And that's the Black Hills National Forest where everybody and his brother can run out and run around the whole thing. It's all public land, very accessible and you, and you still didn't meet the harvest limits. And thank you very much. I appreciate Wyoming. I, you know, your department's wonderful and, and, th and thank you for saving the lions so they could re, re immigrate to South Dakota. So Nancy, it, this right. is Commissioner Roberts here. I was gonna ask you a question. You had mentioned that, that South Dakota grows the lions and then they come to Wyoming and we shoot them. Does South Dakota have a lion season? South Dakota, um, the, the South Dakota has two areas, two season areas. There is the Black Hills area, which is broken down into Custer State Park and the rest of, of um, the Black Hills. And then it has the prairie unit, which is everything outside the Black Hills uh, Fire Protection Area. Then there is um, the Oglala Sioux Tribe, which is the Pine Ridge Reservation. So you have a hunting season on the Pine Ridge um, of South Dakota that the Oglala Sioux Tribe runs. The South Dakota Game Fishing Parks runs a hunting season in the Black Hills where no hounds are allowed. And then there's uh, Custer State Park where hounds are allowed. And then there's unlimited year round season in the prairie of South Dakota when it isn't on Native American reservations and nine or 11 or 12% of the state is on Native American reservations. And, and different Native American reservations have seasons or not have seasons and um, believe they have evidence of, of breeding. So, so what you're saying is the 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 area that is being that the lions are coming over that there's no honey, lion hunting season in South Dakota for that no, area no, no, no. Over? there is no South Dakota in the in the Black Hills uh, unit there is a 60 lion harvest limit with a 40 lion uh, female quota. Now that is divided up a little bit between the Custer State Park area and the not Custer State Park area. You know, the, I, I've forgotten the exact numbers, but um, there, 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 there's lotteries and you can draw the ability to hunt with hounds in Custer State Park. But um, the whole thing ca counts against the total 60 lions um, or, uh, and, and they don't meet the um, 
harvest uh, limits, it, it ends when the, the date of the season expires. But uh, the, South Dakota does um, various different ways of estimating the population. They used to do Lincoln Peterson collars and now they do darts. But, but South Dakota comes up, um, they have a biennial setting of the season and uh, they come up with a population estimate. Okay, uh, thanks. I sent you, I sent you a letter. all the time I have on it, but uh, uh, I appreciate your comment. Um, does any other commissioners have any comment? Okay. Uh, thank you for logging on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for, I just love Zoom. I very much appreciate your letting me attend by Zoom. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it. I'll turn my, phone. I'm turning my, I'm muting my microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, one more comment. If we, I think that if, um, uh, if we could talk about the pursuit a little bit, I, that seems to be kind of the front and center for a little bit. Um, department's views on that kind of a thing. So when we receive these comments, they are not, um, pardon me, they're not necessarily new ideas. Um, you know, we've, we've had these types of comments for allowing uh, residents to pursue during the season for some time. Um, typically, we don't get overwhelmed with the amount of comments that we've got this season. Um, as some of our houndsmen were, were discussing, there are, there are certain, um, there are certain houndsmen that feel as though they're being penalized. Like if they harvest a mountain lion, they can't go out and run their dogs anymore. And, and because of that, I've heard comments that, you know, they're less likely to harvest because they, they want to make sure that they, that they can ensure that. So that, that is one point. Um, the other point that I hear a lot from our houndsmen is that the department has set that time frame for allowable harvest. You know, and, and generally for most of the most of the hirings in the state starts on September 1st and it goes to March 31st. And the argument that I get from, from those folks is that if this time frame the department has determined is adequate and um, for, for us to run hounds and pursue mountain lions in order to, um, you know, whether it's, you know, to reach, to reach mortality limit, then if that mortality limit, limit is reached, then it, it should still be allowable for us to continue to, to pursue. And, and that's the main argument that I hear. Um, there's, there's obvious other sides and, and there's cons to that. And some of the biggest ones are ungulate disturbance, right? Um, the more time that you spend running hounds outside, the more, you know, the more dogs are out there. Mm -hmm. um, we do have areas around the state that are closures, winter ranges, closes, you know, closures to human presence even. Um, but regardless, you know, that is an extended amount of time that people would be out on the landscape. Um, let's see, I got some notes here too, because I don't want to miss anything. Um, unintended additional mortality from, of mountain lions is another concern that people have brought up. On the contrary, it is you know, the likelihood, there, there is a probability um, anytime that you turn hounds loose that you could potentially have um, catch a, a kitten on the ground. And that doesn't necessarily mean that those houndsmen are, are trying that. Most adamantly try to avoid that from happening. But there are instances, it's undeniable, when you turn your dogs loose on a, say, a mature calm track and you know what you're tracking and that animal shifts directions if it crosses paths with, with something that's more vulnerable, particularly kitten. Um, that probability occurs during the entire season. That probability would likely be about the same if people were continuing to pursue. But again, the additional time spent out there um, could increase that. Is it likely to drive lion populations? Probably not. Um, and something that, that could probably be accommodated in, in our perspective with the large carnivore section. Um, but the last thing, as far as the, the push for this, is that there are many loopholes that exist in our current regulations <clears throat> that allow people to 
run dogs. Once mountain lion season <clears throat> reaches the limit and closes, people can continue to run bobcats with dogs in those areas until, until that season closes. Um, you know, raccoons, there's a lot of other things that people can do to recreate with their dogs um, beyond, you know, bird hunters and waterfowl hunters and things like that. Um, they can also, I guess what you might call game the system and get together and say, we don't want to close a hunt area because we want to maintain our ability to run. Um, we've, we've had some comments about that potentially happening in the state where um, some guys had said, we really don't want this area to close. We're not going to reach the limit. We'll, we'll get within one animal and then, and then we'll, we'll stop. We'll continue to, to use our dogs, but we won't, we won't close the season down because we want this opportunity. And so the, the push from them is the idea that there are ways that, that, you know, people can continue to use their dogs in an area that's closed. The argument that they give me is that they shouldn't have to do that. And so that's really what they wanted us to consider as a department. Um, we've had a lot of discussions internally. Um, I, I certainly won't say that the entire department is on board one way or the other, but it's something that we wanted to entertain um, and we wanted to be addressed. The, the directive that, that we wanted to see from the commission is if the commission wanted to address this issue right here front and center on allowing uh, residents to pursue through the length of the season, but we also understand that that wasn't something that the department proposed. And so it didn't give the opportunity for a lot of the general public to comment specifically on that topic. Um, in that case, we could certainly go back and, and you know, bring forward some draft regulation or something like that that we could bring forward to ensure that we allowed that opportunity. Um, I don't wanna you know, stretch beyond you know, my limitations. I'm just trying to provide you with the information that we have, but I will tell you the department um, came together and, and thought that it was too big of an issue to ignore, and we wanted to get, get some guidance from the commission. Hey, Justin, so you did an excellent job of summarizing kind of the arguments on both sides. So physiologically, biologically, would you address that? Any concerns for individual mountain lions? Not po I've realized there's a high likelihood that there's no impact population-wise, but for individuals, um, do you have any concerns? And then secondly, behaviorally, is there any literature anywhere out there that indicates that mountain lions that are pursued multiple times change their behaviors for the good or the bad? Yeah. Um, optimistic. The, there's, there's literature that measure cortisol, cortisol levels for continuing to tree cats over and over. Um, some of that literature has shown that it, it, it can um, cause a disturbance to mountain lions. Other literature, not so much, that it's not as big of a deal. Um, during an open season, um, if, you're, if you're talking about just an individual cat, uh, we have, you know, I, I, I've ran into multiple hunters and seen it firsthand where there's animals that they don't want to harvest, say a subadult female, but they'll run it every time they cut a track. And, and we know of cats, you know, even um, where I'm from in the Lander region that probably get put up a tree 15 plus times in a year. Um, sometimes those animals can get a little crafty and get harder to catch, but not, um, but I think most of that, and this is just my personal opinion, most of that is, you know, if we say immobilize an animal and, and radio collar it, we have had people um, that's, that say, man, she was, she was pretty feisty with us. But we've also had people um, make claims that once you tree a mountain lion, it cannot be harvested because it's too smart. It'll never tree again. And um, in my opinion, sometimes that's of the contrary. Once they find a tree and get up at cats 10, you know, generally just, they've avoided a, a, an, an interaction with something that's chasing them and they'll, they'll look down and we've, we've had cats fall asleep in trees while we were underneath the tree. So um, as far as population level, I don't, I don't feel like it's good. it would be a detriment to our lion populations, but it also requires some responsible folks on the landscape when they're, when they're hunting. And, and I would say it's, it's probably not responsible to find one mountain lion and track it and tree it every single day over and over and over again. That can't be good. And, and, and that's a lot of disturbance on those animals that still have to hunt and make a living. Um, but with that being said, those animals, um, people should be doing that during the open season as well. 
So um, those are some of the opinions. You know, we do get some people that, that spread what, what might be considered misinformation about um, not only people that treat and release mountain lions, but even the department when we, when we capture and handle a mountain lion and put a radio collar on it, like those animals are, um, you know, gain knowledge that makes them uncatchable. And, and that's simply not the case. Um, and yeah, that's about it. For, for I, I think there's a, I, I think that it's something exactly right. I think that it's something the commission needs to address. Uh, I think that they, the commission needs to come up with something whether on the pursuit, on the, on the out of state, whether they're just uh, maybe pursuing lions, if you're in state, no out of state pursuing lions or such and such. I think that it's just, I think there's a lot of variance and I think there's a lot of, uh, I do, I, I think you guys could really, it'd be nice to have some direction from what the commission wants to do. And I don't know, and I don't want to have Yeah, Mr. President, if it's the desire of the commission you know, we have the ability to go and draft something that we think would be a reasonable pursuit season, take it through public comment, um, and then bring it back to the commission for, for consideration like we would, you know, any other regulation. We're, if that's the, the desire of the commission, we're glad to do that. I think it's something we really need to. Mr. President, okay. sure. I, on happenstance, I was rooming next to those two gentlemen there last night and spent probably two hours talking to them and, and pre Mr. President spent about an hour with them. And I, how many, you guys don't hunt every, every, every day. How many days a week do you hunt on average during the season? Oh, so, go ahead and come up here to the, if you both come up to the thing. So I think well, anyway, I'll talk, and, and he, we're just visiting and he's talking about his son is already running the hounds, taking care of the hounds. He said his wife puts a dog collar on the son so she knows where he's at all the time. <laughs> but it's just, it's, it's like, it's a lifestyle for him. And I, I'm having, I kind of have a hard time seeing the problem of, you know, running the cats, even though you're not going to harvest them. I just, I guess we'll look into it. Eh? Well, Mr. President, I guess I'm curious to how many other houndsmen are out there. Would somebody be in the field pretty much every day during the season? Not just you two, but everybody else that's running them? Um, well, that depends. Um, I believe there's some of us that are a little bit more devoted and committed and, and hunt a lot more. But with this, like if you're talking about the pursue season, I believe, yeah, I, I think guys, I think it's an opportunity to get the kids out more often, like on the weekends and stuff. A lot of, a lot of the hound hunters in the state of Wyoming are weekend hunters. They hunt one or two days a week, usually on weekends, and they bring their fam. It's a family deal. This hound community is, it's unbelievable how, how tight it is with family and friends and stuff. And a lot of people are hunting mostly the weekends is what I see. So I don't believe there's people on the landscape every day hunting is what I see. What about you, Justin? Well, the weekend deal is probably because you're not going to make a living hound hunting. You're probably going to work during the week and hunt on weekend. Would you also bring up the deal about the out-of-state people coming in, uh, several of them with one in-state? Bring that up. You brought that up last Yes, time. sir. Uh, in our regulations, as of right now that you do not, if you're out of state, you can pick up a resident hunter and that out of stater does not have to have a tag with them. As long as they have a resident with the tag, they can run their dogs in the state of Wyoming as a non-resident. And they're doing nothing for our conservation or nothing. They're not buying licenses. They're, they're just picking up a resident and then they get a hunt. And we've seen instances where there's been five or six non-resident trucks with hounds and there's one licensed hunter. And that's, that's concerning in the non-resident field because they're not buying a license and, and they can do it in our area one where there's a non-resident quota. They can be from Michigan or Minnesota or something, and they can come and have a buddy in Wyoming and there'll be four trucks come and hunt for that one hunter. And that's, that's not right. 
I don't, I, I don't believe. But yeah, we're starting to see more and more of that, a lot more. Mr. President, I appreciate the, the wanting more opportunity, obviously, but I also think we need, have to worry about the resource too. So I would like to have the department review this and get back to it. I don't have enough information to decide whether it's, it's good or bad or otherwise. The same is true with the houndsman license or something like that. I think the department should look into that as well. Um, but at this particular meeting, I, I just don't, I'm also anxious to see how the, the lion study turns out. You know, there's a lot of information there too. Uh, so from, from all different angles, but I, I, I'm not comfortable making it, especially with the, of this magnitude, not getting public input. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, Mr. President, I have a comment. Okay. <clears throat> Good discussion. I agree with Pete. Um, when we get back to the issue before us, the other common sense comment I heard today was the September 1 start date. I would be in support of, of chapter two as recommended today, but in our request to have the department look into a pursuit season, I would also like the department to investigate harvest data on lions killed in the month of September and see if that's really, um, are we really having a lot of lion opportunity there? Because my example is in our ranch, we kicked our elk season way back to August and it was miserable having hunters in August. And we got three years worth of data. We weren't killing any elk in August. We just had people run around my hayfield. And so we killed most of our elk later in the season. So when, when we apply that to the lion season, I'd like to see some data on harvest quotas in September um, because from the lions we see on our ranch, September, you can have some awful little little kitties running around. And so I would, that was another common sense comment I heard today that I'd like us to look into. Um, Commissioner Brokaw. Uh, yeah, I can certainly put that information together and we can provide it from the large carnivore section. I, I will tell you generally that mountain lion harvest is extremely low during the summer and in September. And most of the harvest that we do have in September is opportunistic from people that are on dealer honey, without question. Mm -hmm. You know, we feed um, when snows hit and when people are running dogs. And, and uh, I would argue, and, and I, I'm, I'm certain that the data will show you that most of the harvest that occurs in September um, is, is opportunistic hunters yeah. that, are, that are out. Sitting in a tree stand and one walk by. Yep, sure. Absolutely. But nonetheless, that opportunity is out there. And, and there's a lot of folks that do like to be able to purchase a mountain lion license and have it in their pocket while they're, while they're in the um, can, I, can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Are you, um, is the commission asking for both some, some data and potential draft regulations to propose to the public on both the pursuit for residents during the open season and hound handling or information on, on handling hounds and the competition in, in that sense, or simply um, information on if we allowed the season to have pursuit for the entire length of the season. Pursuit for the entire season, September 1st start date, and also um, out of state uh, hound running, and would it be viable to have something to do with just in-state pursuit with, with the excluding out-of-state? Well, and also the, the license, possible license structure. Yeah, for, yeah. For yeah absolutely. And, and to be clear, this, you know, the, the, the resident pursuit for the season, you know, is, as it's formed right now, the idea is, is not a separate pursuit season, wouldn't require different license structuring, you know, any type of limited draw, it would simply be if you have a license for that year and you've harvested a lion or the, or the, the limited in the area is closed, you would continue to be able to, to pursue as a person who purchased the license that year. So um, yes. that is a lot simpler um, as far as the logistics 
um, would certainly take more work um, on, a, on our front and on your front to, to dive deeper into hound handling permits, given that would change and be more permitting costs. Now, I'm not for hound, I'm not think we're ready for a hound handling permits. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if we have the capacity to, because. Mr. President, would that, if that ended up coming to fruition, this uh, pursuit, would, could that just be Wyoming residents only? Uh, that was the intention. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mr. President, I just had a comment. Maybe, maybe Director Neswick or, or you guys can help me out, but. I'm just fast forwarding here in my thoughts, maybe too fast. How do we establish a, a pursuit situation without interfering with the definition of harassment of wildlife? Because our bird dogs have that problem with wild birds. And so I don't have the answer, yeah, but I, that's something that needs to be considered. Yeah, it's a, it's a part of the definition of take. And so yeah. I believe, and, and we got Mike Choma here and Dan Smith, Rick King, who probably can help me here, but I believe that under the current statutory and regulatory definitions that in order to pursue lions, even during a hound, uh, a non-take season or a pursuit season, a license would be required because take is defined as pursue, harass, hunt. Um, so I think with that requirement, under existing law, there would be no need to change that. Am I correct in your assessment there, Chief? So I have to apologize, President Roberts, uh, Director Nesvik. I missed a little bit of your input because I was um, getting some other information. <clears throat> but just the short answer or, or just some information for you to consider is that there, there's a lot of things to look into here, a lot of questions that we, we really don't have the answer to today, whether we can differentiate between resident and non-resident, what kind of permit or license would be needed or not needed for a pursuit season, um, what kind of structure we can put in place. And I, I don't have those answers for you today. There's, there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done in that regard, so. I agree, I agree. Um, is the department clear on kind of the direction the commission is looking towards that? And then, you know, uh, and I, I, I got to keep it moving along. So uh, I appreciate everybody. And, and uh, what uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to call for a, uh, a motion for to approve chapter 42, the mountain lion hunting season as uh, uh, presented. Uh, with the nuance that the department look into the various uh, uh, items that were brought up during the discussion and then present back to the uh, commission their findings and, and have a public meeting and present back the findings what we can do. So I think it needs to be, it's got to be addressed sometime. It's got to redo it now. It's better for, the, it's better for us to, to, to take the bull by the horns now and get it done because it's just going to get bigger. Thank you. Okay. So moved. Okay. So uh, Commissioner Doobie has moved for it. Second. Commissioner uh, Ladwig has seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Approved. Uh, next. Uh, <clears throat> President Roberts, Director Nesic, members of the commission. Moving on to a less controversial species, uh, Ken Mills is going to, <laughs> to uh, go through our uh, wolf season setting. Uh, you've all seen Ken before. Ken was brought on the first time we delisted wolves as one of our several wolf biologists. He's stood the storm throughout and will be presenting our chapter 47 regulations for you today. Yeah, Ken is the most popular person in Teton and Sublet counties. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> <You're>, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for. I try to avoid being the most popular person anywhere. You're pretty much not. You're you're popular. Popular. Except in my own home. I want to be popular there. That's that's where I strive for first. So. Now, Mr. President, uh, members of the Commission, Director Nesvik, thank you. Um, 
we'll try and cruise through pretty quick. There's always a lot of data with wolves because we collect a lot. And uh, just like Justin, I think um, you probably have the right people in the right jobs here because we could uh, talk about lions and wolves all afternoon, but uh, not everybody has that much time. So we'll get right into it. Um, you've seen presentations before, you've seen information presented, but I like to remind us of our management commitments that are in our wolf management plan. And they are primarily to maintain at least 10 breeding pairs uh, and at least 100 wolves at the end of the calendar year, plus a numerical buffer above that to be sure we don't fall below. And essentially this is within the wolf trophy game management area. A breeding pair is an adult male and adult female wolf that raise at least two pups of the year to the end of December. So it's a measure of reproduction and recruitment. Statewide, uh, cumulatively, including Yellowstone and with the Wind River Reservation, uh, we have a commitment and not just us, but cumulatively to have at least 15 breeding pairs and 150 wolves. So Yellowstone and the Wind River Reservation are expected to contribute five breeding pairs and 50 wolves. We have a commitment to maintain adequate regulatory mechanisms to ensure the wolf population will stay above our commitments. So meet or exceed the recovery criteria specifically. Chapter 47 is part of that. And document genetic interchange between subpopulations and the Northern Rockies. Just a reminder, we're primarily talking about uh, the wolf trophy game management area here in Northwest Wyoming, where the Wyoming Game and Fish Department under the direction of the commission has management authority. And so that's the part outlined in green. Wolves are designated as predatory animals outside of that area. We produce an annual report every year. Uh, it includes all the information statewide. So it includes uh, the Wind River Reservation and also Yellowstone. It's available online. I like to mention it just because uh, there's a lot of data we collect and it's available to anyone who wants to look at it. So as we look at wolf population trend over time, you can see most recently we've uh, had wolves delisted in 2017. We've managed wolves um, through hunting primarily as far as population management goes. Uh, we've maintained a, a population above the minimum that's been at the objective we've set uh, within 9% of the objective the last four years. So uh, pretty successful. Um, this year, we were right on the objective. So things are looking good there. We brought some stability. We collected a lot of data to try and understand what's going on in the wolf population and what our management impact might be. I, one of those is population growth. And if you look at population growth based on how many wolves are in the wolf trophy game management area, you can see the more wolves, the less likely the population is to grow. And in fact, um, that line crosses one, which means stability right about uh, the population level of 190 wolves. So, um, so we'd say carrying capacity is somewhere around 190. I like to say right around 200 because hunting impacts some of that relationship. If you look at wolf packs and breeding pairs, we could look at the same information. We've stayed above our minimum even the last uh, five years when we've been hunting wolves. Um, our objective has been 14 breeding pairs in essence. Uh, and we were right on that last year after three years of falling um, below that level, but never below the minimum. So our management approach to ensure that we're staying above those minimums is working. If you look at recruitment, which is a measure of breeding pairs, you see the same density dependent relationship. The more wolves we have, or as the number of wolves increases in the wolf trophy game management area, the proportion of packs that qualify as breeding pairs decreases. So more wolves means less successful reproduction. Last year, the little square was right on the average. Most of the years we've hunted, it's fallen below that. So as we continue to collect data, we'll, we'll be able to assess better how hunting, um, how we're using management tools like hunting to affect population change. We have a really robust wolf monitoring program. We've captured quite a few wolves every year. The main point is, you know, and as of March 22, um, we had 69 collared wolves in 22 of our 24 collared packs or packs in the trophy game management area. So pretty rigorous. Um, unlike lions, wolves are one of the easier species to count. 
uh, because they're territorial and they live in groups. So you collar a wolf in a pack, you can map their territory, go through that territory, uh, count up the wolves that are together in each pack and sum it up. It's a population census or, or minimum count, not an estimate. So I, our data that I'm showing you is, is very rigorous in terms of uh, numbers of wolves and, and impacts of management or, or demographic parameters. So most of our wolves live in the wolf trophy game management area uh, where habitat is suitable based on an analysis by Oakleaf et al in 2006. So this is why we have uh, the wolf trophy game management area where we have it. It, out, it uh, encompasses the majority of our suitable habitat. If you look at wolf mortality over time, uh, you can see a peak there in 2016, moving into 2017 and 2018. That was a result of increased wolf populations in the trophy game area after wolves were relisted in 2014. So there's an increase, uh, which caused an increase in uh, conflicts with livestock. So that's that peak in 2016, and then wolves were delisted, and it took significant mortality to bring the population to objective. But once we've got it at objective now as we have the last um, four years um, it's easier to maintain it there so less mortality i want to also note that if you look at that lowest dark blue dark blue line there um that's depredation control so lethal control because of conflicts and we're killing fewer wolves under state management of livestock which is a, a positive trend this is kind of an interesting thing that uh, interesting piece of information we've looked at as we've collected data through time. So this is the percent of wolves that are positive for canine distemper virus uh, that we're capturing each winter. So you can see when we managed wolves in 2012, 13, uh, we were um, we saw a reduction. So we reduced the number of wolves. We saw a reduction in the number of wolves that were exposed to canine distemper. When wolves were relisted in 2014, we saw a dramatic increase from about 5% of the wolves to 70%. Um, wolves were delisted in 2017, we started to hunt them. And that has caused, uh, because we reduced wolf density, a uh, reduction in the number of wolves that are exposed to canine distemper. So kind of interesting by holding the population at a lower stable level, um, below that carrying capacity. So this orange line is the number of wolves. We can hold the population under carrying capacity. We can, in essence, uh, reduce by far the likelihood that we will have a disease outbreak that impacts our management, which is something that folks will bring up at, at times, one of these unforeseen events. Uh, not likely while we're managing wolves where we're managing. So another important aspect is uh, conflict, in particular conflict between wolves and livestock. You can see relatively low conflict through 2014 when wolves were relisted. Uh, the population increased, uh, the wolf population in the trophy game area at that time increased, and the number of cattle that were verified uh, as killed by wolves um, exponentially increased, as did, so that's the purple line. The red line is the number of wolves killed in response, and that exponentially increased as well. Uh, when wolves were delisted in 2017, you see a, a declining and then stable wolf population. You see declining and stable conflict to the point where it was the lowest last year it's been since 2010. Um, declining number of wolves killed by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department or under our direction for conflicts. Um, so that's really positive. We've, we've seen some um, improvement in that regard. So we have wolves on the landscape. They're functioning as a wolf population, but the conflict has been reduced. Um, we do see a slight increase in the number of sheep killed over the last couple of years. That's primarily sheep in the seasonal wolf trophy game management area where we pay for the, the, the damages caused by wolves there, um, but we don't have management authority during the grazing season. So um, that's where we're seeing that slight increase. Hunting season summary last year, 32 wolves were taken out of the 47 wolf, mor wolf mortality limit. Uh, some of the hunt areas closed when the limit was met. Um, some of the hunt areas closed at the end of the hunting season. <laughs> Selling pretty stable numbers of hunting licenses through time between 2,000 and 2,500. I've 
We haven't been meeting the wolf mortality limit um, over the past four years, but those are also the four years we have been meeting the wolf population objective, which is our primary objective. So hunting seasons are, are effective. They're being effective at managing the population around that objective that we've identified. So when we look at numbers of wolves taken by month through the hunting seasons, you can see September and October are the two primary months. Um, some of the reason for that is there's some hunt areas that close before uh, you get to November, so there's not as much opportunity. One thing I wanna note is if you look at the last three years, the number of wolves taken in November and December is increasing. That's partly again, because hunting seasons have been open in November and December. And I think also partly because there's a growing contingent of, of hunters that are specifically out hunting wolves, not just opportunistically taking wolves during open big game seasons. We see that in hunter effort. We have a lot of opportunistic take. Those folks that, that report it took them a day or two or three to kill a wolf, uh, but we're seeing more people in that 10 or 10 plus number of days hunted range that are taking wolves. Hunter success has stabilized at 2.6% the last three years. So it, it's increased and stabilized. If you look at the number of hunter days per successful harvest, um, it's slightly increased over the last three years. Um, so hunter success is still there, at least stabilized. It's taking a little bit longer to successfully take a wolf. That would be expected as wolves through time get more accustomed to hunters being on the landscape um, pursuing them. So a few years back, um, when we had earlier hunting seasons, uh, we saw a high proportion of juveniles taken in the hunt, which impacts our ability or the ability of packs to reach breeding pair status, right? So we shifted to a September 15th season. And since that time, we've seen juveniles uh, fall, the proportion of juveniles taken fall in, in the overall um, harvest statistics. So that's good. Um, largely juveniles are taken earlier as they're uh, transitioning from being on rendezvous sites in September to moving uh, with the pack in October and higher proportions of sub-adults and adults later in the season. So that's kind of a summary, quick summary of uh, last year and the historic data we have. Let's move right into the proposed wolf hunting season. This is similar to what you've seen before. Uh, the seasons are based on the best available data we have, which look at population theory, how populations should function, um, and data on the population growth, recruitment, and mortality of wolves in the wolf trophy game management area. I, we are kind of micromanaging wolves in the wolf trophy game management area in a way that hasn't been done before. So this is a learning process and we've seen that as we've gone through time. Uh, much to the point where our start of year population is 159 wolves. That's what we're basing all our calculations on. We had 161 wolves at the end of year, but there were two wolves taken from the 2021 season allocation in March. And so we're taking those off because they're already dead. So there's no sense calculating based on having wolves that aren't there. Um, so 159 is what we start with. We have three main things, components for the calculation of the wolf mortality limit we wanna consider. First is the population objective. Where do we wanna be? Second is the predicted impact of human-caused mortality. Third is the predicted non-hunting human-caused mortality. So thankfully, the number of wolves in the wolf trophy game management area at the end of the calendar year is highly correlated to the number of breeding pairs. It's not very straightforward to manage for breeding pairs, right? I mean, how they're reproducing, how many pups survive, that's difficult to manage for. Number of wolves is easier. Because they're highly correlated, we have the opportunity to do that. If we have, for example, um, an average, if we have in an average year, 10 breeding pairs we're looking for on average, that's confusing. I didn't say that well, but we'll get there. <laughs> If we have 111 wolves on average, we'll have around 10 breeding pairs. That's average though. That's not a lot of uh, certainty, right? 
So we can look at the statistics around this and essentially the red line is the 95% probability level. So we have on that red line a 95% probability of having at least 10 breeding pairs if we have 146 wolves in the population. What we've decided to do, um, in essence, you guys have approved is a population objective of 160 wolves, which gives us that extra buffer above that 95% level to be sure we don't fall below our 10 breeding pairs. And that's been, I think, an effective objective. We had two out of the last four years, we've had 11 breeding pairs. And so um, that 160 is a good number that we're working with. I do want to note that last year, it's hard to see the little blue square there, um, but last year the, the population fell right on the average when the previous three years it had fallen well below the average, those three dots below. So that's good. We're, we're on average. We'll see if that trend continues over time. That's something we'll, we'll pay close attention to. So 160 is our proposed objective that should equate to about 14 breeding pairs. If we look at uh, the predicted impact of human caused mortality, so as the number of wolves in the trophy game area has increased, uh, the percent mortality that it takes to stabilize that population decreases. So we would expect that based on density dependence again, the more wolves you have, the fewer pups proportionally are gonna be born and survive and the higher the adult mortality. So it takes less mortality to stabilize it. Add 159 wolves, that level is about 44.6%. Uh, so what that's saying is if 44.6% of the 159 wolves die from human causes, we expect to stabilize the population at 159. It'll all come together as we do the calculation here in a moment. So we can't hunt <laughs> wolves that... <laughs> he looked right at me and said I that. I saw a furrowed brow. Um, <laughs> I'll take care of that. Just hold on. <laughs> so, <laughs> we can't hunt wolves that die from other human causes as well. So we need to predict how many wolves that will be. Uh, there is a strong um, pattern in this calculation as well. The more wolves we have, the more die from non-hunting human causes. Uh, it's non-linear, which is interesting, um, but we can use the same approach. We have 159 wolves we estimate based on this long-term relationship that 15.7% of those wolves will die from non-hunting causes. So these are uh, primarily lethal control for conflict, um, but also illegal uh, roadkill, those sorts of things. Okay, we'll put it all together now. Hopefully it'll be clear. So we start the year with 159 wolves. We estimate that if 44.6% of those wolves die, we'll stabilize the population at 159. So that's 71 wolves when you do the math. We're proposing to increase the population by one to 160. That means we take one out of the 71, meaning if, if 70 wolves die from human causes, we should end the year at a population objective of around 160 and that would equate to 14 breeding pairs. Okay, what we haven't accommodated is non-hunting human causes. So if we remove 15.7% of the 159 wolves um, through other human causes other than hunting, that equals 25 wolves. We take those out of the 70, we end up with 45 wolves uh, that we would apply to the mortality limit. So what this is saying is, if we kill 45 wolves from hunting, we would end the year with around 100, 160 wolves and 14 breeding pairs. We have to accommodate the seasonal wolf trophy game management area, that's hunt area 12. And we've proposed to add two to the mortality limit for that area, um, same as we have in previous years. So a total mortality limit of 47. Uh, interestingly, it's the same overall mortality limit that was proposed and that we had last year. So no real change there. What we are proposing to change is the distribution of that mortality limit. We have fewer wolves in the Cody region in essence and more wolves in Jackson and a few more uh, in the Lander region. So that causes a shift in the mortality limit south from Cody. And that's really the only change. 
and we're not proposing changes to hunting seasons or hunt areas or um, anything else. We've been hunting with some combined hunt areas. We're proposing to continue to hunt those areas combined. So areas three and four, six and seven and eight, nine and 11. That's the essence of the proposal, pretty simple. Um, we had a public comment period at the same time that uh, mountain lion seasons were commented on, held 10 public meeting. We received 106 individual comments, 20 were Wyoming residents, 86 non-residents. Um, we had specific public comments to the proposed provisions based on population objectives too low, mortality limits too high, we had some support um, for the limits as proposed. I, I request to raise the limit, support for the closure of, of the John D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway, which is closed um, based on I, our proposed regulation. Um, we had additional comments on revisions, uh, largely discontinue wolf hunting, protect wolves, and protect wolves around national parks. So pretty consistent with previous comments. And then a whole list of other broader comments related to the wolves' roles in the ecosystem, um, other sorts of management objectives that aren't covered by Chapter 47. So in summary, uh, these proposed hunting seasons are consistent with uh, the Commission's wolf management plan. It's a reminder that we have tight sideboards um, for wolf management in Wyoming because we have a relatively small population compared to other states. And so the proposed season seeks a stable population around that objective, that appropriate population objective that we've proposed uh, the last five years. And it looks at all that data we talked about, population theory and the best available science and data we have at hand to propose these mortality limits. So, and it is an adaptive management approach. Over time, we've changed and tweaked elements of, of how we've done these calculations and, and how we've looked at what the population is doing. So with that, I'll take any questions. Mr. Chairman, uh, there seem to be a number of comments regarding genetic diversity. And because we are maintaining a lower population objective, that we are uh, affecting that. Uh, could you shed a little light on that or? Yeah, absolutely. Mr. President, Commissioner Doobie. Um, the one, one comment first is to say we're not an isolated population. We're a subpopulation in the wolf trophy game management area that's connected to the greater, greater Yellowstone ecosystem population through Yellowstone, Idaho and Montana that's connected to the broader Northern Rockies population that's connected to the Canadian population. So we're, we're just part of a meta population with gene flow through it. Um, the, the reintroduction effort that was brought forth in 1995 um, considered genetic diversity um, and considered it very important. And so from that point on, as genetic diversity has been measured through time, it's consistently been found to be adequate um, through I, actual technical genetic um, investigations, including a, a recent cooperative effort with the Fish and Wildlife Service that looked at genetic diversity through 2018 and found it to be adequate in the Northern Rockies as a whole. Um, and beyond that, I mean, the physical movement of wolves back and forth, we continue to document wolves moving amongst the Northern Rockies and to areas even farther, Colorado, for example. Um, and another example, we, we captured a wolf this winter that was originally captured and collared in Idaho near Craters of the Moon that showed up in uh, the Gray Bull River drainage. And so we captured that wolf, we had the collar, we replaced the collar and now we're tracking him. And we'll know through time whether he contributes directly to the genetic um, diversity of wolves in the trophy management area. So really robust monitoring and through time, every step of the way, um, we found genetic diversity to be adequate. And it's a commitment in our plan that we'll continue to look at through time. I know I've, over the years, I've found it extremely fascinating, the information that you've gleaned in your department and in you guys regarding the wolves. It's just, it's phenomenal. Appreciate that. 
pregnant. A wolf at Craters of the Moon? Near Craters of the Moon, yeah. It's the, that's the, that's the, <laughs> my first thing would why, why would well be at the craters of the moon if anybody's been out there i, I, I like to <laughs> no the, the one in idaho is the one in idaho i've been out past there and it's like it's in idaho i don't know what there's nothing there. that was yeah, there one thing. For, for reference i like to mention <laughs> for reference i like to mention uh we had a collared wolf that we were tracking in june of 2014 uh, near Cody, Wyoming, and it left, and by October, it was on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So you're talking about a dispersal capability for a species that's amazing, which means genetic diversity, while it's something we monitor and we should monitor, to have an issue in the northern Rockies and in Wyoming specifically with genetic diversity would be highly unlikely. Another question? Ask another question. Grand Canyon? Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> um, all right, now I'll go to the, the video. And first we'll be doing Helena Edelson from uh, Science and Technology Director for Wolves of the Rockies. Are, are we online? Hi, can I get a thumbs up from someone if you can hear me? Hello? Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Ms. Edelson. Okay. Good afternoon, President Roberts, Director and members of the Commission. Thank you for this opportunity to comment and I'd like to thank Dan Thompson and his team for all the work they do. I'm a resident and taxpaying property owner in Wyoming and the science and technology director with Wolves of the Rockies. And I also studied wolves in Alaska during graduate school. I'm out in the field studying and tracking wolves year round in Wyoming and Montana. And there's many more like me and yet Montana is not clearly not managing for the non-consumptive stakeholders, only the consumptives. And I really hope that this will change. So I have a few items. I'll try and get through them quickly to respect your time. Uh, the first item is on mortality limits. Um, wolves that spend 95 to 100 percent of their lives and den in the park temporarily step over the national park border, planning to return, but now can get killed right when they do that. Wolves dispersing from Yellowstone may be conditioned to seeing humans and stand a diminished chance of survival, which goes against the statement gray wolf hunting seasons are designated to maintain a recovered wolf population. Additionally, the current limits can wipe out an entire pack killed by just one person. Many in the Northern Rockies and greater Yellowstone ecosystem feel the wolves are worth much more alive than dead, which has been shown to be true through economic studies. Therefore, I urge the commission to consider managing also for the non-consumptive residents as well as consumptive and consider reducing proposed mortality limits for all hunt areas which border Yellowstone, which is areas one, two, three, six, and seven. The second item, uh, reporting duration. In section four, hunting regulations for gray wolves designated as trophy game animals. And in uh, subsection F, reporting and registering kills. It says within 24 hours after taking a gray wolf, the licensee shall report the taking of a gray wolf. And I strongly recommend reducing this to a 12 hour report period in order to uphold accurate mortality limits overall and not take more due to this long time window. Additionally, in section eight, the take of wolves designated as predatory animals, it says in uh, subsection A, a person who takes a gray wolf designated as a predatory animal and set forth in section 4A shall be required to report the kill within 10 days after the date that the gray wolf is killed. And I found no justification for a 10 day kill report period provided. Um, it affects accuracy and timing of meeting mortality limits. Additionally, reporting closures to the public and potentially introduces 10 days of error into the system. So I don't quite understand the proposal for that 10 day period. So for data integrity, 
and statistical accuracy, this should be amended to report a kill within 12 hours. Please consider that. Um, number three, I have two more, sorry, <laughs> three. Date ranges for trophy and predatory designations. In section four, hunting regulations for gray wolves designated as trophy game animals. Item J, gray wolves located in hunt area 12. There are <clears throat> two points in here. They're designated as trophy game animals from October 15 through the last day of February in the subsequent year. And I wanted to recommend changing this from, or rather to October 15th, remaining keeping that, but to the first day of February to avoid killing of pregnant females. And additionally, um, it's designated as predatory animals from March 1st through October 14th and during this time period may be taken without a license. So I have two questions on that point. I found no justification in providing for the killing of wolves without a license. And I, it does make me wonder how the mortality limits are enforced in that case. And the third point on that is killing wolves without a license could be interpreted as the indiscriminate killing of wolves. Therefore, I recommend changing this to July 1st through October 14th to avoid killing of pregnant females, exclude the denning period, but ideally also fall into, um, try to avoid the pup rearing period just to give the wolf packs a chance. And finally, genetic connectivity, uh, chapter 47, section eight states, the department may request the person to voluntarily provide a genetic sample from the gray wolf for testing to assess genetic connectivity. And I just wanted to raise issue with the word may, considering that the statement of reasons in section four mortality limits states, gray wolf hunting seasons are designated to maintain a recovered gray wolf population. So point one, monitoring and assessment of genetic connectivity should be required to provide enough genetic data needed to fulfill gray wolf connectivity of populations and Wyoming's delisting requirements. And point B, additionally in this chapter 47, um, section eight on predatory animals should be, uh, sorry, section four on trophy game animals and section eight on predatory animals should be amended to reflect this requirement. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the comment. Is there any commission have any questions for them? Okay, thank you. I don't uh, nobody has any questions. Okay, next we'll go to uh, Lisa Robinson on uh, Wyoming Untrapped. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? This is Lisa. Yes, go ahead. This is Commissioner Roberts. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, President Roberts, members of the commission and Director Nesvik. Um, before I go any further, I did like the comments from the previous speaker, and I hope that those uh, recommendations will be acknowledged. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the current draft regulation for gray wolf hunting seasons. I've been involved in wolf recovery since 1995, 28 years, and have witnessed every decision that has been made to slowly chip away at the wolf population in our state by hunting, trapping, and snaring with the ultimate goal of reducing the numbers to the minimum as required by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Our state wildlife managers have succeeded in eliminating recreational opportunities for thousands of Wyoming residents and visitors, hunters and non-hunters who value the presence of these wild carnivores and neighbors on our public landscapes. During this long wolf elimination process, there have not been any implemented regulation changes that I'm aware of 
that have been recommended by new diverse perspectives. Perhaps now is an appropriate time for all wildlife decision makers to be more inclusive of diverse perspectives and not just to prioritize hoofed animals and hunters over carnivores and people who do not hunt. There are hundreds of changes we might consider to improve equitable representation and decision-making around our shared natural resources and to ensure we promote healthy human wildlife ecosystems rather than just game species. The responsibility to get this right is with our wildlife decision makers. The department reviewed over 106 public comments that show growing numbers of well-informed and knowledgeable modern day wildlife advocates. Only five of these public comments were in favor of current wolf hunting regulations or increased wolf elimination measures. After consideration of all public comments, the department chose to make no further edits to this draft regulation. President Roberts and members of the commission, I respectfully appeal to you to commit today to initiating further discussions among the underrepresented stakeholders to modify the current wolf hunting regulations reflecting these inclusive voices and to evolve to a long awaited predator friendly sentiment. It's time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any uh, questions from the commission? Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Robinson. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Ms. Taylor, from also from Executive Director from Wyoming Untrapped. Mr. President, members of the commission, my name is Lauren Taylor. I'm the Executive Director of Wyoming Untrapped. Uh, I would like to thank you all for being here today for serving our communities and for allowing the public to participate in wildlife and fisheries management decisions. I recently reviewed the Wyoming Game and Fish Department 2021 strategic plan, which states the department's constituencies are a diverse group of Wyoming residents and non-residents who have an interest or are affected by wildlife. The department is the agency which manages all wildlife for public benefit, serves as an advocate for wildlife, wildlife habitat, and all wildlife users, including expanding opportunities for the public to enjoy wildlife. The commission and the department are aware that the chapter 47 draft regulations received 106 public comments. 106 individuals who are actively participating in wildlife conservation management decisions in the state of Wyoming. 106 constituents who want their voices to be heard. 103 of these constituents were not satisfied with the proposed regulation. Despite this input, no changes were made to the draft regulations were recommended and these constituents were ignored. I urge the commission to stand by your mission of conserving wildlife and serving people by not only allowing the public to provide comments, but also absorbing these comments and reflect them in future management decisions. Again, I thank you all for your service today and for being here and for listening to my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions for her? From okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, does the department have any response to anything or do they stand with what you're going? <coughs> Mr. President, uh -huh. can, could you expound a little bit on the disease situation regarding the CDB and, and the herd, current herd populations and what, or pack populations and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, Mr. President, uh, Director Nesbitt, um, Commissioner Duby. Yeah, so I mean, the, there's a lot in that graph, just in that one graph, you know, talking about it. But in essence, what we've seen with canine distemper virus in the Northern Rockies, and in particular Yellowstone National Park, is when densities increase to high levels, canine distemper virus outbreaks were occurring. And that was the primary mechanism for population declines in Yellowstone. So it happened three different times. The third time it happened, um, the population did not recover to previous levels because the, the prey base wasn't there to sustain it. So it maintained at a, it's, it stayed at a lower level of population equilibrium in essence. So that's what you see with canine distemper virus. It, it has a eruption in essence when densities get high. 
we haven't seen that in Wyoming until wolves were relisted in 2014 and the population increased rapidly. And that was reflected in the increase of canine distemper virus presence in the, cap in the wolves that we captured from you know, about 5% of them to 70% over those, I think it was four years. Um, once we reduced the population and in essence took densities down below carrying capacity, we've seen a, a resultant decline. So in essence, so long as the population stays below carrying capacity, we're unlikely to have a disease outbreak, which is consistent with population theory as well as the data we've collected on wolves in the wolf trophy game management area. So um, that's the only time I'm aware of that we've seen disease impact population levels because we were seeing some implications when the population increased after relisting. Um, so that's kind of a summary of what we've seen for trends and patterns and the likelihood for disease, in particular canine distemper virus. The pattern's really similar for mange. It's harder to identify, though, um, in the wolf trophy game management area in northwest Wyoming. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just found that graph early. Thank you. Mr. President, I have a question. When we talk about the state's requirement of 14 breeding pairs in the trophy management area. Does that exclude any animals in the park? Are we including animals in Yellowstone or in that 160? Commissioner Brokaw, that is just wolves in the wolf trophy game management area. So when you talk about 14 breeding pairs, that's our objective. Mm -hmm. Our minimum is 10. Okay. And that's only the wolf trophy game management area. So that's independent of wolves found in other areas of the state. Do we have any idea how many wolves are in the park? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, the wolf monitoring program in Yellowstone is very consistent. We, we monitor wolves in essence the same way. So they produce a population census every year. Um, and that's actually found in the annual report I mentioned before. So when you look statewide, everybody's counting wolves the same way. Yellowstone, uh, wolves that come in and out of Grand Teton, us in the Wolf Trophy Management Area, the Wind River Reservation, and then wolves in the predatory animal area. They're all counted to that minimum population number, that census. And so at the end of um, 2021, there were 314 at least wolves in Wyoming statewide. Okay. Say how many just in? Not in the park, statewide 314. Okay. Did you count the two at Arlington? <laughs> I have seen a wolf on my If I had the report, historic. I counted them. But pretty um, cool. In the predatory animal area, it's difficult mm -hmm. to, to keep track because of the effort it takes over a wide area and the fact that we don't have management authority. So we don't spend a lot of effort, but we do track um, observations made by, in essence, department personnel for the most part or cooperating agencies. And we summarize that information as well, but it's, by, it's definitely a minimum. And then could you just give us some justification? Um, was it Lauren or maybe you Lisa pointed out that on a trophy on a, on a legal harvest in the trophy management area, twenty four <laughs> hours to report. Outside of that, in the predator status area, it's ten days. Why? Why the difference? Yeah, that's the ten days is the statutory maximum. So that's written in statute that we that all wolves killed by humans intentionally, predatory animal or trophy game area, have to be reported within ten days. In the wolf trophy game management area, we've elected to reduce that to 24 hours so we can track the mortality limit very closely. So if memory serves me correctly, over the seven wolf hunting seasons we've had, we've had three hunt areas go over the mortality limit by one wolf with the 24 hour that column. Delayed, delayed because column. there might be two wolves taken by different parties, different individuals on the same day. So three out of 14 hunt areas over seven years. Um, so the, the, that 24 hour period is inadequate 
uh, reporting period to, to mm -hmm. close seasons for wolf hunting. And logistically, for those that that are intense, that are up on a on a horse pack, mm -hmm. it's tougher to close that window, isn't it? Yes, it re yes. I mean, to go to something smaller than twenty four hours becomes difficult, and we. Um, so there's, in, in essence, if you're backcountry there, you are required to have a way to communicate within 24 hours. So um, whether that's that phone or some other mechanism. Thanks for the clarification. Mr. President. The wolves that are taken in the predator management area, are they considered in the quota or not? In other words, if they kill 10 wolves in the predator area, does that, it, 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 it takes down the number of wolves in Wyoming, but is there a quota on them that's counted? Yeah, Commissioner Ladwig, no, there's no mortality limit for wolves designated as predatory animals. That wolves, any any sort of management action by another agency or take by the public has no impact on how we manage wolves in the wolf trophy game management area. And we, we do that, um, we set up the wolf trophy game management area management approach to ensure that we meet the minimum commitments that we made in our management plan, regardless of what happens to wolves designated as predatory animals. So Thank it's you. independent. And aren't the, the wolves in the, the predatory zone uh, uh, regulated by the Department of Ag? Commissioner Doobie, that's correct. They're primarily under the jur jurisdiction of the Department of Ag. Question? Okay, thanks. Uh, at this time, I'll entertain motions for Chapter 47, Gray Wolf Hunting Season. Uh, do I have any motions? So moved. Uh, moved by Commissioner Jolovich, seconded by Commissioner Second. Ladwig. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor to approve it, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The motion carries, it's been approved. Uh, last presenter will be Chris McBarnes for the president of the Wild Life Fund with an update. I know. <laughs> you're, you're grumbling about how late you're running the meeting. But President Roberts, uh, Director Nesbitt, members of the commission, thank you all so much. I know it's been a really long day, so we're going to keep this hopping. We're going to keep it light. We're going to keep it fun. Uh, and hopefully it'll be a, a good ending point to a, a wonderful day of progress that you've made for the state of Wyoming. I um, want to talk to you about three things today, and I have a couple really cool videos uh, to share with you and some media, which I hope you'll enjoy. Number one is the first annual Inspire Kid Camp uh, that the Wildlife Fund was honored to host uh, this June in Bondurant. Number two is the Maury Brown Kids Fishing Day, um, both of which were alluded to by Director Nesvik this morning in his uh, commission update. And last but not least, I have my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Joshua Corsi, CEO and founder of Muley Fanatics, here to talk to you about some great money raised from the second annual Golf for Wildlife outing in Green River uh, in June. Before I do that, I do want to introduce our new operations manager for the Wildlife Fund, Nate Brown. Nate, if you stand up. <laughs> Um, Nate's a, a wonderful guy. He's going to be an amazing asset to the Wildlife Fund. If you get five minutes with Nate, you'll learn he's gregarious, he's a people person, um, and he has such a passion for the people and wildlife of Wyoming. So, Nate, welcome to the team. And if you get a chance, um, shake Nate's hand, uh, and you'll really enjoy getting to know him. So first, I want to talk to you about the, the first annual Inspire Kid Camp hosted by the Wildlife Fund at the Little Jenny Ranch, uh, owned by Mark and his Elizabeth Hamlin in Bondurant. And I want to say the department does an absolutely incredible job with the director's initiative of Inspire Kid. Nish, the communication staff, Ashley Leonard, the entire team, they do an amazing job. And the Wildlife Fund simply wants to augment the work that they do because there's so many young people out there um, that need reached, that need help, that need healed. And Wyoming's wildlife and the lessons learned uh, can do all of those things. And so I have a, a clip to show you from the first annual Inspire Kid Camp. So gentlemen, if you wouldn't mind queuing that up, we had 20 young men um, ranging in age from 13 to 16 uh, from all over the country. We had five from Monterey, California, 
four uh, from Morgantown, West Virginia, one from Jacksonville, Florida, and then 10 young men from across the state of Wyoming. So take a peek. was an incredible experience. And some people I, I want to thank quickly. Again, this would not have happened without the Wyoming, Wyoming Game and Fish Department, Nish and the communications team, Chip, uh, Chief Rick King and B in the Wildlife Division, Regina Dixon, Jill Randall, Tom Ryder, Dan Thompson, Zach Walker, Director Nesvik for coming up and talking to the kids, Commissioner Lundball for coming up and talking to the kids. It was absolutely incredible. Mark Faith and Elizabeth Hamlin, Dr. Kevin Monteith, Josh Corsi, Dan Starks, the First Hunt Foundation, Wyoming State 4-H, Sporting Lead Free, REI, Rocky Mountain Sports Discount, and Commissioner Doobie because he donated a commissioner license to help fund this camp. So thank you all so much for making that possible. The camp was about wildlife education, outdoor recreation, and leadership development. Um, and these kids grew on an interpersonal level over seven days. The best thing is they had to turn their cell phones in. No cell phones, obviously no service, but you know what? They survived. It's a miracle that they survived. So that was the IAK camp. Number two, um, we had the Maury Brown Kids Fishing Day just outside of Cheyenne in June. Uh, Commissioner Jolovich was there. We so appreciate you being there, sir. Um, 250 kiddos approximately came out for this fishing day. We had over 600 individuals uh, with parents and volunteers. 
And we have a very special video to share with you. So guys, go ahead and do that one up and take a peek. What a great day that was uh, for the game and fish department uh, in the state of Wyoming. And there's some really good guys uh, in that video. And I'm not just talking about Nesvik and Friedenthal. I'm talking about Maury Brown. I mean, what an incredible man. Maury donated $50,000 to the Wildlife Fund to offset 100% of the costs from that day. Every kid went home with a stock tackle box and a fishing pole. Um, we had a lot of single moms, single dads out there with their kids fishing for the first time. Um, the Laramie Wildlife and Fisheries Division was just phenomenal. Uh, of course, Maury, uh, Catherine Boswell, uh, Catherine's now retired, but she was absolutely pivotal to this event. I just want to thank Catherine and praise her so much for the work she did. Brian Terrell and family down in Cheyenne, former uh, Game and Fish Commissioner Pat Crank was crucial uh, to the event. Cowboy Sanitation, Sporting Lead Free, Sportsman's Warehouse. Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's, again, Commissioner Jolovich. It was just a wonderful day. And I, I feel like the Wildlife Fund, we've, we've done a, a reasonable job over our first two years of putting money back on the ground for habitat research, but we needed to up the ante when it comes to education. And I think this summer we've done that and going years into the future, we're going to continue to build on this, take these fishing days across the state, expand our Inspire a Kid Camp next year to include young women. Uh, as well as young men, uh, and really inspire the future generations. And it's all because of Director Nesvik's Inspire a Kid initiative um, and supporting that. And last but not least, I want to invite my, my good friend Josh Corsi up, and we're going to give you just a brief update um, on some real money that we raised to put on the ground right here in southwest Wyoming, all for the Kimmerer Highway 189 crossing project, which you all toured yesterday. So it's perfect timing. So, Josh? Thank you. Before I talk about that, how about this guy? <laughs> is, is he just not a great ambassador? Big guns. Yeah, he, he's. One of the nights to those kids, and to see Chris and that element and his interaction and engagement with those kids, 
how structured it was, how uh, attention to detail, and just all the items were dotted and came across to ensure a great thing. Wyoming, glad to have you here. I'm, I'm sure Indiana misses you. Uh, I, I, I do want to give you an update to Commissioner Jolovich uh, specifically to, to the tag that you had donated to Wildlife Crossings that we facilitated the sale of. That uh, coupled with the golf tournament and then the, the license that uh, you had allocated to the Wildlife Fund, uh, we are very excited to announce for a project that is really, it, I, I don't even know if you could say it's in its early phases, I just know it's a priority. And that, I think is probably getting more attention now because of the dry pining crossing project that people are seeing that in Western Wyoming. And so they start asking about this project south of Kimmer. But uh, with the recent announcement uh, with the Terra nuclear power plant coming, uh, I'm sure Commissioner Roberts, you're hearing a lot uh, about that in our backyard as well. Um, but we're very excited to already be putting some seed money knowing these things are very expensive. They require a healthy investment and they take time. The golf tournament was the second annual golf and wildlife tournament. If you can recall, last year we held that first initial kickoff or tee off, I should say, in Buffalo. And uh, we're excited that uh, it's growing with some momentum. We've, we've doubled the net from what it had, was able to achieve last year. This year, the net from that golf tournament was $16,734.81. Uh, it was held at the Rolling Green Country Club in Green River. Uh, with uh, ter just horrendous weather, uh, 40 mile an hour winds all day, uh, but it, it was very exciting. It ended with two teams having to do a playoff on the 18th hole, not once, but twice. And everyone was still there at the clubhouse awaiting uh, the, the, who the winner was. So that, uh, it, was, it was like having the masters in Southwest Wyoming. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the commissioner tags at both the wildlife fund and Muley Fanatics had sold and then our, our Blue Bridge chapter, which is unique in itself out of Virginia to allocate $15,000 to this project south of Kimmer that is in its early phases. I think we're now close to 70,000, a little over 70,000. So I right, just want to give you an update. Again, thank you for all your work. You guys did right by this guy, I can tell you that. Yeah, we're, we are honored to partner with our good friends at Muley Fanatics on that second annual Golf and Wildlife outing. Next June, we're taking it to Devil's Tower in Hewlett. We're going to up the ante, make it very competitive, hopefully have some amazing prizes and continue to raise funds. But yes, thank you, Commissioner Jolovich. Two commissioner licenses, the Blue Ridge chapter and the golf outing net, we're at a total of $70,704.81 for Kimmer. So we got a long way to go, but not bad. And if you're out there and you're looking for a tax deduction the end of the year and you want to make a contribution to a great project, Give us a call, 307-316-3863. That would be wonderful. So um, with that being said, you all have deserved or earned a wonderful evening um, after some, some hard work today. So I'll stand for questions uh, and then sit down. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you God. Okay, at this time I'll do a call to the public. Is there any any public matters or any comments or anything that the commission should be aware of or hearing none uh would anybody move to adjourn for the evening so oh, oh, cough would you like this, to adjourn i would like to adjourn but to just for clarification for my alarm clock what time are we starting tomorrow eight o'clock eight o'clock i'll be there i move to adjourn so you want a second or you want a first that's fine Okay. Type it up however. Let's uh well we'll do Mr. Ladwig, Commissioner Ladwig is going to motion it, and Commissioner Brokoff is going to second the motion to adjourn. And we'll be reconvening at eight o'clock tomorrow morning because there's no executive. All right.